He was delighted and only quarreled with my having signed the plans, developed on the basis of the Fury's ideas. I was the architect, he said, and my contribution to this building must be given greater credit than his sketch of the idea dating from 1925. I stuck to this formula, however, and Hitler was probably gratified at my refusal to claim authorship for this building. Partial models were prepared from the plans, and in 1939 a detailed wooden model of the exterior some 10 feet high and another model of the interior were made. The floor could be removed in order to test the future effect at eye level. In the course of his many visits to the exhibit Hitler would unfailingly spend a long time contemplating these two models. He would point triumphantly to them as an idea that must have struck his friends fifteen years ago as a fantastic quirk. In those days who was prepared to believe me when I said that this would be built someday? This structure, the greatest assembly hall in the world ever conceived up to that time, consisted of one vast hall that could hold between 150 and 180,000 persons standing. In spite of Hitler's negative attitude toward Himmler's and Rosenberg's mystical notions, the hall was essentially a place of worship. The idea was that over the course of centuries, by tradition and venerability, it would acquire an importance similar to that St. Peter's in Rome has for Catholic Christendom. Without some such essentially pseudo-religious background the expenditure for Hitler's central building would have been pointless and incomprehensible. The round interior was to have the almost inconceivable diameter of 825 feet. The huge dome was to begin its slightly parabolic curve at a height of 323 feet and rise to a height of 726 feet. In a sense the Pantheon in Rome had served as our model. The Berlin Dome was also to contain a round opening for light, but this opening alone would be 152 feet in diameter larger than the entire dome of the Pantheon, 142 feet, and of St. Peter's, 145 feet. The interior would contain 16 times the volume of St. Peter's. The interior appointments were to be as simple as possible. Circling an area 462 feet in diameter, a three-tier gallery rose to a height of 100 feet. A circle of 100 rectangular marble pillars, still almost on a human scale, for they were only 80 feet high, was broken by a recess opposite the entrance. This recess was 165 feet high and 92 feet wide, and was to be clad at the rear in gold mosaic. In front of it, on a marble pedestal 46 feet in height, perched the hall's single sculptural feature, a gilded German eagle with a swastika in its claws. This symbol of sovereignty might be said to be the very fountainhead of Hitler's Grand Boulevard. Beneath this symbol would be the podium for the leader of the nation, from this spot he would deliver his messages to the peoples of his future empire. I tried to give this spot suitable emphasis, but here the fatal flaw of architecture that has lost all sense of proportion was revealed. Under that vast dome Hitler dwindled to an optical zero. From the outside the dome would have loomed against the sky like some green mountain, for it was to be roofed with patinated plates of copper. At its peak we planned a skylight turret 132 feet high, of the lightest possible metal construction. The turret would be crowned by an eagle with a swastika. Optically, the mass of the dome was to have been set off by a series of pillars 66 feet high. I thought this effect would bring things back to scale undoubtedly a vain hope. The mountainous dome rested upon a granite edifice 244 feet high with sides 1040 feet long. A delicate frieze, four clustered, fluted pillars on each of the four comers, and a colonnade along the front facing the square were to dramatize the size of the enormous cube. Three. Two sculptures each 50 feet high would flank the colonnade. Hitler had already decided on the subjects of these sculptures when we were preparing our first sketches of the building. One would represent adders bearing the vault of the heavens, the other Tellus supporting the globe of the world. The spheres representing sky and earth were to be enamel coated with constellations and continents traced in gold. 
the volume of this structure amounted to almost 27.5 million cubic yards semicolon for the capital in Washington would have been contained many times in such a mass. These were dimensions of an inflationary sort. Yet the whole was by no means an insane project which could in fact never be executed. Our plans did not belong to that super grandiose category envisioned by Claude Nicolas Ledoux as the swan song of the Bourbon dynasty of France, or by E. Chanel Bouly to glorify the revolution, projects which were never meant to be carried out. Their scale, however, was by no means vaster than Hitler apostrophe S.5 but we were seriously going ahead with our plans. As early as 1939 many old buildings in the vicinity of the Reichstag were raised to make room for our Great Hall and the other buildings that were to surround the future Adolf Hitler Platz. The character of the underlying soil was studied. Detail drawings were prepared and models built. Millions of marks were spent on granite for the exterior. Nor were the purchases confined to Germany. Despite the shortage of foreign exchange, Hitler had orders placed with quarries in southern Sweden and Finland. Like all the other edifices on Hitler's long Grand Boulevard, the Great Hall was also scheduled to be completed in 11 years, by 1950. Since the hall would take longer to build than all the rest, the ceremonial cornerstone laying was set for 1940. Technically, there was no special problem in constructing a dome over 800 feet in diameter. A special problem connected with every dome is the acoustics. But to our relief prominent acoustical experts calculated that if we observed a few precautions there would be no need to worry. The bridge builders of the 30s had no difficulty with similar spans of steel or reinforced concrete. Leading German engineers had even calculated that it would be possible to build a massive vault with such a span. In keeping with my notion of ruin value A I would rather have eschewed the use of steel, but in this case Hitler expressed doubts. You know, an aerial bomb might strike the dome and damage the vaulting. If there were danger of collapse, how would you go about making repairs? He was right, and we therefore had a steel skeleton constructed, from which the inner shell of the dome would be suspended. The walls, however, were to be of solid stone like the Nuremberg buildings. Their weight, along with that of the dome, would exert tremendous pressure and would demand an unusually strong foundation. The engineers decided on an enormous concrete footing which would have had a content of 3.9 million cubic yards. According to our calculations, this would sink only a few centimeters into the sandy soil, but to test this a sample section was built near Berlin.6 except for drawings and photographs of models, it is the only thing that has remained of the projected structure. In the course of the planning I had gone to see St. Peter's in Rome. It was rather dashing for me to realize that its size had little to do with the impression it creates. In work on such a scale, I saw, effectiveness is no longer proportionate to the size of the building. I began to be afraid that our great hall would turn out disappointingly. Ministerial Councillor Nipfer, who was in charge of air aid protection in the Reich Air Ministry, had heard rumors about this gigantic structure. He had just issued directives providing that all future buildings be as widely dispersed as possible in order to diminish the effect of air aids. Now, here in the center of the city and of the Reich, a building was to be erected which would tower above low clouds and act as an ideal navigational guide to enemy bombers. It would be virtually a signpost for the government center. I mentioned these considerations to Hitler. But he was sanguine. Goering has assured me, he said, that no enemy plane will enter Germany. We will not let that sort of thing stand in the way of our plans. Hitler was obsessed with the idea for this domed building. We had already drawn up our designs when he heard that the Soviet Union was also planning an enormous assembly building in Moscow in honor of Lenin. He was deeply irked, feeling himself cheated of the glory of building the tallest monumental structure in the world. Along with this was an intense chagrin that he could not make Stalin stop by a simple command. But he finally consoled himself with the thought that his building would remain unique. What does one skyscraper more or less amount to? A little higher or a little lower. 
The great thing about our building will be the dome. After the war with the Soviet Union had begun, I now and then saw evidence that the idea of Moscow's rival building had preyed on his mind more than he had been willing to admit. Now, he once said, this will be the end of their building for good and all. The domed hall was to be surrounded on three sides by water which would reflect it and enhance its effect. For this purpose we intended to widen the spree into a land of lake. The normal river traffic, however, would have to bypass this area through a set of underground canals. On its south side, the building would be flanked by the Great Plaza, the future Adolf Hitler Platz. Here the annual May 1st rallies would take place, these had previously been held on Tempelhof Field.7. The propaganda ministry had worked out a pattern for managing such mass rallies. In 1939, Karl Hank told me of the variants of such demonstrations, which manner of demonstration was wanted depended on political and propagandist factors. From the gathering of schoolchildren to cheer a foreign guest all the way to the mobilizing of millions of workers to express the will of the people, the propaganda ministry had a prepared scenario. Ironically, Hank spoke of cheering levies. Had the future gone according to plan? it would have taken the ultimate of all cheering levies to fill Adolf Hitler Platz, since it would hold a million people. One side of the square was to be bounded by the new high command of the armed forces, the other by the chancellery office building. The fourth side was open, permitting an enormous vista down the Grand Boulevard. This would be the only opening in the gigantic square, otherwise hemmed in completely by buildings. Aside from the Great Hall, the most important and psychologically the most interesting of the buildings was to be Hitler's palace. It is no exaggeration to speak of a palace rather than the Chancellor's residence. As the preserved sketches show, Hitler had been thinking about this building as early as November 1938.8 The architecture made plain his craving for status, which had increased by leaps and bounds since his accession to power. From the Chancellor's residence of Bismarck stay into which he originally moved to this projected palace, the proportions had multiplied by a factor of 150. Even Nero's legendary palace area, the Golden House, with its expanse of more than 11 million square feet, would be outstripped by Hitler's palace. Right in the center of Berlin, it was to occupy, with the attached grounds, 22 million square feet. Reception rooms led through several series of salons into a dining hall which could have accommodated thousands. Eight vast entertainment halls were available for gala receptions. The eight public rooms would have had a total area of 161,400 square feet. The theatre was to contain 400 comfortable seats. Following the normal practice of allowing about two and a half square feet per seat in a theatre, the 3,442 square feet would have provided easily for 800 persons in the orchestra and another 150 in the balcony. Hitler planned to have a special box for himself in the theater. The most modem stage equipment was to be provided for a theater of 400 seats, an imitation of the ducal theaters of the Baroque and Rococo eras. From his own quarters Hitler could reach the Great Dome by a series of covered galleries. His offices, on the other hand, were conveniently adjacent to the private apartment, and his personal office located at the very center of this official sector. Its measurements far exceeded the reception room of the President of the United States. Nine Hitler was so well pleased with the long hike the diplomats had to take in the recently completed new chancellery that he wanted a similar device in the new building. I therefore doubled the distance visitors would have to traverse making it somewhat more than a quarter of a mile. From the former chancellery, built in 1931, Hitler's aspirations had by now multiplied 70-fold.10 that gives some idea of the proportions by which his megalomania had evolved. And in the midst of all this splendor Hitler would have set up his white enameled bedstead in a bedroom of fairly modest dimensions. He once said to me, I hate all show in a bedroom. I feel most comfortable in a simple ordinary bed. In 1939, when these plans were assuming tangible form, 
Goebbels's propaganda went on fostering the German people's belief in Hitler's modesty and simplicity. In order not to imperil this image, Hitler said scarcely a word about the plans for his palatial private residence and the future chancellery. But once, when we were tramping through the snow, he gave me justification for his soaring demands. You see, I myself would find a simple little house in Berlin quite sufficient. I have enough power and prestige, I don't need such luxury to sustain me. But believe me, those who come after me will find such ostentation an urgent necessity. Many of them will be able to hold on only by such means. You would hardly believe what power a small mind acquires over the people around him when he is able to show himself in such imposing circumstances. Such rooms, with a great historical past, raise even a petty successor to historical rank. You see, that is why we must complete this construction in my lifetime, so that I shall have lived there and my spirit will have conferred tradition upon the building. If I live in it only for a few years, that will be good enough. In his speeches to the construction workers of the Chancellery in 1938, Hitler had made similar remarks, though of course without revealing any of his plans, which by then were already quite far advanced. As leader and Chancellor of the German nation, he had said, he did not enter former palaces, that was why he had refused to move into the palace of the Reich President, for he was not going to live in a former Lord Chamberlain's residence. But in this area, too, he would see to it that the German state was provided with a public building that matched the prestigious edifices of any foreign king or emperor. Eleven. Even at that time, Hitler ruled that we were not to worry about the costs of these buildings, and we therefore obediently omitted volume calculations. I have drawn them up for the first time only now, after a quarter of a century. The result is the following table. Although the immense scale would have reduced the price per cubic yard, the total costs were almost inconceivable. For these vast structures would need enormous walls and correspondingly deep foundations. Moreover, the exterior walls were to be dad in expensive granite, the interior walls in marble. The very best materials were likewise to be employed for doors, windows, ceilings, and so on. A cost of 5 billion present day marks for the buildings of Adolf Hitler Platz alone probably represents far too low an estimate. 12. The shift in the mood of the population, the drooping morale which began to be felt throughout Germany in 1939, was evident in the necessity to organize cheering crowds where two years earlier Hitler had been able to count on spontaneity. What is more, he himself had meanwhile moved away from the admiring masses. He tended to be angry and impatient more often than in the past when, as still occasionally happened, a crowd on Wilhelmsplatz began clamoring for him to appear. Two years before he had often stepped out on the historic balcony. Now he sometimes snapped at his adjutants when they came to him with the request that he show himself, stop bothering me with that. This seemingly small point had a certain bearing on the conception of the new Adolf Hitler Platz. For one day he said to me, you know it is not out of the question that I shall someday be forced to take unpopular measures. These might possibly lead to riots. We must provide for that eventuality. All the buildings on this square must be equipped with heavy steel bulletproof shutters over their windows. The doors, too, must be of steel, and there should be heavy iron gates for closing off the square. It must be possible to defend the center of the Rye like a fortress. This remark betrayed a nervousness he had not had before. The same feeling emerged when we discussed the location of the barracks for the bodyguard, which had meanwhile grown into a fully motorized regiment armed with the most modem equipment. He shifted its headquarters to the immediate vicinity of the Grand Southern Axis. Suppose there should be some disturbances, he said and pointing to the 400-foot-wide avenue, if they come rolling up here in their armored vehicles the full width of the street, nobody will be able to put up any resistance. I do not know whether the army heard of this arrangement and wanted to be on the spot before the SS, or whether Hitler himself gave the order, but in any case, 
At the request of the army command and with Hitler's approval a barracks site was prepared even closer to the center for the Gross Dutchland Guards Regiment. 13. I unwittingly gave expression to this separation of Hitler from his people, a Hitler who was ready to have soldiers fire upon the populace in my design for the facade of his palace. There was no opening in it except for the great steel entrance gate and a door to a balcony from which Hitler could show himself to the crowd. But this balcony was now suspended five stories high above the street. This frowning facade still seems to me to communicate an accurate image of the remote leader who had in the meantime moved into realms of self-idolatry. During my imprisonment, this design, with its red mosaics, its pillars, its bronze lions and gilded silhouettes, had assumed in my memory a bright, almost pleasant character. But when I once again saw the color photographs of the model, after a lapse of more than 21 years, I was struck by the resemblance to a Cecil B. de Milset. Along with its fantastic quality I also became aware of the cruel element in this architecture. It had been the very expression of a tyranny. Before the war, I had laughed at an inkwell which the architect Brinkman, who like Troost had originally designed steamship decor, had presented Hitler as a surprise gift. Brinkman had made a solemn construction out of this simple utensil. It was a mass of ornamentation, scrolls and steps, and then, alone and forlorn amid all the magnificence of this inkwell for the chief of state, there was a tiny pool of ink. I thought I had never seen anything so abnormal. But contrary to my expectations Hitler did not disdain the object. In fact he praised this bronze inkwell moderately. Brinkman was no less successful with the desk chair he had designed for Hitler. It was veritably of Garingisk proportions, a kind of throne with two oversized gilded pine cones topping the back. These two items, with their inflated bombast, seemed to me to reek of the parvenu. But from about 1937 on Hitler furthered this tendency toward pomposity by showing increasing approval of it. He had come round again to Vienna's Ringstress, where he had once begun. Slowly but steadily he moved even further away from the doctrines of Troost. And I moved with him. For my designs of this period owed less and less to what I regarded as my style. This estrangement from my beginnings was revealed in other ways besides the wildly excessive size of my buildings. For they also no longer had any of the Dorian character I had originally tried to achieve. They had become pure out of decadence. Wealth, the inexhaustible funds at my disposal, but also Hitler's party ideology, had led me along the path to a style which drew its inspiration rather from the show palaces of oriental despots. At the beginning of the war, I had formed a theory which I explained at a dinner in Maxims in Paris to a group of German and French artists. Cocteau and Dispiau were among the latter. The French Revolution, I said, had developed a new sense of style which was destined to replace the later Rococo. Even its simplest furniture was beautifully proportioned. This style, I argued, had found its purest expression in the architectural designs of Boulle. The directo ire that followed this revolutionary style had still treated their more abundant means with lightness and good taste. The turning point, I said, had come with the empire style. From year to year new elements were introduced, elaborate ornamentation had been lavished upon the still classical basic forms until, at the end, late empire had achieved a resplendence and wealth that could scarcely be surpassed. Late Empire had expressed the end point of a stylistic evolution which had begun so promisingly with the consulate. It had also expressed the transition from revolution to the Napoleonic Empire. Within it were revealed signs of decay which were a forecast of the end of the Napoleonic era. Compressed within the span of twenty years, I said, we could observe a phenomenon that ordinarily took place only over centuries the development from the Doric buildings of early antiquity to the fissured Baroque facades of late Hellenism, such as was to be seen in, say, Baalbek, or the Romanesque buildings at the beginning of the medieval period and the playful late Gothic at its end. Had I been able to think the matter out consistently, I ought to have argued further that my designs for Hitler were following the pattern of the late empire and forecasting the end of the regime, that, therefore, 
Hitler's downfall could be deduced from these very designs, but this was hidden from me at the time. Probably Napoleon's entourage saw in the ornate salons of the late empire only the expression of grandeur. Probably only posterity beholds the symptoms of downfall in such creations. Hitler's entourage, at any rate, felt the towering ink well to be a suitable prop for his genius as a statesman, and similarly accepted my hulking dome as the symbol of Hitler's power. The last buildings we designed in 1939 were in fact pure neo-empire, comparable to the style that prevailed a hundred and twenty-five years before, shortly before Napoleon's fall. They were marked by excessive ornamentation, a mania for gilding, a passion for pomp, and total decadence. And not only the style but the excessive size of these buildings plainly revealed Hitler's intention. One day in the early summer of 1939, he pointed to the German eagle with the swastika in its claws which was to crown the dome 957 feet in the air. That has to be changed. Instead of the swastika, the eagle is to be perched above the globe. To crown this greatest building in the world the eagle must stand above the globe. As late as May 8, 1943 Goebbels noted in his diary, the Führer expresses his unshakable conviction that the Reich will one day rule all of Europe. We will have to survive a great many conflicts, but they will doubtless lead to the most glorious triumphs. And from then on the road to world domination is practically spread out before us. For whoever rules Europe will be able to seize the leadership of the world. There are photos of the models in which this revision is plainly to be seen. A few months later the Second World War began. 12. The Descent Begins About the beginning of August 1939 we, an untroubled group, drove with Hitler up to the Eagle's Nest. The long motorcade wound along the road which Bormann had blasted into the rock. Through a high bronze portal we entered a marble hall, damp from the moisture in the heart of the mountain, and stepped into the elevator of polished brass. As we rode up the hundred and sixty-five feet of shaft, Hitler said abruptly, as if he were talking to himself, perhaps something enormously important will happen soon. Even if I should have to send Goering. But if need be I would even go myself. I am staking everything on this card. There was no more beyond this hint. Barely three weeks later, on August 21, 1939, we heard that the German foreign minister was in Moscow for some negotiations. During supper a note was handed to Hitler. He scanned it, stared into space for a moment, flushed deeply, then banged on the table so hard that the glasses rattled, and exclaimed in a voice breaking with excitement, I have them. I have them. Seconds later he had already regained control of himself. No one dared ask any question, and the meal continued. After supper Hitler called his entourage together. We are going to conclude an on-aggression pact with Russia. Here, read this. A telegram from Stalin. It briefly acknowledged the agreement that had been reached. To see the names of Hitler and Stalin linked in friendship on a piece of paper was the most staggering, the most exciting turn of events I could possibly have imagined. Immediately afterward we were shown a movie depicting Stalin watching a Red Army parade, a tremendous number of troops marched past him. Hitler expressed his gratification that this military might was now neutralized. He turned to his military adjutants, evidently wanting to hear their estimate of the mass display of weapons and troops. The ladies were still excluded, but of course they soon heard the news from us, and shortly afterward it was announced on the radio. Goebbels held an evening press conference on August 23rd in which he offered commentary on the pact. Hitler telephoned him immediately afterward. He wanted to know how the foreign correspondents had reacted. With eyes glistening feverishly, he told us what Goebbels had said. The sensation was fantastic. And when the church bells simultaneously began ringing outside, a British correspondent fatalistically remarked, that is the death knell of the British Empire. These words made the strongest impression upon Hitler in his euphoria that night. He thought he now stood so high as to be out of the reach of fate. 
In the course of the night we stood on the terrace of the Berghof with Hitler and marveled at a rare natural spectacle. Northern lights one of unusual intensity threw red light on the legend haunted Untersberg across the valley, while the sky above shimmered in all the colors of the rainbow. The last act of Gotterdam Rung could not have been more effectively staged. The same red light bathed our faces and our hands. The display produced a curiously pensive mood among us. Abruptly turning to one of his military adjutants, Hitler said, Looks like a great deal of blood. This time we won't bring it off without violence. 2. Weeks before, the center of Hitler's interests had already shifted to the military area. In long talks with his four military adjutants, Colonel Rudolf Schmund for the High Command of the Aimed Services, OKW, Captain Gerard Engel for the Army, Captain Nikolaus von Below for the Air Force, and Captain Karl Jesko von Puttkamer for the Navy, Hitler tried to arrive at definitive plans. He seemed to especially like these young and unbiased officers, all the more since he was always seeking approval, which they were more likely to give him than the perhaps better informed but skeptical generals. During these days immediately after announcement of the German-Russian pact, however, he saw less of the adjutants than of the political and military heads of the German Reich, among them Goering, Goebbels, Keitel, and Ribbentrop. Goebbels above all spoke openly and anxiously about the danger of war. Surprisingly, the usually radical propaganda minister considered the risk excessively large. He tried to recommend a peaceful line to Hitler's entourage and was particularly accurate toward Ribbentrop, whom he regarded as the chief representative of the war party. We who were members of Hitler's personal circle considered him as well as Goering, who also counseled peace, weaklings who had degenerated in the luxury of power and did not want to risk the privileges they had acquired. Even though my future as an architect was also at stake, I thought that the solution of national questions must take precedence over personal interests. Any doubts I might have had were quelled by the self-assurance Hitler showed. In those days he seemed to me like a hero of ancient myth who unhesitantly, in full consciousness of his strength, could enter upon and masterfully meet the test of the wildest undertakings. And, in fact, Nine months previously I had had Bar's reliefs portraying the Hercules legend installed on the new chancellery. Whoever did belong to the actual war party, aside from Hitler and Ribbentrop, had worked out arguments more or less as follows. Let us assume that because of our rapid rearmament we hold a 4 to 1 advantage in strength at the present time. Since the occupation of Czechoslovakia the other side has been rearming vigorously. They need at least one and a half to two years before their production will reach its maximum yield. Only after 1940 can they begin to catch up with our relatively large head of start. If they produce only as much as we do, however, our proportional superiority will constantly diminish, for in order to maintain it we would have to go on producing four times as much. We are in no position to do so. Even if they reach only half of our production, the proportion will constantly deteriorate. Right now, on the other hand, we have new weapons in all fields, the other side obsolete types.3. Considerations of this sort probably did not govern Hitler's decisions, but they undoubtedly influenced his choice of the time to strike. For the present, however, he remarked, I shall stay at Ober Salzburg as long as possible, in order to keep myself fresh for the difficult days to come. I'll go to Berlin only when decisions become essential. Only a few days later Hitler's motorcade was moving along the Autobahn to Munich. There were ten cars at long distances from one another, for security. My wife and I were in one of the cars. It was a beautiful, cloudless sunny day at the end of summer. The populace remained unusually silent as Hitler drove by. Hardly anyone waved. In Berlin, too. It was strikingly quiet in the vicinity of the chancellery. Usually, when Hitler's private standard was raised to indicate his presence, the building was besieged by people who cheered him as he drove out and in. In the nature of things I was excluded from the further course of events, all the more so because the normal routine of Hitler's day was turned topsy-turvy during this tumultuous spell. After the court moved to Berlin, 
An incessant series of conferences fully occupied Hitler's time. Our common meals were for the most part cancelled. Memory can be peculiarly arbitrary, and among my most vivid recollections is the somewhat comic picture of Bernardo Atolico, the Italian ambassador, rushing breathlessly into the chancellery a few days before the attack upon Poland. He was bringing word that for the present Italy could not keep its obligations under the alliance. The Duce cloaked this bad news in impossible demands for immediate delivery of a vast quantity of military and economic goods. Granting such demands could have resulted in a disastrous weakening of the German armed forces. Hitler had a high regard for the fighting strength of the Italian fleet in particular, with its modern units and large number of submarines. He was equally convinced of the effectiveness of the big Italian air force. For a moment he thought his plans had been ruined, for he assumed that Italy's bellicosity would help frighten the Western powers. In some dismay, he postponed the assault on Poland, which had already been ordered. But this temporary retreat soon yielded to new hopes, his instincts told him that even with Italy defaulting, the West might still shrink from declaring war. He therefore ejected Mussolini's offer to mediate, he would hold back no longer, he said, for if the army were held in suspense too long it would grow nervous. Besides, the period of good autumn weather would soon pass, and during the later rainy season there was danger of the troops bogging down in the Polish mud. Notes on the Polish question were exchanged with England. Out of the rush of events I particularly remember one evening in the conservatory of the Chancellor's residence. I had the impression that Hitler looked exhausted from overwork. He spoke with deep conviction to his intimate circle, this time the mistake of 1914 will be avoided. Everything depends on making the other side accept responsibility. In 1914 that was handled clumsily. And now again the ideas of the Foreign Office are simply useless. The best thing is for me to compose the notes myself. As he spoke he held a page of manuscript in his hand, probably the draft of a note from the Foreign Office. He hastily took his leave, not joining us for dinner, and vanished into the upper rooms. Later, in prison, I read that exchange of notes, it did not seem to me that Hitler had carried out his intent very well. Hitler's view that the West would once more give in to his demands as it had done at Munich was supported by intelligence information, an officer on the British general staff was said to have evaluated the strength of the Polish army and come to the conclusion that Polish resistance would soon collapse. Hitler thus had reason to hope that the British general staff would do everything in its power to advise its government against so hopeless a war. When, on September 3rd, the Western powers followed up their ultimatum with declarations of war, Hitler was initially stunned, but quickly reassured himself and us by saying that England and France had obviously declared war merely as a sham, in order not to lose face before the whole world. In spite of the declarations there would be no fighting, he was convinced of that, he said. He therefore ordered the Wehrmacht to remain strictly on the defensive. He felt that this decision of his showed remarkable political acumen. During those last days of August Hitler was in an unwanted state of nerves and at times completely lost the reassuring air of infallible leader. The hectic activities were followed by an uneasy period of quiet. For a short time Hitler resumed his customary daily routine. Even his interest in architectural plans revived. To his round table he explained. Of course we are in a state of war with England and France, but if we on our side avoid all acts of war, the whole business will evaporate. As soon as we sink a ship and they have sizable casualties, the war party over there will gain strength. Even when German U-boats lay in a favorable position near the French battleship Dunkirk he refused to authorize an attack. But the British air raid on Wilhelm Schaven and the sinking of the Athenia soon called for a reconsideration of this policy. He stuck unswervingly to his opinion that the West was too feeble, too worn out, and too decadent to begin the war seriously. Probably it was also embarrassing for him to admit to his entourage and above all to himself that he had made so crucial a mistake. I still remember his consternation when the news came that Churchill was going to enter the British War Cabinet as First Lord of the Admiralty. 
With this ill omened press report in his hand, Goering stepped out of the door of Hitler's salon. He dropped into the nearest chair and said wearily, Churchill in the cabinet. That means that the war is really on. Now we shall have war with England. From these and other observations I deduced that this initiation of real war was not what Hitler had projected. His illusions and wish dreams were a direct outgrowth of his unrealistic mode of working and thinking. Hitler actually knew nothing about his enemies and even refused to use the information that was available to him. Instead, he trusted his inspirations, no matter how inherently contradictory they might be, and these inspirations were governed by extreme contempt for and underestimation of the others. In keeping with his classic phrase that there were always two possibilities, he wanted to have the war at this supposedly most favorable moment, while at the same time he failed to adequately prepare for it. He regarded England, as he once stressed, as our enemy number one for while at the same time hoping to come to an arrangement with that enemy. I do not think that in those early days of September, Hitler was fully aware that he had irrevocably unleashed a world war. He had merely meant to move one step further. To be sure, he was ready to accept the risk associated with that step, just as he had been a year before during the Czech crisis, but he had prepared himself only for the risk, not really for the Great War. His naval rearmament was obviously planned for a later date, the battleships as well as the first large aircraft carriers were still under construction. He knew that they would not attain full military value until they could face the enemy on more or less even terms. Moreover, he had spoken so often of the neglect of the submarine arm in the First World War that he probably would not have knowingly begun the second without preparing a strong fleet of U-boats but all his anxieties seemed to be scattered to the winds in early September, when the campaign in Poland yielded such successes for the German troops. Hitler seemed to recover his assurance swiftly, and later, at the climax of the war, I frequently heard him say that the Polish campaign had been a necessary thing. Do you think it would have been good fortune for our troops if we had taken Poland without a fight, after obtaining Austria and Czechoslovakia without fighting? Believe me, not even the best army can stand that sort of thing. Victories without loss of blood are demoralizing. Therefore it was not only fortunate there was no compromise, at the time we would have had to regard it as harmful, and I therefore would have struck in any case. Five. It may be, nevertheless, that by such remarks he was trying to gloss over his diplomatic miscalculations of August 1939. On the other hand, Toward the end of the war Colonel General Heinrich told me about an early speech of Hitler's to the generals which points in the same direction. I noted down Heinrich's remarkable story as follows, Hitler said that he was the first man since Charlemagne to hold unlimited power in his own hand. He did not hold this power in vain, he said, but would know how to use it in a struggle for Germany. If the war were not won, that would mean that Germany had not stood the test of strength. In that case she would deserve to be and would be doomed. 6. From the start the populace took a far more serious view of the situation than did Hitler and his entourage. Because of the general nervousness a false air raid alarm was sounded in Berlin early in September. Along with many other Berliners I sat in a public shelter. The atmosphere was noticeably depressed, the people were full of fear about the future. Seven. Hitler looking at Speer's architectural plans at Obersalzburg, Spring 1934. Heinrich Hoffmann. None of the regiments marched off to war decorated with flowers as they had done at the beginning of the First World War. The streets remained empty. There was no crowd on Wilhelmsplatz shouting for Hitler. It was in keeping with the desolate mood that Hitler had his bags packed into the cars one night to drive east, to the front. Three days after the beginning of the attack on Poland he had his adjutant summon me to the provisionally blacked out residence in the chancellery to bid me goodbye. I found a man who lost his temper over trivialities. The cars drove up, and he tersely took his leave of the courtiers who were remaining behind. Not a soul on the street took notice of this historic event, Hitler driving off to the war he had staged. Obviously Goebbels could have provided a cheering crowd of any size, 
but he was apparently not in the mood to do it. Even during the mobilization Hitler did not forget his artists. In the late summer of 1939, orders were given that their draft records be sent to Hitler's adjutant by the various army districts. He then tore up the papers and threw them away. By this original device, the men ceased to exist for the draft boards. On the list drawn up by Hitler and Goebbels, however, architects and sculptors occupied little space. The overwhelming majority of those thus exempted were singers and actors. The fact that young scientists were also important for the future was not discovered until 1942, and then with my help. While still at Ober Salzburg I had telephoned Will Nagel, my former superior and now head of my staff, and asked him to begin forming a technical assistance group under my leadership. We wanted to put our well-coordinated team of construction supervisors to use in rebuilding bridges, extending or widening roads, and similar areas of the war effort. However, our notions about what we could do immediately were extremely vague. For the time being it consisted of no more than getting sleeping bags and tents ready, and painting my car field grey. On the day of general mobilization I went to the high command of the army on Bendelisteres. As might be expected in a Prusso-German organization, General Fromm, who was responsible for the army mobilization, sat idle in his office while the machinery ran according to plan. He readily accepted my offer of assistance, my car was given an army number, and I myself army identification papers. For the present, that was the extent of my wartime activity. It was Hitler who tersely forbade me to undertake any missions for the army. My duty, he told me, was to continue working at his plans. Thereupon I at least placed the workmen and the technical staffs employed on my buildings in Berlin at the disposal of the army and industry. We took charge of the Pienemund site for the development of rockets and of some urgent buildings for the aircraft industry. I informed Hitler of these commitments, which seemed to me the least I could do. I was confident of his approval. But to my surprise there came an unusually rude letter from Bormann. What was I doing choosing new assignments? He demanded. I had received no such orders. Hitler had asked him to let me know that all building projects were to proceed unchecked. This order provides another example of how unrealistically and dividedly Hitler thought. On the one hand he repeatedly asserted that Germany was now being challenged by fate and had to wage a life and death struggle, on the other hand he did not want to give up his grandiose toys. In making such choices, moreover, he was disregarding the mood of the masses, who were inevitably baffled by the construction of such luxury buildings, now that Hitler's expansionism was beginning to demand sacrifices. This order of his was the first one I shirked. It was true that I saw Hitler far more early during this first year of the war. But whenever he came to Berlin for a few days, or to Ober Salzburg for a few weeks, he still asked to be shown the building plans and urged me to go on developing them. But I think he soon tacitly accepted the cessation of actual work on the buildings. Around the beginning of October the German ambassador in Moscow, Count von Schulenberg, informed Hitler that Stalin was personally interested in our building plans. A series of photographs of our models was exhibited in the Kremlin, but on Hitler's instructions our largest buildings were kept secret in order, as he said, not to give Stalin any ideas. Schulenberg had proposed that I fly to Moscow to explain the plans. He might keep you there, Hitler commented half-jokingly, and refused to let me take the trip. A short while afterward, Schnur, a member of the embassy staff, informed me that Stalin had liked my sketches. On September 29, Ribbentrop returned from his second Moscow conference with a German-Soviet frontier and friendship treaty which was to seal the fourth partition of Poland. At Hitler's table he recounted that he had never felt so much at ease as among Stalin's associates, as if I were among old party comrades of ours, mein Führer. Hitler listened without a flicker of expression to this burst of enthusiasm on the part of the normally impassive foreign minister. Stalin, so Ribbentrop declared, seemed satisfied with the border arrangements, 
and when it was all settled drew in his own hand on the map along the border of the zone assigned to Russia an area which he presented to Ribbentrop as a vast hunting preserve. At this Gering's hackles rouse, he insisted that Stalin could hardly have meant this gift to apply to the foreign minister personally. On the contrary, it was a grant to the German Reich and consequently to himself as Reich master of the hunt. A hot dispute broke out between the two passionate hunters which ended with the foreign minister sulking, figuring proved more forceful in argument and better able to get his way. In spite of the war the renovation of the former palace of the Reich president, which was to be the foreign minister's new official residence, had to proceed. Hitler inspected the nearly completed building and showed dissatisfaction. Hastily and recklessly, Ribbentrop thereupon ordered the new annex tom down and rebuilt. Probably in order to please Hitler he insisted on clumsy marble doorways, huge doors, and mouldings which were quite unsuitable for rooms of middling size. Before the second inspection I begged Hitler to refrain from making negative comments, or else the foreign minister would order a third rebuilding. Hitler actually held his tongue, and only later in his intimate circle did he make fun of the building, which to his mind was an utter failure. In October, Hank told me something which had been learned when German troops met Soviet troops on the demarcation line in Poland, that Soviet equipment appeared extremely deficient, in fact wretched. Hank had reported this to Hitler. Army officers confirmed this point, Hitler must have listened to this piece of intelligence with the keenest interest for thereafter he repeatedly cited this report as evidence that the Russians were weak and poorly organized. Soon afterward, the failure of the Soviet offensive against Finland confirmed him in this view. In spite of all the secrecy I obtained some light on Hitler's further plans when he gave me the assignment, still in 1939, to fit out a headquarters for him in western Germany. Z. Jeanberg, a manorial estate of Goethe's time situated near Norheim in the foothills of the Taunus range, was modernized by us for this purpose, and provided with shelters. When the arrangements were completed, millions of marks squandered on building, telephone cables laid over hundreds of miles, and the most modem communications equipment installed, Hitler abruptly decided that the place was too luxurious for him. In wartime he must lead a simple life, he said and therefore quarters conceived in this spirit were to be built for him in the Eiffel Hills. This may have made an impression upon those who did not know how many millions of marks had already been expended and how many more millions would now have to be spent. We pointed this out to Hitler, but he would not be swayed, for he saw his reputation for modesty imperiled. After the swift victory in France, I was firmly convinced that Hitler had already become one of the great figures in German history. Yet I wondered at the apathy I thought I observed in the public despite all the grand triumphs. Hitler's self-confidence was obviously growing by leaps and bounds. He had found a new theme for his monologues at table. His great concept, he declared, had not run afoul of the inadequacies which had caused Germany to lose the First World War. In those days there had been dissension between the political and the military leadership, he said. The political parties had been given leeway to undermine the unity of the nation and even to engage in treasonous activities. For reasons of protocol incompetent princes of the ruling houses had to be commanders of their armies, they were supposed to earn military laurels in order to increase the glory of their dynasties. The only reason that enormous disasters had been averted was that these incompetent scions of decadent royal families had been assigned excellent general staff officers to aid them. Moreover, at the top as supreme warlord had been the incompetent Wilhelm II. Today, on the other hand, Germany was united. The states had been reduced to unimportance, the army commanders were selected from among the best officers without regard to their descent, the privileges of the nobility had been abolished, political life and the army as well as the nation as a whole had been forged into a unity. Moreover, he, Hitler, stood at the head. His strength, his determination, his energy would overcome all future difficulties. Hitler claimed total credit for the success of the campaign in the West. The plan for it came from him, he said. I have again and again, he told us, 
Read Colonel de Gaulle's book on methods of modem warfare employing fully motorized units, and I have learned a great deal from it. Shortly after the end of the campaign in France, I received a telephone call from the office of the Fras adjutant, I was to come to headquarters for a few days for a special purpose. Hitler had set up temporary headquarters in the small village of Bruley la Pesche near Sedan. The village had been cleared of all inhabitants. The generals and adjutants were established in the small houses that lined the single village street. Hitler's own quarters in no way differed from those of the others. At my arrival he greeted me in the best of humors. In a few days we are flying to Paris. I'd like you to be with us. Brecker and Jessler are coming along also. With that I was dismissed for the present, astonished that the victor had sent for three artists to accompany him on his entry into the French capital. That same evening I was invited to dine with Hitler's military circle. Details of the trip to Paris were discussed. This was not to be an official visit, I learned, but a kind of art tour by Hitler. This was the city, as he had so often said, which had fascinated him from his earliest years, so that he thought he would be able to find his way about the streets and important monuments as if he had lived there, solely from his endless studies of its plans. The armistice was to go into effect at 1.35 am on June 25, 1940. That night we sat with Hitler around a deal table in the simple room of a peasant house. Shortly before the agreed time Hitler gave orders to turn out the light and open the windows. Silently, we sat in the darkness, swept by the sense of experiencing a historic moment so close to the author of it. Outside, a bugler blew the traditional signal for the end of fighting. A thunderstorm must have been brewing in the distance, for as in a bad novel occasional flashes of heat lightning shimmered through the dark room. Someone, overcome by emotion, blew his nose. Then Hitler's voice sounded, soft and unemphatic, this responsibility. And a few minutes later, now switch the light on. The trivial conversation continued, but for me it remained a rare event. I thought I had for once seen Hitler as a human being. Next day I set out from headquarters for Reims, to see the cathedral. A ghostly looking city awaited me, almost deserted, ringed by military police protecting the champagne cellars. Casement windows banged in the wind, newspapers of several days ago blew through the streets, open front doors revealed interiors. It was as if ordinary life had stood still for a foolish moment. Glasses, dishes and half-eaten meals could be seen on the tables. En route we had encountered innumerable refugees along the roads. They used the sides of the roads, for the middle was taken up by columns of German army units. These self-assured troops between the worn-looking people transporting their worldly goods in baby carriages, wheelbarrows, and other primitive vehicles made a striking contrast. Three and a half years later I saw similar scenes in Germany, Three days after the beginning of the armistice we landed at Le Baguette airfield. It was early in the morning, about 5.30. Three large Mercedes sedans stood waiting. Hitler as usual sat in the front seat beside the chauffeur, Brecker and I on the jump seats behind him, while Jessler and the adjutants occupied the rear seats. Field grey uniforms had been provided for us artists, so that we might fit into the military framework. We drove through the extensive suburbs directly to the opera, Charles Garnier's Great Niebroke building. It was Hitler's favorite and the first thing he wanted to see. Colonel Spadell, assigned by the German occupation authority, was waiting at the entrance for us. The Great Stairway, famous for its spaciousness, notorious for its excessive ornamentation, the resplendent foyer, the elegant, gilded parterre, were carefully inspected. All the lights glowed as they would on a gala night. Hitler had undertaken to lead the party. A white-haired attendant accompanied our small group through the deserted building. Hitler had actually studied the plans of the Paris Opera House with great care. Near the proscenium box he found a salon missing, remarked on it, and turned out to be right. The attendant said that this room had been eliminated in the course of renovations many years ago. There. You see how well I know my way about, 
Hitler commented complacently. He seemed fascinated by the opera, went into ecstasies about its beauty, his eyes glittering with an excitement that struck me as uncanny. The attendant, of course, had immediately recognized the person he was guiding through the building. In a businesslike but distinctly aloof manner, he showed us through the rooms. When we were at last getting ready to leave the building, Hitler whispered something to his adjutant, Bruckner, who took a 50 mark note from his wallet and went over to the attendant standing some distance away. Pleasantly, but firmly, the man refused to take the money. Hitler tried a second time, sending Brecker over to him, but the man persisted in his refusal. He had only been doing his duty, he told Brecker. Afterward, we drove past the Madeleine, down the Champs Elysees, onto the Trocadero, and then to the Eiffel Tower, where Hitler ordered another stop. From the Arc de Triomphe with its tomb of the unknown soldier we drove on to the Invalides, where Hitler stood for a long time at the tomb of Napoleon. Finally, Hitler inspected the Pantheon, whose proportions greatly impressed him. On the other hand he showed no special interest in some of the most beautiful architectural works in Paris, the Place des Vosges, the Louvre, the Palace of Justice, and saint -E chapelle He became animated again only when he saw the unitary row of houses on the Rue de Rivoli. The end of our tour was the romantic, insipid imitation of early medieval dome churches, the Church of Sacre Coeur en Montmartre, a surprising choice, even given Hitler's taste. Here he stood for a long time surrounded by several powerful men of his escort squad, while many churchgoers recognized him but ignored him. After a last look at Paris we drove swiftly back to the airport. By nine o'clock in the morning the sightseeing tour was over. It was the dream of my life to be permitted to see Paris. I cannot say how happy I am to have that dream fulfilled today. For a moment I felt something like pity for him, three hours in Paris the one and only time he was to see it, made him happy when he stood at the height of his triumphs. In the course of the tour Hitler raised the question of a victory parade in Paris. But after discussing the matter with his adjutants and Colonel Spadell, he decided against it after all. His official reason for calling off the parade was the danger of its being harassed by English air aids. But later he said, I am not in the mood for a victory parade. We aren't at the end yet. That same evening he received me once more in the small room in the peasant house. He was sitting alone at table. Without more ado he declared, draw up a decree in my name ordering full-scale resumption of work on the Berlin buildings. Wasn't Paris beautiful? But Berlin must be made far more beautiful. In the past I often considered whether we would not have to destroy Paris, he continued with great calm as if he were talking about the most natural thing in the world. But when we are finished in Berlin, Paris will only be a shadow. So why should we destroy it? With that, I was dismissed. Although I was accustomed to hearing Hitler make impulsive remarks, I was nevertheless shocked by this cool display of vandalism. He had reacted in a similar fashion to the devastation of Warsaw. At the time he had announced that he was not going to allow the city to be rebuilt, in order to deprive the Polish people of their political and cultural center. Warsaw, however, had been devastated by acts of war. Now Hitler was showing that he could entertain the thought of wantonly and without cause annihilating the city which he himself had called the most beautiful in Europe, with all its priceless artistic treasures. Within a few days some of the contradictions in Hitler's nature had been revealed to me, although at the time I certainly did not perceive them in anything like their full intensity. He contained a multitude of selves, from a person deeply aware of his responsibilities all the way to a ruthless and mankind-hating nihilist. The effect of this experience however was quickly obscured for me. I was once again seduced by Hitler's brilliant victories and by the prospect of soon resuming work on my building projects. Now it was up to me to surpass Paris. Nothing more was said of raising her monuments. Instead, Hitler gave orders that our own be erected with maximum urgency. As he himself reworded the decree, Berlin is to be given the style commensurate with the grandeur of our victory, and he further declared. 
I regard the accomplishment of these supremely vital constructive tasks for the Reich as the greatest step in the preservation of our victory. He antedated this decree to June 25, 1940, the day of the armistice and of his greatest triumph. Hitler was pacing back and forth on the gravel path in front of his house, accompanied by Generals Jodl and Key Eitel, when an adjutant came to tell him that I wished to take my leave. I was summoned, and as I approached the group I heard a snatch of the conversation, now we have shown what we are capable of, Hitler was saying. Believe me, Key Eitel, a campaign against Russia would be like a child's game in a sandbox by comparison. In radiant good humor, he bade me goodbye, sent his warmest regards to my wife, and promised that he would soon be discussing new plans and models with me. 13. Excess. Even while Hitler was deep in the plans for the Russian campaign, his mind was already dwelling on theatrical effects for the victory parades of 1950, once the Grand Boulevard and the Great Triumphal Arch had been completed. One, but while he dreamed of new wars, new victories and celebrations, he suffered one of the greatest defeats of his career. Three days after a talk with me in which he had outlined more of his conceptions of the future, I was called to Ober Salzburg with my sketches. Waiting in the anteroom of the Berghof, pale and agitated, were Lietchen and Peinsch, two of Hesse's adjutants. They asked if I would let them see Hitler first, they had a personal letter from Hess to transmit to him. At this moment Hitler descended from his room upstairs. One of the adjutants was called into the salon. While I began leafing through my sketches once more, I suddenly heard an inarticulate, almost animal outcry. Then Hitler roared, Bormann, at once. Where is Bormann? Bormann was told to get in touch with Goering, Ribbentrop, Goebbels, and Himmler by the fastest possible means. All private guests were confined to the upper floor. Many hours passed before we learned what had happened, Hitler's deputy had flown to hostile England. Superficially, Hitler soon appeared to have regained his usual composure. What bothered him was that Churchill might use the incident to pretend to Germany's allies that Hitler was extending a peace feeler. Who will believe me when I say that Hess did not fly there in my name, that the whole thing is not some sort of intrigue behind the backs of my allies? Japan might even alter her policy because of this, he fretted. He put through a phone call to Ernst Hute, the famous First World War fighter pilot and now technical chief of the Air Force, and wanted to know whether the two-motored plane Hess was using could reach its goal in Scotland and what were the conditions it would encounter. After a brief interval you'd called back to say that Hess was bound to fail for navigational reasons alone, because of the prevailing side winds he would probably fly past England and into empty space. For a moment Hitler regained hope, if only he would drown in the North Sea. Then he would vanish without a trace, and we could work out some harmless explanation at our leisure. But after a few hours his anxieties returned and in order to anticipate the British in any case he decided to announce over the radio that Hess had gone mad. The two adjutants, however, were arrested, as the harbingers of bad news used to be at the courts of ancient despots. A rush of activity began at the Berghof. Aside from Goering, Goebbels, and Ribbentrop, Lee, various scorletters, and other party leaders arrived. Lee, as organizational chief of the party, made a bid to take over Hess's duties. In organizational terms this was no doubt what should have happened. But Bormann now showed for the first time how much influence he had over Hitler. He made short work of fending off Lee's proposal, and took the post for himself. Churchill commented at the time that this flight showed the presence of a worm in the German apple. He could not possibly have guessed how literally this phrase applied to Hess's successor. Henceforth. Hess was scarcely ever mentioned in Hitler's entourage. Bormann alone looked into the affairs of his former superior and showed great zeal in visiting the sins of her husband on Frau Hess. Eva Braun tried to intercede with Hitler on her behalf, but unsuccessfully, later she gave her a small allowance behind Hitler's back. A few weeks later I heard from my doctor, Professor Kuhl, that Hess's father was dying. I sent him flowers. 
though without disclosing myself as the sender. At the time it appeared to me that Bormann's ambition had driven Hess to this desperate act. Hess, also highly ambitious, could plainly see himself being excluded from access to and influence over Hitler. Thus, for example, Hitler said to me sometime in 1940, after a conversation with Hess lasting many hours, when I talk with Goering, it's like a bath in steel for me, I feel fresh afterward. The Rye Marshal has a stimulating way of presenting things. With Hess every conversation becomes an unbearably tormenting strain. He always comes to me with unpleasant matters and won't leave off. By his flight to England, Hess was probably trying, after so many years of being kept in the background, to win prestige and some success. For he did not have the qualities necessary for survival in the midst of a swamp of intrigues and struggles for power. He was too sensitive, too receptive, too unstable, and often told all factions they were in the right, in the order of their appearance. As a type he undoubtedly corresponded to the majority of the high party leaders, like him, most of them had great difficulty keeping the ground of reality under their feet. Hitler put the blame for Hess's flight on the corrupting influence of Professor Haushofer. Hess had first introduced Hitler to Professor Karl Haushofer, a former general and founder of the theories of geopolitics. His ideas strongly influenced Hitler's early thinking, but Haushofer evidently did not go all the way with Nazism. His son, Albrecht Haushofer, was arrested for participation in the July 20, 1944, conspiracy and was shot in the closing days of the war. Professor Haushofer committed suicide after his son's death. Twenty-five years later, in Spandau prison, Hess assured me in all seriousness that the idea had been inspired in him in a dream by supernatural forces. He said he had not at all intended to oppose or embarrass Hitler. We will guarantee England her empire, in return she will give us a free hand in Europe. That was the message he took to England without managing to deliver it. It had also been one of Hitler's recurrent formulas before and occasionally even during the war. If I judge correctly, Hitler never got over this disloyalty on the part of his deputy. Some while after the assassination attempt of July 20, 1944, he mentioned, in the course of one of his fantastic misreadings of the real situation, that among his conditions for peace was the extradition of the traitor. Hess would have to be hanged, he said. When I told Hess about this later, he commented, he would have made it up with me. I'm certain of it. And don't you believe that in 1945, when everything was going to smash, he sometimes thought, Hess was right after all. Hitler went even further than insisting that the Berlin buildings be pushed forward at full speed in the midst of war. Under the influence of his Gauleiters he also wildly lengthened the list of cities slated for reconstruction. Originally they had been only Berlin, Nuremberg, Munich, and Linz. Now, by personal decrees, he declared another 27 cities, including Hanover, Augsburg, Bremen, and Weimar, to be reconstruction cities. To neither I nor anyone else was ever asked about the feasibility of such decisions. Instead, after each such conference I merely received a copy of the decree Hitler had informally issued. According to my estimate at the time the costs for party buildings alone in those reconstruction cities would be, as I wrote to Bormann on November 26, 1940, between 22 and 25 billion marks. I thought that my own deadlines were being imperiled by these requirements. At first I tried to secure a decree from Hitler placing all building plans throughout the Reich under my authority. But when this effort was blocked by Bormann, I told Hitler on January 17, 1941, after a long illness that had given me time to reflect on many problems, that it would be better if I were to concentrate only upon the buildings in Nuremberg and Berlin which had been assigned to me. Hitler instantly agreed, you're right. It would be a pity if you threw away your energies on general matters. If necessary you can declare in my name that I, the Führer, do not wish you to become involved in these other matters lest you be led away from your proper artistic tasks. 3. I avail myself generously of this exemption, and during the next few days resigned all my party offices. 
if I can sort out my motives at the time, this step was probably also directed against Borman, who had been hostile to me from the start. I knew I was in no danger, however, since Hitler had frequently referred to me as irreplaceable. Occasionally I was caught amiss, at which times Borman could deliver a sharp reproof to me from headquarters, undoubtedly with satisfaction. Thus, for example, I had consulted with the Protestant and Catholic authorities on the location of churches in our new section of Berlin. As yet we had only agreed to compensate the churches for those of their buildings situated in parts of the inner city which were slated for demolition. Bormann curtly informed me that churches were not to receive building sites. Hitler's decree of June 25, 1940, for the preservation of our victory was tantamount to an order for work to go forward on the buildings in Berlin and Nuremberg. A few days later, however, I made it clear to Reich Minister Lammers that of course we did not intend to proceed at once with the practical reconstruction of Berlin. As long as the war was going on. But Hitler remonstrated and commanded continuance of the building operations even though to do so ran against public feeling. Again on his insistence I set up a Fröhl's immediate program, in the light of which Goering, this was in the middle of April 1941, assigned the necessary quantity of iron to me. It amounted to 84,000 tons annually. To camouflage the operation from the public, the program was given the code name War Program for Waterways and Rye Railways, Berlin Section. On April 18, Hitler and I again discussed deadlines for the completion of the Great Hall, the High Command of the Armed Forces, the Chancellery, the Fras Building, in short, for his power centers around Adolf Hitler Platz. He was still determined to have that complex erected as quickly as possible. Simultaneously, an association of seven of the best German construction firms was organized for the purpose of speeding the work. With his characteristic obstinacy and in spite of the impending campaign against the Soviet Union, Hitler personally continued to take a hand in the selection of paintings for the Linz Gallery. He sent his art dealers into the occupied areas to comb the picture market there, with the result that there was soon a bitter contest between his dealers and Goering's. The picture war had begun to take a nasty turn when Hitler finally reproved his Reich Marshal and thereby once and for all restored the order of rank even in regard to art dealers. In 1941 large catalogues bound in brown leather arrived at Ober Salzburg. They contained photographs of hundreds of paintings which Hitler personally distributed among his favorite galleries, Linz, Königsburg, Breslau, and other eastern cities. At the Nuremberg trials, I saw these volumes again as evidence for the prosecution. The majority of the paintings had been seized from Jewish owners by Rosenberg's Paris office. Hitler made no inroads on the famous state art collections of France. However, this restraint was not so unselfish as it seemed, for he occasionally remarked that in a peace treaty the best pieces from the Louvre would have to be delivered to Germany as part of war reparations. But Hitler did not utilize his authority for his private ends. He did not keep in his own possession a single one of the paintings acquired or confiscated in the occupied territories. Goering, on the other hand, went about increasing his art collection during the war by any means whatsoever. The halls and rooms of Karin Hall were sheathed with valuable paintings hung one above the other in three and four tiers. He even had a life-size nude representing Europe mounted above the canopy of his magnificent bed. He himself also dabbled in art dealing, the walls of one large hall of his country estate were covered with paintings. They had been the personal property of a well-known Dutch art dealer who after the occupation had been compelled to turn over his collection to Goering for a ridiculous price. In the middle of the war Goering sold these pictures to Gorlitters, as he told me with a childlike smile, for many times what he had paid, adding, moreover, an extra something to the price for the glory of the paintings having come from the famous Goering collection. One day, it must have been sometime in 1943, I heard from a French intermediary that Goering was pressing the Vichy government to exchange a famous painting belonging to the Louvre for several of the worthless pictures in his own collection. 
Knowing Hitler's views about the inviolability of the Louvre's collection, I was able to advise the French informant not to yield to this pressure, if Goering should persist in the matter, he was to let me know. Goering, however, let it drop. On the other hand, one day at Karen Hall he showed me the Sturzing altar, which had been presented to him by Mussolini after the agreement on South Tyrol in the winter of 1940. Hitler was often outraged by the way the second man in the state appropriated valuable works of art, but he never dared call Goering to account. Toward the end of the war Goering invited my friend Brecker and me to afternoon dinner at Karen Hall, this was a rare and exceptional occasion. The meal was not too lavish, but I was rather taken aback when at its end an ordinary brandy was poured for us, while Goering's servant poured his, with a certain solemnity, from a dusty old bottle. This is reserved for me alone, he commented without embarrassment to his guests and went on about the particular French palace in which this rare find had been confiscated. Afterward, in an expansive mood, he showed us the treasures stowed away in the Karin Hall cellar. Among them were some priceless classical pieces from the Naples Museum, these had been removed before the evacuation of Naples at the end of 1943. With the same pride of ownership he had his cupboards open to allow us a glimpse of his hoard of French soaps and perfumes, a stock that would have sufficed for years. At the conclusion of this display he sent for his collection of diamonds and other precious stones, obviously worth hundreds of thousands of marks. Hitler's purchases of paintings stopped after he had appointed the head of the Dresden Gallery, Dr. Hans Posse, as his agent for building the Linz collection. Until then Hitler had chosen his purchases himself from the auction catalogues. In the course of this he had occasionally been victimized by his habit of appointing two or three rivals to carry out a particular assignment. There were times when he would have separately instructed both his photographer, Heinrich Hoffmann, and one of his art dealers, to bid without limit. The result was that Hitler's two emissaries kept fearlessly outbidding one another long after all other bidders had dropped out. This went on until one day Hans Lang, the Berlin auctioneer, called my attention to this state of affairs. Shortly after the appointment of Posse, Hitler showed him his previous acquisitions, including the Grutzner collection. The showing took place in Hitler's air raid shelter, where he had stored these treasures for safety. Chairs were brought in for Posse, Hitler, and myself, and SS orderlies carried in picture after picture. Hitler went on about his favorite paintings in his usual way, but Posse refused to be overpowered either by Hitler's position or by his engaging amiability. Objective and incorruptible, he turned down many of these expensive acquisitions, scarcely useful or not in keeping with the stature of the gallery, as I conceive it. As was so often the case when Hitler was dealing with a specialist, he accepted the criticisms without demur. Posse rejected most of the pictures by painters of Hitler's beloved Munich school. In the middle of November 1940, Molotov arrived in Berlin. Hitler and his dinner guests greatly relished the tale carried by his physician, Dr. Karl Brandt, that the Soviet foreign minister's staff had all plates and silverware boiled before use for fear of German germs. In the salon at the Berghof stood a large globe on which, a few months later, I found traces of this unsuccessful conference. One of the army adjutants pointed out, with a significant look, an ordinary pencil line, a line running from north to south along the Urals. Hitler had drawn it to indicate the future boundary between his sphere of interest and that of the Japanese. On June 21, 1941, the eve of the attack on the Soviet Union, Hitler called me into his Berlin salon after dinner, had a record put on and a few bars from a list sleigh preludes played. You'll hear that often in the near future, because it is going to be our victory fanfare for the Russian campaign. Funk chose it. How do you like it? We'll be getting our granite and marble from there, in any quantities we want. For each of the previous campaigns Hitler had personally chosen a musical fanfare that preceded radio announcements of striking victories. Hitler was now openly manifesting his megalomania. What his building plans had been implying for years was now to be sealed in blood, as he put it, by a new war. 
Aristotle once wrote in the Politics, it remains true that the greatest injustices proceed from those who pursue excess, not from those who are driven by necessity. For Ribbentrop's 50th birthday in 1943 several of his close associates presented him with a handsome casket, ornamented with semi-precious stones, which they intended to fill with photocopies of all the treaties and agreements concluded by the foreign minister. We were thrown into great embarrassment, Ambassador Huell, Ribbentrop's liaison man, remarked to Hitler at supper, when we were about to fill the casket. There were only a few treaties that we hadn't broken in the meantime. Hitler's eyes filled with tears of laughter. As had happened at the beginning of the war, I was again oppressed by the idea of pushing forward with such vast building operations, drawing upon all available means, when the Great War was obviously reaching a crucial stage. On July 30, 1941, while the German advance in Russia was still proceeding boldly, I proposed to Dr. Tott, who was in charge of the entire German construction industry, that work be suspended on all buildings not essential for the war effort. For Tott, however, thought that in view of the present favorable state of military operations we could wait a few weeks more before facing this question. The question was to be deferred altogether, for my arguments once again made no impression on Hitler. He would not hear of any restrictions and refused to divert the material and labor for his private buildings to war industries any more than he would consider calling a halt to his favorite projects, the Autobahns, the party buildings, and the Berlin projects. In the middle of September 1941, when the advance in Russia was already lagging considerably behind the overconfident forecasts, Hitler ordered sizable increases in our contracts for granite purchases from Sweden, Norway, and Finland for my big Berlin and Nuremberg buildings. Contracts to the value of 30 million Reichsmarks had been awarded to the leading companies in the Norwegian, Finnish, Italian, Belgian, Swedish, and Dutch stone industry.5 in order to bring these vast quantities of granite to Berlin and Nuremberg, we founded on June 4, 1941, a transport fleet of our own and set up our own shipyards in Wismar and Berlin, with plans to build a thousand boats with a cargo capacity of 500 tons each. My proposals that we cease peacetime building continued to be disregarded even when the outlines of the disaster of the winter of 1941 in Russia began to be apparent. On November 29, 1941, Hitler told me bluntly, the building must begin even while this war is still going on. I am not going to let the war keep me from accomplishing my plans. 6. After the initial successes in Russia, moreover, Hitler decided that we wanted even more martial accents for our boulevard. These were to be supplied by captured enemy armaments set up on granite pedestals. On August 20, 1941, on Hitler's orders, I informed an astonished Admiral Lorre, commander of the Berlin Armory, that we intended to place 30 pieces of captured heavy artillery between the South Station and the Triumphal Arch, Structure T, as we privately called it. There were other points, I informed the Admiral, on the Grand Boulevard and along the southern axis where Hitler wanted to place such guns, so that we would need about 200 pieces of the heaviest type in toto. Any extra-large tanks were to be reserved for setting up in front of important public buildings. Hitler's ideas about the political constitution of his Teutonic Empire of the German nation still seemed quite vague, but he had already made up his mind about one point, in the immediate vicinity of the Norwegian city of Trondheim, which offered a particularly favorable strategic position. The largest German naval base was to arise. Along with shipyards and docks a city for a quarter of a million Germans would be built and incorporated into the German Reich. Hitler had commissioned me to do the planning. On May 1, 1941, I obtained from Vice Admiral Fuchs of the High Command of the Navy the necessary data on the space required for a large state-owned shipyard. On June 21, Grand Admiral Reda and I went to the Chancellery to report to Hitler on the project. Hitler then determined the approximate site of the city. As much as a year later, on May 13, 1942, 
He discussed this base in the course of a conference on armaments. Seven special maps were prepared from which he studied the optimum position of the docks, and he decided that a large underground submarine base was to be blasted into the granite cliff. For the rest, Hitler assumed that Street Nazaire and Lorient in France, as well as the British Channel Islands, would be incorporated into a future naval base system. Thus he disposed of twill of territories, interests, and rights belonging to others, by now he was totally convinced of his world dominion. In this connection I must mention his plan for founding German cities in the occupied areas of the Soviet Union. On November 24, 1941 in the very midst of the winter catastrophe, Gorlita Meyer, deputy of Alfred Rosenberg, the Rye Minister for the Occupied Eastern Territories, asked me to take over the section on new cities and plan and build the settlements for the German garrisons and civil administrations. I finally refused this offer at the end of January 1942 on the grounds that a central authority for city planning would inevitably lead to a uniformity of pattern. I instead suggested that the great German cities each stand as sponsor for the construction of the new ones. Eight. Ever since I had begun, at the beginning of the war, to assume responsibility for erecting buildings for the Army and Air Force, I had considerably expanded the organization entrusted with this work. To be sure, by the standards of a few months hence, the 26,000 construction workers employed on these military programs by the end of 1941 would be insignificant. But at this time I was proud of being able to make a small contribution to the war effort, it eased my conscience not to be engaged entirely on Hitler's peacetime plans. The most pressing task was the U-88 program for the Air Force, which was to turn out the new two-motored, medium-range Junkers 88 dive bombers. Three big factories in Brunn, Graz, and Vienna, each of them larger than the Volkswagen plant, were completed within eight months. For the first time we used prefabricated concrete elements. From the autumn of 1941 on, however, our work was hampered by the shortage of fuel. Even though our programs had top priority, in September 1941 the amounts of fuel assigned to them had to be reduced by a third and by January 1, 1942, to a sixth of our needs.9 that is just one example of how greatly Hitler had overextended his resources by embarking on the Russian campaign. Along with this, repair of the bomb damage in Berlin and the building of air raid shelters had been turned over to me. Without suspecting it, I was thus preparing for my duties as Minister of Armaments. For one thing, this gave me some insight into the havoc creaked on the mechanisms of production by the constant arbitrary shifts in programs and priorities. For another thing, it taught me a good deal about the power relationships and the dissensions within the leadership. For example, I took part in a session with Goering in the course of which General Thomas expressed his anxieties about the vast demands the leadership was making upon the economy. Goering answered the respected general by roaring at him, What business is that of yours? I am handling that, I am, do you hear? Or are you by any chance in charge of the four-year plan? You have nothing to say in this matter, the Führer has entrusted all these questions to me alone. In such disputes General Thomas could expect no support from his chief, General Keitel, who was only too glad to escape being bullied by Goering. The well-conceived economic plan of the armaments office of the high command of the armed forces was never carried out. But as I had already realized by then, Goering did nothing about these problems. Whenever he did do anything, he usually created total confusion, since he never took the trouble to work through the problems but made his decisions on the basis of impulsive inspirations. A few months later, around November 1941, in my capacity as Chief of Armaments Construction I took part in a conversation between Field Marshal Milch and Dr. Tot. In the autumn of 1941, Hitler was convinced that the Russians were already defeated, he therefore wanted priority to be given to building up the air force in preparation for his next operation, the subjugation of England. This order of Hitler's was still in effect in December 1941, although the situation had changed radically. Hitler hesitated to withdraw such orders, 
partly because he had a general tendency to hesitate and partly because he was concerned about saving face. A new order consistent with the exigencies of the war, giving army equipment priority over air force equipment, as required by the circumstances, was not issued until January 10, 1942. Milch now insisted on this priority, as was his duty, while Dr. Tot, who knew something about the military situation, was close to despair. For he too was responsible for increasing the equipment of the army as fast as possible, but lacked an order from Hitler which would have given his assignment the necessary priority. At the end of the conference Tot summed up his helplessness, it would be best, sir, if you'd take me into your ministry and let me be your assistant. It was again in the fall of 1941 that I visited the Junkers plant in Dessau to see General Manager Koppenberg and discuss how to coordinate our building programs with his production plans. After we had worked the matter out, he led me into a locked room and showed me a graph comparing American bomber production for the next several years with ours. I asked him what our leaders had to say about these depressing comparative figures. That's just it, they won't believe it he said. Whereupon he broke into uncontrollable tears. But Goering, the commander-in-chief of the then heavily engaged Luftwaffe, had plenty of leisure. On June 23, 1941, the day after the beginning of the attack on the Soviet Union, he found time to dress in his gala uniform and come with me to see the models of his Reich Marshal's office, which were being exhibited in Terepto. My last heart tour for a quarter of a century took me to Lisbon where on November 8 an exhibit of new German architecture was being opened. I was supposed to fly in Hitler's plane, but when it appeared that some of the alcoholic members of his entourage, such as Adjutant Schauben the photographer Hoffmann, wanted to go along on the flight, I shook off their company by proposing to Hitler that I drive to Lisbon in my car. I saw ancient cities such as Burgos, Segovia, Toledo, and Salamanca, I visited the Escorial, a complex I could compare only to Hitler's for a palace in its proportions, although the underlying impulse was quite different and far more spiritual, Philip. I had surrounded the palace nucleus with a monastery. What a contrast with Hitler's architectural ideas, in the one case, remarkable conciseness and clarity, magnificent interior rooms, their forms perfectly controlled, in the other case, pomp and disproportionate ostentation. Moreover, this rather melancholic creation by the architect Juan de Herrera, 1530-97, more closely matched our ominous situation than Hitler's boastful program music. In hours of solitary contemplation it began to dawn on me for the first time that my recent architectural ideals were on the wrong track. Because of this trip I missed the visit to Berlin of several Parisian acquaintances, among them Vlaminck, de Rain, and Dispiau Comaten who at my invitation had come to see the models of our plans for Berlin. They must have looked in dead silence at our project and at the buildings that were going up. The office journal does not record a word about the impression that our exhibit made on them. I had met them during my stays in Paris and through my office had several times helped them out with commissions. Curiously enough, they had more freedom than their German colleagues. For when I visited the Salon d'Automne in Paris during the war, the walls were hung with pictures which would have been branded degenerate art in Germany. Hitler, too, had heard of this show. His reaction was as surprising as it was logical. Are we to be concerned with the intellectual soundness of the French people? Let them degenerate if they want to. All the better for us. While I was on my trip to Lisbon, a transportation disaster had developed behind the fronts in the Eastern Theatre of War. The German military organization had been unable to cope with the Russian winter. Moreover, the Soviet troops in the course of their retreat had systematically wiped out all locomotive sheds watering stations, and other technical apparatus of their railroad system. In the intoxication of success during the summer and autumn when it seemed that the Russian bear is already finished, no one had given sufficient thought to the repair of this equipment. Hitler had refused to understand that such technical measures must be taken well ahead of time, in view of the Russian winter. 
I heard about these difficulties from high officials of the Reich Spain, the government railroad system, and from army and air force generals. I thereupon proposed to Hitler that 30,000 of the 65,000 German construction workers I was employing be assigned under the direction of my engineers, to repair work on the railroads. Incredibly, it was two weeks before Hitler could bring himself to authorize this. On December 27, 1941, he at last issued the order. Instead of hurling construction crews into the breach at the beginning of November, he had gone on with his triumphal buildings determined not to capitulate in any way to reality. On that same December 27, I had a meeting with Dr. Tot in his modest house on Hintersee near Birchtsgaden. He assigned the entire Ukraine to me as my field of activity, while staffs and workmen who had all along been frivolously engaged in working on the autobahns were made responsible for the central and northern areas of Russia. Tot had just returned from a long tour of inspection in the Eastern Theatre of War. He had seen stalled hospital trains in which the wounded had frozen to death and had witnessed the misery of the troops in villages and hamlets cut off by snow and cold. He had been struck by the discouragement and despair among the German soldiers. Deeply depressed himself, he concluded that we were both physically incapable of enduring such hardships and psychologically doomed to destruction in Russia. It is a struggle in which the primitive people will prove superior, he continued. They can endure everything, including the harshness of the climate. We are too sensitive and are bound to be defeated. In the end the victory will go to the Russians and the Japanese. Hitler too, obviously influenced by Spengler, had expressed similar ideas in peacetime when he spoke of the biological superiority of the Siberians and Russians. But when the campaign in the East began, he thrust aside his own thesis, for it ran counter to his plans. Hitler's passion for building, his blind attachment to his personal hobbies, stimulated the same sort of thing in his imitative paladins, so that most of them had assumed the lifestyle of victors. Even at the time I felt that here was one dangerous flaw in Hitler's system. For unlike the democratic regimes, there could be no public criticism, no demand could arise that these abuses be corrected. On March 19, 1945, in my last letter to Hitler, I reminded him of this tendency, I was sore at heart in the victorious days of 1940 when I saw how we were losing, among a broad spectrum of our leadership, our inner discipline. That was the very time when we ought to have proved our worthiness to providence by decency and inner modesty. Though these lines were written five years later, they confirm the fact that at the time I saw the mistakes, winced at the abuses, took a critical stand, and was tormented by doubts and skepticism. But I must admit that these feelings were born from my fear that Hitler and his leadership might gamble away the victory. In the middle of 1941, Goering inspected our model city on Pariser Platz. In a moment of affability he made an unusual remark to me, I have told the Führer, he said, that I consider you, after him, the greatest man Germany possesses. But as second man in the hierarchy he felt he had better qualify this statement, in my eyes you are absolutely the greatest architect. I would like to say that I esteem you as highly for your architectural creativity as I do the Fra for his political and military abilities. 11. After nine years as Hitler's architect I had worked my way up to an admired and uncontested position. The next three years were to confront me with entirely different tasks which for a time actually made me the most important man after Hitler. Part 2. 14. Start in my new office. Sepp Diedrich, one of Hitler's earliest followers and now the commander of an SS tank corps hard pressed by the Russians near Rostov in the southern Ukraine, was flying to Dnepropetrovsk on January 30, 1941 in a plane of the Führer's air squadron. I asked him to take me along. My staff was already in the city, organizing the task of repairing the railroads in southern Russia. According to the office journal, Beginning on January 28, 1942, a train left Berlin every day carrying construction workers and building materials to the Ukraine. 
several hundred workers had already been sent ahead to Dnepropetrovsk to make preparations. The obvious idea of having a plane placed at my disposal had not occurred to me, a sign of how small a role in the war effort I so far attributed to myself. Huddled close together, we sat in a Heinkel bomber refitted as a passenger plane. Beneath us the dreary, snow-covered plains of southern Russia flowed by. On large farms we saw the burned sheds and bams. To keep our direction, we flew along the railroad line. Scarcely a train could be seen, the stations were burned out, the roundhouses destroyed. Roads were air, and they too were empty of vehicles. The great stretches of land we passed over were frightening in their deathly silence, which could be felt even inside the plain. Only gusts of snow broke the monotony of the landscape, or, rather, emphasized it. This flight brought home to me the danger to the armies almost cut off from supplies. At dusk we landed in the Russian industrial city of Dnepropetrovsk. My group of technicians was called the Spear Construction Staff in keeping with the bent of the period to link assignments with the names of individuals. They had taken up emergency quarters in a sleeping car. From time to time a locomotive sent a whiff of steam through the heating coils to keep them from freezing. Working conditions were just as grim, for our office we had only a dining car. The assignment was proving more formidable than we had thought. The Russians had destroyed all the intermediate stations. Nowhere were repair sheds still standing, nowhere were water tanks protected from freezing, nowhere were the stations or intact switching yards. The simplest matters, which at home could have been settled by a telephone call, became a problem here. Even lumber and nails were hard to come by. It snowed and snowed. Railroad and highway traffic had come to a total standstill. The airport runway was drifted over. We were cut off, my return had to be postponed. Socializing with our construction workmen filled the time, get togethers were held, songs sung. Septedric made speeches and was cheered. I stood by, with my awkwardness at speech making, I did not dare say even a few words to my men. Among the songs distributed by the Army Corps were some very melancholy ones, expressing the longing for home and the dreariness of the Russian steppes. These songs were undisguised statements of inner stress, and significantly enough, they were the soldiers' favorite songs. Meanwhile the situation was growing critical. A small Russian tank group had broken through and was approaching Dnepropetrovsk. We held conferences on what we could use to oppose them. Virtually nothing was available, a few rifles and an abandoned artillery piece without ammunition. The Russians advanced to within about 12 miles, then circled around aimlessly in the steppe. One of the mistakes so typical of war happened. They did not take advantage of their situation. A brief sortie to the long bridge over the Dnieper and destroying it by fire, it had been rebuilt in wood in months of toilsome work would have cut off the German army southeast of Rostov from winter supplies for several months more. I am not at all disposed to be a hero, and since the seven days of my stay had been of no use whatsoever and I was only eating into my engineer's scarce provisions, I decided to go along on a train that was going to attempt to break through the snowdrifts to the west. My staff gave me a friendly, and it seemed to me thankful, farewell. All night we went along at six or seven miles an hour, stopped, shoveled snow, rode again. I thought we were a good deal farther to the west at dawn, when the train pulled into a deserted station. But everything looked oddly familiar to me, burned sheds, clouds of steam above a few dining cars and sleeping cars, patrolling soldiers. We were back in Nepropterovsk. The huge drifts had forced the train to turn back. Depressed, I tramped into my construction staff's dining car, where my associates received me with astonished and, I felt, rather irritated expressions. After all, they had pillaged their stocks of alcohol until the early morning hours drinking to their chief's departure. On that same day, February 7, 1942, the plane that had flown Septi Trikin was to start on the return flight. Air Captain Nain who was soon to be pilot of my own plane, 
was willing to take me with him. Just getting out to the airfield involved considerable difficulty. Under a clear sky and at a temperature barely above zero, a violent wind was whipping masses of snow in all directions. Russians in padded jackets tried in vain to clear the many feet of snow from the road. After we had tramped along for about an hour, several of them surrounded me and addressed me excitedly. I did not understand a word. Finally one of them picked up some snow and began rubbing my face with it. Frozen, I thought, I knew that much from my mountain tours. My astonishment grew when one of the Russians took from his filthy clothes a snow white and neatly folded handkerchief to dry my face. After some difficulty, around eleven o'clock we managed to take off from a runway poorly cleared of drifts. The plane's destination was Rosenberg in East Prussia, the headquarters of the squadron. My destination was Berlin, but it was not my plane and so I was glad that at least I would be taken a considerable part of the way. By this chance I for the first time came to Hitler's East Prussian headquarters. In Rosenberg, I telephoned one of the adjutants in the hope that he would report my presence to Hitler and perhaps Hitler would want to talk with me. I had not seen him since the beginning of December, and it would have been a special distinction if he were at least to give me a brief greeting. One of the Fras cars drove me to headquarters. There I at last had a good meal in the dining barracks where Hitler read daily with his generals, political associates, and adjutants. Hitler himself was not present. Dr. Tott, the Minister of Armaments and Munitions, was reporting to him and the two were dining alone in Hitler's private apartment. Meanwhile, I discussed our difficulties in the Ukraine with Army Transport Chief General Gurk and the commander of the railroad engineering troops. After supper with a large group, Hitler and Tot continued their conference. It was late at night before Tot emerged, strained and fatigued, from a long and, it appeared, trying discussion. He wore a depressed air. I sat with him for a few minutes while he silently drank a glass of wine without speaking of the reason for his mood. By chance he mentioned, in the course of our rather lame conversation, that he was to fly back to Berlin next morning and that there was an unoccupied seat in his plane. Tot was flying to Munich and expected to make a stopover in Berlin. He said he would be glad to take me along, and I was relieved not to have to make that long trip by rail. We agreed to fly at an early hour, and Dr. Tot bade me good night, since he was going to try to get a little sleep. An adjutant came in and requested me to join Hitler. It was then after one o'clock in the morning, in Berlin, too, we had often sat over our plans at this hour. Hitler seemed as exhausted and out of sorts as Tot. The furniture of his room stressed spareness, he had even renounced the comfort of an upholstered chair here at headquarters. We talked about the Berlin and Nuremberg building projects, and Hitler visibly brightened. Even his sallow complexion seemed to take on color. Finally he asked me to tell him what impressions I had gathered on my visit to southern Russia and helped me along by interjecting questions. The difficulties in restoring the railroad equipment, the blizzards, the incomprehensible behavior of the Russian tank force, the social evenings with their melancholy songs. Bit by bit everything I had observed came out. When I mentioned the songs his attention sharpened, and he asked about the words. I produced the text I had in my pocket. He read it and said nothing. My opinion was that the songs were the natural response to a grim situation. Hitler, however, decided at once that some traitor was trying to undermine morale. He thought my story would enable him to track down this oppositionist. Not until after the war did I learn that he had ordered a court-martial of the officer responsible for printing the songs. This episode was characteristic of his perpetual suspiciousness. He closed his mind against the truth, but thought he could draw important conclusions from such random observations. Consequently he was always querying subordinates, even though they could not possibly have a view of the whole. Such distrust, usually without basis, had become a strong component in Hitler's character. It caused him to become obsessed with trivialities. Undoubtedly it was also to blame for his isolation from the events and the mood at the front, 
for his entourage tried as far as possible to fend off any informants who might stir up his suspicions that all was not well with the army in the east. When I finally left Hitler at three o'clock in the morning, I sent word that I would not be flying with Dr. Tots. The plane was to start five hours later, I was worn out and wanted only to have a decent sleep. In my small bedroom I considered, who in Hitler's entourage did not do so after a two hour conversation with him question mark what impression I had probably left with him. I was content, my confidence restored that we would be able to carry out our building projects, a matter I had begun to doubt in view of the military situation. That night our dreams were transformed into realities, we had once again worked ourselves up to a hallucinatory optimism. Next morning, the shrill clang of the telephone startled me out of a deep sleep. Dr. Brandt reported excitedly, Dr. Tot's plane has just crashed, and he has been killed. From that moment on my whole world was changed. My relationship to Dr. Tot had become perceptibly closer in recent years. With his death I felt that I had lost an older, prudent colleague. We had much in common. Both of us came from prosperous, upper middle class circumstances, both of us were badeners and had technological backgrounds. We loved nature, life in alpine shelters, ski tours, and shared a strong dislike for Bormann. Tot had repeatedly had serious run-ins with Bormann, protesting against his despoiling the landscape around Obersalzburg. My wife and I had frequently been Tot's house guests. The Tots lived in a small unpretentious place off the beaten track on Hintersee near Birchtsgaden. No one would have guessed that the famous road builder and creator of the Autobuns lived there. Dr. Tot was one of the very few modest, unassertive personalities in the government, a man you could rely on, and who steered clear of all the intrigues. With his combination of sensitivity and matter of factness, such as is frequently found in technicians, he fitted rather poorly into the governing class of the National Socialist State. He lived a quiet, withdrawn life, having no personal contacts with party circles and even very rarely appeared at Hitler's dinners and suppers, although he would have been welcome. This retiring attitude enhanced his prestige, whenever he did appear he became the center of interest. Hitler, too, paid him and his accomplishments a respect bordering on reverence. Nevertheless, Tot had maintained his personal independence in his relations with Hitler, although he was a loyal party member of the early years. In January 1941, when I was having difficulties with Bormann and Gessler, Tot wrote me an unusually candid letter which revealed his own resigned approach to the working methods of the National Socialist leadership. Perhaps my own experiences and bitter disappointments with all the men with whom I should actually be cooperating might be of help to you, enabling you to regard your experience as conditioned by the times, and perhaps the point of view which I have gradually arrived at after much struggle might somewhat help you psychologically. For I have concluded that in the course of such events, every activity meets with opposition, everyone who acts has his rivals and unfortunately his opponents also but not because people want to be opponents, rather because the tasks and relationships force different people to take different points of view. Perhaps, being young, you have quickly discovered how to cut through all such bother, while I only brood over it. One. At the breakfast table in the Fra's headquarters there was lively discussion of who could possibly be considered for Dr. Tot's successor. Everyone agreed that he was irreplaceable for he had held the positions of three ministers. Thus, he had been the supreme head of all road building operations, in charge of all navigable waterways and improvements on them, as well as of all power plants. In addition, as Hitler's direct envoy, he was minister of armaments and munitions. Within the framework of Goering's four-year plan he headed the construction industry and had also created the TOT organization which was building the West Wall and the U-boat shelters along the Atlantic, as well as the roads in the occupied territories all the way from northern Norway to southern France. Now he was also responsible for road building in Russia. Thus in the course of the past several years TOT had gathered the major technical tasks of the Reich into his own hands. 
For the time being his operations were still nominally divided into various offices, but in essence he had set up the future technical ministry, all the more so since he was entrusted, within the party organization, with the head office for technology, whose scope included all technical societies and associations. During these first few hours I had already realized that an important portion of Tot's widely ranging tasks would surely fall to me. For as early as the spring of 1939, on one of his inspection tours of the West Wall, Hitler had remarked that if anything should happen to Tot, I would be the man to carry out his construction assignments. Later, in the summer of 1940, Hitler received me officially in the Chancellery office to inform me that Tot was overburdened. He had therefore decided, he said, to put me in charge of all construction, including the fortifications along the Atlantic. At the time I had been able to convince Hitler that it would be better if construction and armaments remained in one hand, since they were closely linked. Hitler had not referred to the matter again, and I had not spoken to anyone about it. The arrangement would not only have offended Tot but would surely have diminished his prestige. Too. I was therefore prepared for some such assignment when I was summoned to Hitler as the first caller of the day at the usual late hour, around one o'clock in the afternoon. Even the face of Chief Adjutant Schaub expressed the importance of the occasion. In contrast to the night before, Hitler received me officially as Führer of the Reich. Standing, earnest and formal. He received my condolences, replied very briefly, then said without more ado, Herr Speer, I appoint you the successor to Minister Tot in all his capacities. I was thunderstruck. He was already shaking hands with me and on the point of dismissing me. But I thought he had expressed himself imprecisely and therefore replied that I would try my best to be an adequate replacement for Dr. Tot in his construction assignments. No, in all his capacities including that of Minister of Armaments, Hitler corrected me. But I don't know anything about. I protested. I have confidence in you. I know you will manage it, Hitler cut me off. Besides, I have no one else. Get in touch with the Ministry at once and take over. Then, mein Führer, you must put that as a command, for I cannot vouch for my ability to master this assignment. Tersely. Hitler issued the command. I received it in silence. Without a personal word, such as had been the usual thing between us, Hitler turned to other business. I took my leave, having experienced a first sample of our new relationship. Hitherto, Hitler had displayed a kind of fellowship toward me as an architect. Now a new phase was perceptibly beginning. From the first moment on he was establishing the aloofness of an official relationship to a minister who was his subordinate. As I turned to the door, Schaub bentered. The Rye Marshal is here and urgently wishes to speak to you, mein Führer. He has no appointment. Hitler looked sulky and displeased. Send him in. He turned to me. Stay here a moment longer. Goering bustled in and after a few words of condolence stated his mind, best if I take over Dr. Tot's assignments within the framework of the four-year plan. This would avoid the frictions and difficulties we had in the past as a result of overlapping responsibilities. Goering had presumably come in his special train from his hunting lodge in Romington, about sixty miles from Hitler's headquarters. Since the accident had taken place at half past nine he must have wasted no time at all. Hitler ignored Goering's proposal. I have already appointed Tot's successor. Rye Minister Speer here has assumed all of Dr. Tot's offices as of this moment. The statement was so unequivocal that it excluded all possible argument. Goering seemed stunned and alarmed. But within a few seconds he recovered his composure. Coldly and ill-humoredly, he made no comment on Hitler's announcement. Instead he said, I hope you will understand, mein Führer, if I do not attend Dr. Tot's funeral. You know what battles I had with him. It would hardly do for me to be present. I no longer remember precisely what Hitler replied, since all this washing of dirty linen was naturally somewhat of a shock to me at this early moment in my new ministerial career. 
but I recall that Goering finally consented to come to the funeral, so that his disagreements with Tot would not become public knowledge. Given the importance assigned to such ceremonies by the system, it would have caused quite a stir if the second man in the state was absent from a formal act of state in honor of a dead cabinet minister. There could be no doubt that Goering had tried to win his point by a surprise assault. I even surmised that Hitler had expected such a maneuver, and that this was the reason for the speed of my appointment. As Minister of Armaments, Dr. Tot could carry out his assignment from Hitler only by issuing direct orders to industry. Goering, on the other hand, as Commissioner of the Four Year Plan, felt responsible for running the entire war economy. He and his apparatus were therefore pitted against Tot's activities. In the middle of January 1942, about two weeks before his death, Tot had taken part in a conference on production matters. In the course of it Goering had so berated him that Tot informed Funk on the same afternoon that he would have to quit. On such occasions it worked to Tot's disadvantage that he wore the uniform of a brigadier general of the Air Force. This meant that in spite of his ministerial office he ranked as Goering's subordinate in the military hierarchy. After this little episode one thing was clear to me, Goering would not be my ally, but Hitler seemed prepared to back me if I should encounter difficulties with the Rye Marshal. At first Hitler seemed to treat Tot's death with the stoic calm of a man who must reckon with such incidents as part of the general picture. Without citing any evidence, he expressed the suspicion, during the first few days, that foul play might have been involved and that he was going to have the Secret Service look into the matter. This view, however, soon gave way to an irritable and often distinctly nervous reaction whenever the subject was mentioned in his presence. In such cases Hitler might declare sharply, I want to hear no more about that. I forbid further discussion of the subject. Sometimes he would add, you know that this loss still affects me too deeply for me to want to talk about it. On Hitler's orders the Reich Air Ministry tried to determine whether sabotage might have been responsible for the plane crash. The investigation established the fact that the plane had exploded, with a sharp flame darting straight upward, some 65 feet above the ground. The report of the commission, which because of its importance was headed by an Air Force Lieutenant General, nevertheless concluded with the curious statement, the possibility of sabotage is ruled out. Further measures are therefore neither requisite nor intended. The plane executed a normal takeoff, but while still within sight of the airport the pilot made a rapid turn which suggested that he was trying for an emergency landing. As he was coming down he steered for the landing strip without taking time to head into the wind. The accident occurred near the airport and at a low altitude. The plane was a Heinkel 3, converted for passenger flight. It had been lent to Dr. Tot by his friend Field Marshal Spell, since Tot's own plane was undergoing repairs. Hitler reasoned that this Heinkel, like all the courier planes that were used at the front, had a self-destruct mechanism on board. It could be activated by pulling a handle located between the pilots and the co-pilots seats, whereupon the plane would explode within a few minutes. The final report of the military tribunal, dated March 8, 1943, K1TL2-42, and signed by the commanding general and the commander of Air District I, Nixburg, stated, approximately 2300 feet from the airport and the end of the runway the pilot apparently throttled down, then opened the throttle again two or three seconds later. At that moment a long flame shot up vertically from the front of the plane, apparently caused by an explosion. The aircraft fell at once from an altitude of approximately 65 feet, pivoting around its right wing and hitting the ground almost perpendicularly, facing directly away from its flight direction. It caught fire at once and a series of explosions totally demolished it. Incidentally, not long before his death Dr. Tot had deposited a sizable sum of money in a safe, earmarked for his personal secretary of many years' service. He had remarked that he was doing this in case something should happen to him. One can only wonder at the recklessness and the frivolity with which Hitler appointed me to one of those three or four ministries on which the existence of his state depended. I was a complete outsider to the army, to the party, 
and to industry. Never in my life had I had anything to do with military weapons, for I had never been a soldier and up to the time of my appointment had never even used a rifle as a hunter. To be sure, it was in keeping with Hitler's dilettantism that he preferred to choose non-specialists as his associates. After all, he had already appointed a wine salesman as his foreign minister, his party philosopher as his minister for eastern affairs, and an erstwhile fighter pilot as overseer of the entire economy. Now he was picking an architect of all people to be his minister of armaments. Undoubtedly Hitler preferred to fill positions of leadership with laymen. All his life he respected but distrusted professionals such as, for example, Schacht. As after the death of Professor Troost, my career was again being furthered by the death of another man. Hitler regarded it as a specially striking instance of providence that I had arrived at headquarters the night before by sheer chance, and that I had cancelled my projected flight with Tot. Later, when I was having my first successes, he liked to say that the plane crash had been engineered by fate in order to bring about an increase in armaments production. In contrast to the troublesome Dr. Tot, Hitler must have found me a rather willing tool at first. To that extent, this shift in personnel obeyed the principle of negative selection which governed the composition of Hitler's entourage. Since he regularly responded to opposition by choosing someone more amenable, over the years he assembled around himself a group of associates who more and more surrendered to his arguments and translated them into action more and more unscrupulously. Nowadays, historians are apt to inquire into my activities as armaments minister and inclined to treat my building plans for Berlin and Nuremberg as of secondary importance. For me, however, my work as architect still remained my life task. I regarded my surprising appointment as an interim thing for the duration, a form of wartime service. I saw the possibility of winning a reputation, and even fame, as Hitler's architect, whereas whatever even a prominent minister could accomplish would necessarily be absorbed in Hitler's glory. I therefore very soon extracted the promise from Hitler that he appoint me his architect again after the war. Three, The fact that I thought this necessary shows how dependent we all felt on Hitler's will, even in his most personal decisions. Hitler met my request without hesitation. He too thought that I would perform my most valuable services for him and his Reich as his foremost architect. When on occasion he spoke of his plans for the future, he frequently declared longingly, then both of us will withdraw from affairs for several months to go through all the building plans once more. But soon such remarks became rarer and rarer. The first result of my appointment as a minister was the arrival by plane at the Frohs headquarters of Oberegi Rungsrat Konrad Haysman, Tot's personal assistant. There were more influential and more important associates of Tot. I was therefore vexed and interpreted the dispatch of Haysman as an attempt to test my authority. Haysman claimed that he had come to brief me on the qualities of my future associates. I told him sharply that I intended to form my own view. That same evening I took the night train to Berlin. For the time being I had lost any fondness I may have had for plane travel. Next morning as I rode through the suburbs of the capital with their factories and railroad yards, I was overcome by anxiety. How would I be able to contend with this vast and alien field, I wondered. I had considerable doubts about my qualifications for this new task, for coping with either the practical difficulties or the personal demands that were made upon a minister. As the train pulled into the Schlesisse station, I found my heart pounding and felt weak. Here I was about to occupy a key position in the wartime organization, although I was rather shy in dealing with strangers, lacked the gift of speaking up easily at public meetings, and even in conferences found it hard to express my thoughts precisely and understandably. What would the generals of the army say when I, already marked as a non-soldier or an artist, was presented to them as their colleague? Actually, such questions of personal impression and of the extent of my authority worried me as much as the practical tasks. A rather considerable problem awaited me in dealing with the administrative aspect of my new job. I was aware that Tot's old associates would regard me as an intruder. They knew me, of course, as a friend of their chief, 
but they also knew me as someone always petitioning them for supplies of building materials. And these men had been in close collaboration with Dr. Tot for many years. Immediately after my arrival I paid a visit to all the important department heads in their offices, thus sparing them the necessity of coming to me to report. I also gave the order that nothing was to be changed in Dr. Tot's private office, although its furnishings did not suit my taste. Not until the summer of 1943, when I moved, was I able to get rid of these ugly furnishings unobtrusively and replace them with furniture I had designed for my old study. In the process I also succeeded in parting company with a picture that had previously hung over my desk. It showed Hitler, who was hopeless on horseback, staring sternly from the saddle and decked out as a medieval knight with a lance. Sensitive technicians do not always show the best taste in their interior decoration. On the morning of February 11, 1942, I had to be present at an halter station to receive the coffin with Tot's remains. This ceremony was hard on my nerves, as was the funeral on the next day in my mosaic hall in the Chancellery, in the presence of a Hitler moved to tears. During the simple ceremony at the grave Xaver Dorsch, one of Tot's key men, solemnly assured me of his loyalty. Two years later, when I fell seriously ill, he entered into an intrigue against me led by Goering. My work began immediately. Field Marshal Erhard Melch, State Secretary of the Air Ministry, invited me to a conference in the Great Hall of the Ministry, to be held on Friday, February 13, at which armament questions were to be discussed with the three branches of the services and with representatives of industry. When I asked whether this conference could not be postponed, since I first had to get the feel of my job, Milch replied with a counter question typical of his free and easy manner and the good relations between us. The top industrialists from all over the Reich were already on their way to the conference, and was I going to beg off? I agreed to come. On the day before, I was summoned to Goering. This was my first visit to him in my new capacity of minister. Cordially, he spoke of the harmony between us while I was his architect. He hoped this would not change he said. When Goering wanted to, he could display a good deal of charm, hard to resist if somewhat condescending. But then he came down to business. He had had a written agreement with my predecessor, he said. A similar document had been prepared for me, he would send it to me for my signature. The agreement stipulated that in my procurement for the army I could not infringe on areas covered by the four-year plan. He concluded our discussion by saying rather obscurely that I would learn more in the course of the conference with Milch and the others. I did not reply and ended the discussion on the same note of cordiality. Since the four-year plan embraced the entire economy, I would have had my hands completely tied if I bided by Goering's arrangement. I sensed that something unusual was awaiting me at Milch's conference. Since I still felt by no means secure and since Hitler was still in Berlin, I informed him of my anxieties. I knew, from the little episode with Goering at the time of my appointment, that I could count on his backing. Very well, he said. If any steps are taken against you, or if you have difficulties, interrupt the conference and invite the participants to the cabinet room. Then I'll tell those gentlemen whatever is necessary. The cabinet room was regarded as a sacred place, to be received there would inevitably make a deep impression. And the fact that Hitler would be willing to address this group, with whom I would be dealing in the future, offered me the best possible prospects for my start. The large conference hall of the air ministry was filled. There were thirty persons present, the most important men in industry, among them General Manager Albert Vogeler, Wilhelm Zangen, head of the German Industry Association, General Ernst Fromm, Chief of the Reserve Army, with his subordinate, Lieutenant General Lieb, Chief of the Army Ordnance Office, Admiral Witzel, Armaments Chief of the Navy, General Thomas, Chief of the War Economy and Armaments Office of the OKW, Wall the Funk, Rye Minister of Economics, various officials of the four-year plan, and a few more of Goering's important associates. Milch took the chair as representative of the conference host. 
he asked Funk to sit at his right and me at his left. In a terse introductory address he explained the difficulties that had arisen in armaments production due to the conflicting demands of the three services. Vogler of the United Steel Works followed with some highly intelligent explanations of how orders and counter orders, disputes over priority levels, and constant shifting of priorities interfered with industrial production. There were still unused reserves available, he said, but because of the frigging and hauling these did not come to light. Thus it was high time to establish clear relationships. There must be one man able to make all decisions. Industry did not care who it was. Thereafter, General Fromm spoke for the Army and Admiral Witzel for the Navy. In spite of some reservations they expressed general agreement with Vogler's remarks. The other participants likewise were convinced of the necessity for having one person to assume authority in economic matters. During my own work for the Air Force I too had recognized the urgency of this matter. Finally Economics Minister Funk stood up and turned directly to Milch. We were all in essential agreement, he said, the course of the meeting had revealed that. The only remaining question, therefore, was who the man should be. Who would be better suited for the purpose than you, my dear Milch, since you have the confidence of Goering, our revered Rye Marshal. I therefore believe I am speaking in the name of all when I ask you to take over this office. He exclaimed, striking a rather over-emotional note for the occasion. This had clearly been prearranged. Even while Funk was speaking, I whispered into Milch's ear, the conference is to be continued in the cabinet room. The Fro wants to speak about my tasks. Milch, quick-wittedly grasping the meaning of this, replied to Funk's proposal that he was greatly honored by such an expression of confidence, but that he could not accept. For I spoke up for the first time, transmitting to the assembled group the Fro's invitation and announcing that the discussion would be continued on Thursday, February 18th, in my ministry, since it would probably deal with my assignment. Milch then adjourned the session. Later Funk admitted to me that on the eve of the conference Billy Corner, Goering's state secretary and associate in the work of the four-year plan, had urged him to propose Milch as the authority for final decisions. Funk took it for granted that Corner could not have made this request without Goering's knowledge. Hitler's invitation alone must have made it clear to those familiar with the balance of power that I was starting from a stronger position than my predecessor had ever possessed. Now Hitler had to make good on his promise. In his office he let me brief him on what had taken place and jotted down some notes. He then went into the cabinet room with me and immediately took the floor. Hitler spoke for about an hour. Rather tediously, he expatiated on the tasks of war industry, emphasized the need for accelerated production, spoke of the valuable forces that must be mobilized in industry, and was astonishingly candid on the subject of Goering, this man cannot look after armaments within the framework of the four-year plan. It was essential, Hitler continued, to separate this task from the four-year plan and turn it over to me. A function was given to a man and then taken from him again such things happened. The capacity for increased production was available, but things had been mismanaged. In prison Funk told me that Goering had asked for this statement of Hitler's, which amounted to stripping him of some of his powers, in writing so that he could use it as evidence against his use of forced labor. Hitler avoided touching on the problem of a single head for all armaments production. Similarly, he spoke only of supplies for the army and navy deliberately excluding the Air Force. I too had glossed over this contested point in my words with him, since the matter involved a political decision and would have brought in all sorts of ambiguities. Hitler concluded his address with an appeal to the participants. He first described my great feats and construction, which could scarcely have made much of an impression on these people. He went on to say that this new job represented a great sacrifice on my part a statement which did not have much meaning in view of the critical situation. He expected not only cooperation on their part but also fair treatment. Behaved toward him like gentlemen. He said, employing the English word, which he rarely used. What exactly my assignment was, he did not clearly state, 
and I preferred it that way. Heretofore Hitler had never introduced a minister in this way. Even in a less authoritarian system such a debut would have been of assistance. In our state the consequences were astonishing, even to me. For a considerable time I found myself moving in a kind of vacuum that offered no resistance whatsoever. Within the widest limits I could practically do as I pleased. Funk, who then walked Hitler back to his apartment in the Chancellery along with me, promised emotionally on the way that he would place everything at my disposal and do all in his power to help me. Moreover he kept the promise, with minor exceptions. Bormann and I stood chatting with Hitler in the salon for a few minutes longer. Before Hitler withdrew to his upstairs rooms, he once again recommended that I avail myself of industry as far as possible, since I would find the most valuable assistance there. This idea was not new to me, for Hitler had in the past often emphasized that one did best to let industry handle major tasks directly, for government bureaucracy only hampered initiative, this aversion to bureaucrats remained a standing point with him. I took this favorable moment with Bormann present to assure him that I would indeed be drawing chiefly on technicians from industry. But there would have to be no questions raised as to their party membership, since many of them kept aloof from the party, as was well known. Hitler agreed, he instructed Bormann to go along with this, and so my ministry was at least until the attempted assassination of July 20, 1944, spared the unpleasant probings of Bormann's party secretariat. That same evening I had a full discussion with Melch, who pledged an end to that rivalry the Air Force had hitherto practiced toward the Army and Navy in matters of procurement. Especially during the early months his advice became indispensable, out of our official relationship there grew a cordial friendship which has lasted to the present. 15. Organized Improvisation. I had five days before the conference in my ministry. By then I would have to have some plan of action. Surprising though it may seem, the principles were clear to me from the start. From the first day on I headed, with a sleepwalker's sureness, toward the one system that could possibly achieve success in armaments production. Of course I had a certain advantage for during my two years of construction work for the armaments industry on a lower plane I had caught glimpses of many fundamental errors which would have remained hidden from me if I had been at the top. 1. I prepared a plan of organization whose vertical lines represented individual items, such as tanks, planes, or submarines. In other words, the armaments for the three branches of the service were included, these vertical columns were enclosed in numerous rings, each of which was to stand for a group of components needed for all guns, tanks, planes, and other armaments. Within these rings I considered, for example, the production of forgings or ball bearings or electrical equipment as a whole. Accustomed as an architect to three-dimensional thinking, I drew this new organizational scheme in perspective. On February 18 the top figures in war industry and in the government bureaus having to do with armaments met once again, in the former conference room of the Academy of Arts. After I had spoken for an hour, they accepted my organizational scheme without cavil and gave their endorsement to a statement reviewing the demands for unitary leadership made at the February 13 conference and announcing that I was here with being given a mandate for full authority. I prepared to pass this paper around the table for signature, a most unusual procedure in relations among government boards. Hitler's injunctions had had their effect. Milch was the first to declare himself in full agreement with the proposal and signed the paper without more ado. Some of the other participants raised formal objections, but Milch used his authority to override them. Only Admiral Witzel, the representative of the Navy, continued his opposition to the last and finally gave his consent only under protest. Next day, February 19, I went to the Fuhrer's headquarters accompanied by Field Marshal Milch, General Thomas, and General Albrecht, as General Fromm's representative, to present my organizational plans to Hitler and report to him on the results of the conference. Hitler approved of all I had done. Immediately after my return Goering summoned me to his hunting lodge, 
Karen Hall, more than 45 miles north of Berlin. After Goering had seen Hitler's new Berghof in 1935, he had had his modest old hunting lodge rebuilt into a manner that exceeded Hitler's in size. The salon was just as large as Hitler's, but with an even bigger picture window. At the time Hitler was annoyed by this pomp. But it must be admitted that Goering's architect had created a suitable frame for Goering's craving for magnificence. It now served as his headquarters. Such conferences usually meant the loss of a valuable working day. This time, too, when I arrived punctually toward 11 o'clock after a long automobile ride, I spent an hour in Goering's reception hall looking at pictures and tapestries. For in contrast to Hitler, Goering took a large view of the appointed time. Finally he emerged from his private apartment on the upper floor, dressed in a flowing green velvet dressing gown, a picturesque note, and descended the stairs. We greeted each oily or rather coolly. With tripping steps he preceded me into his office and took his seat at a gigantic desk. I modestly sat down facing him. Goering was extremely angry. He complained bitterly that I had not invited him to the conference in the cabinet room and pushed toward me across the vast expanses of the desk an opinion by Eric Newman, his ministerial director for the four-year plan, on the legal implications of my own paper. With an agility I would not have thought so fat a man capable of, he leapt to his feet and began pacing the big room, frantic with agitation. His deputies were all spineless wretches, he declared. By giving their signatures they had made themselves my underlings for all time to come, and this without even asking him. Of course, this bluster was directed against me as well, but the fact that he did not dare storm at me signified a weakened position. He could not accept such nibbling away at his power, he declared in conclusion. He would go to Hitler at once and resign his office as boss of the four-year plan.2. At the time such a resignation would certainly have been no loss. For although at the start Goering had pushed the four-year plan with great energy, by 1942 he was generally regarded as sluggish and distinctly averse to work. Increasingly, he gave an impression of instability, he took up too many ideas, changed course all the time, and was consistently unrealistic. Hitler would probably not have permitted Goering to resign because of the political backlash. Instead, he would have sought a compromise. I saw that this was something I had to head off, for Hitler's compromises were merely evasions and of a sort everyone in the government feared. They did not eliminate difficulties but instead made all administrative interrelationships more opaque and complicated. I knew that I had to do something to build up Goering's prestige. For the time being, I assured him that the new arrangement desired by Hitler and approved by the representatives of industry and the services would in no way infringe on his position as head of the four-year plan. At this, Goering seemed mollified. I went on to say that I was ready to become his subordinate and carry out my work within the framework of the four-year plan. Three days later I called on Goering again and showed him a draft agreement appointing me chief representative for armaments within the four-year plan. Goering seemed satisfied, although he pointed out that I had undertaken much too much and would be wiser to limit my goals. Two days later, on March 1, 1942, he signed the decree. It authorized me to give armaments. Within the whole of the economy the priority which is appropriate for them in wartime. 3. This was more power than had been given me by the document of February 18, which Goering had been so furious about. On March 16, shortly after Hitler had approved the matter, he was glad to be relieved of all personal difficulties with Goering. I informed the German press of my appointment. To make my point more vividly, I had dug up an old photograph showing Goering, delighted with my design for his Reich Marshal's office building clapping his hands on my shoulders. This was supposed to show that the crisis, which had begun to be talked about in Berlin, was now over. However, there was a protest from Goering's press agency, I was told that the photo and the decree should by rights have been released by Goering alone. There were more problems of this sort. His sensitivities aroused, 
Goering complained of having heard from the Italian ambassador that the foreign press was intimating that he had been downgraded. Such reports were bound to undermine his prestige in industry, he protested. Now it was an open secret that Goering's high style of living was financed by industry, and I had the feeling that he feared a reduction in his prestige would result in a reduction in these subsidies. I therefore suggested that he invite the chief industrialists to a conference in Berlin, in the course of which I would declare formally my subordination to him. This proposal gratified him enormously, his good humor returned instantly. Goering thereupon ordered some fifty industrialists to come to Berlin. The conference began with a very brief address by me, saying what I had promised, while Goering delivered a long discourse on the importance of armaments. He extorted all those present to make the maximum effort, and other such commonplaces. On the other hand he did not mention my assignment in either a favorable or an unfavorable sense. Thereafter, thanks to Goering's lethargy, I was able to work freely and unhampered. No doubt he was often jealous of my successes with Hitler, but during the next two years he scarcely ever tried to interfere with anything I was doing. Goering's own powers seemed to me, given his now reduced authority, not quite sufficient for my own work. Soon afterward, therefore on March 21, I had Hitler sign another decree, the requirements of the German economy as a whole must be subordinated to the necessities of armaments production. Given the usages of the authoritarian system, this decree of Hitler's amounted to dictatorial powers over the economy. The constitutional forms of our organization were just as improvised and vague as all these arrangements. There was no precise statement of my assignments or jurisdiction. My feeling was that I was better off without such definitions. I did my best to keep the situation fluid. Consequently, we were able to determine our jurisdiction from case to case, depending on need and the impetuosity of my associates. Our legalistic formulation of our rights, which given Hitler's favorable attitude toward me could have been used to acquire a position of almost unlimited power, would only have led to jurisdictional disputes with other ministries. It would not have achieved our purpose, which was to have everyone pull together satisfactorily. These vaguenesses were a cancer in Hitler's mode of governing. But I was in accord with the system as long as it permitted me to function effectively and as long as Hitler signed all the decrees that I presented to him for signature. But when he no longer blindly granted my requests and in certain areas he soon stopped doing so, I was condemned to either impotence or cunning. On the evening of March 2, 1942, about a month after my appointment, I invited the architects employed on the rebuilding of Berlin to a farewell dinner at Horches. The very thing you have forcibly resisted, I said to them in a brief address, sooner or later overpowers you. I found it strange that my new work was not so alien, although at first sight it seemed so remote from what I had previously done. I have known since my university days, I continued, that if we wish to understand everything, we must do one thing thoroughly. I have therefore decided to take a keen interest in tanks for the moment, trusting that I thereby shall be better able to grasp the essence of many other tasks. As a cautious person, I said, I had for the time being drawn up my program for the next two years. I hoped, however, to be able to return to architecture sooner. My wartime assignment should prove of use later on for we technicians would be called on to solve the problems of the future. Moreover, I concluded somewhat grandiosely, in the future architects will take over the leadership in technology. 4. Equipped with Hitler's grant of full authority, with a peaceable gearing in the background, I could go forward with my comprehensive plan of industrial self-responsibility, as I had sketched it in my outline. Today it is generally agreed that the astonishingly rapid rise in armaments production was due to this plan. Its principles, however, were not new. Both Field Marshal Milch and my predecessor Tot had already adopted the procedure of entrusting eminent technicians from leading industrial firms with the management of separate areas of armaments production. But Dr. Tot himself had borrowed this idea. The real creator of the concept of industrial self-responsibility was Walter Rathenau, 
the great Jewish organizer of the German economy during the First World War. He realized that considerable increases in production could be achieved by exchange of technical experiences, by division of labor from plant to plant, and by standardization. As early as 1917 he declared that such methods could guarantee a doubling of production with no increase in equipment and no increase in labor costs. Five on the top floor of Tot's ministry sat one of Rathenau's old assistants who had been active in his raw materials organization during the First World War and had later written a memorandum on its structure. Dr. Tot benefited by his advice. We formed directive committees for the various types of weapons and directive pools for the allocation of supplies. Thirteen such committees were finally established, one for each category of my armaments program. Linking these were an equal number of pools.6. Alongside these committees and pools I set up development commissions in which army officers met with the best designers in industry. These commissions were to supervise new products, suggest improvements in manufacturing techniques even during the design stage, and call a halt to any unnecessary projects. The heads of the committees and the pools were to make sure this was vital to our whole approach, that a given plant concentrated on producing only one item, but did so in maximum quantity. Because of Hitler's and Goering's continual restiveness, expressed in sudden shifts of program, the factories had hitherto tried to assure themselves of four or five different contracts simultaneously, and if possible, from different branches of the services, so that they could shift to alternative contracts in case of sudden cancellations. Moreover, the Wehrmacht frequently assigned contracts only for a limited time. Thus, for example, before 1942 the manufacture of ammunition was checked or increased depending on consumption, which came in sudden bursts because of the Blitz campaigns. This state of affairs kept the factories from throwing all their productive energy into making ammunition. We provided contractual guarantees of continued procurement and assigned the types we needed among the various factories. By dint of these changes, the armaments production of the early years of the war, which had been on a more or less piecework basis, was converted to industrial mass production. Amazing results were soon to show up, but significantly enough, not in those industries which had already been working along modem lines of efficiency such as the automobile industry. These scarcely lent themselves to any increase in production. I regarded my task principally as one of tracking down and defining problems so far screened by long years of routine, but I left their solution to the specialists. Obsessed with my task, I did not try to keep down the extent of my responsibilities, but rather to take in more and more areas of the economy. Reverence for Hitler, a sense of duty, ambition, pride all these elements were operative. After all, at 36 I was the youngest minister in the Reich. My industry organization soon comprised more than 10,000 assistants and aides, but in our ministry itself there were only 218 officials at work.7 This proportion was in keeping with my view of the ministry as merely a steering organization, with the chief thrust of our operation lying in industrial self-responsibility. The traditional arrangement provided that most matters would be submitted to the minister by his state secretary. The latter functioned as a kind of sieve, deciding the importance of things at his own discretion. I eliminated this procedure and made directly subordinate to myself more than 30 leaders of the industry organization and no less than 10 department chiefs. All department heads under my direction were empowered to sign orders as deputized by the minister rather than in behalf of the minister. This was a technical breach in the rules of the state bureaucracy, for it implied that they were authorized to act independently, a power usually reserved to state secretaries. I ignored the protests submitted by the Minister of the Interior, who was responsible for preserving the regular procedures of government administration. I brought the head of the planning department, Willy Liebel, from Nuremberg, where he had been mayor. The director of the technical department, Karl Saw, had risen from the intermediate ranks of party functionaries, after previously occupying a subordinate position in industry. The head of the supply department, Dr. Walter Smer, 
was a chemist by profession, he was typical of the older party member in the SS and party who had had previous experience as specialists. Xaver Dorsch, my deputy in the TOT organization, was our oldest party member. The head of the department responsible for consumer goods production, C. Bayer, had also joined the party long before 1933. In the ministry. In principle they were all supposed to settle their interrelationships among themselves, but I took the liberty of intervening in important questions or whenever differences of opinion arose. Our method of work was just as unusual as this form of organization. The old line officials of the government bureaucracy spoke disdainfully of a dynamic ministry or a ministry without an organization plan and a ministry without officials. It was said that I applied rough and ready or American methods. My comment, if jurisdictions are sharply separated, we are actually encouraging a limited point of view, it was prompted by rebellion against the caste mentality of the system, but also bore some resemblance to Hitler's notions of improvised government by an impulsive genius. Another principle of mine also gave offense. This had to do with personnel policy. As soon as I assumed my post I gave instructions, as the Fras minutes of February 19, 1942, record, that the leading men in important departments who were over 55 years old must be assigned a deputy who is no older than 40. Whenever I explained my organizational plans to Hitler, he showed a striking lack of interest. I had the impression that he did not like to deal with these questions, indeed. In certain realms he was altogether incapable of distinguishing the important from the unimportant. He also did not like establishing clear lines of jurisdiction. Sometimes he deliberately assigned bureaus or individuals the same or similar tasks. That way, he used to say, the stronger one does the job. Within half a year after my taking office we had significantly increased production in all the areas within our scope. Production in August 1942, according to the index figures for German armaments and products, as compared with the February production, had increased by 27% for guns, by 25% for tanks, while ammunition production almost doubled, rising 97%. The total productivity in armaments increased by 59.6%.9 Obviously we had mobilized reserves that had hitherto lain fallow. After two and a half years, in spite of the beginning of heavy bombing, we had raised our entire armaments production from an average index figure of 98 for the year 1941 to a summit of 322 in July 1944. During the same period the labor force expanded by only about 30%. We had succeeded in doubling the output of labor and had achieved the very results Rathenau had predicted in 1917 as the effect of efficiency, doubling production without increasing equipment or labor costs. It was not that any genius was at work here, though that has often been asserted. Many of the technicians in my office would undoubtedly have been more fit for the job, as far as knowledge of the fields involved is concerned. But none of them could have thrown the nimbus of Hitler into the balance as I could, and that made all the difference. The backing of the Führer counted for everything. Aside from all organizational innovations, things went so well because I applied the methods of democratic economic leadership. The democracies were on principle committed to placing trust in the responsible businessman as long as that trust was justified. Thus they rewarded initiative, aroused an awareness of mission, and spurred decision making. Among us, on the other hand, all such elements had long ago been buried. Pressure and coercion kept production going, to be sure, but destroyed all spontaneity. I felt it necessary to issue a declaration to the effect that industry was not knowingly lying to us, stealing from us, or otherwise trying to damage our war economy. 10. The party felt acutely challenged by that attitude, as I was to find out after July 20, 1944. Exposed to sharp attacks, I had to defend my system of delegated responsibility in a letter to Hitler.11. Paradoxically, from 1942 on, the developments in the warring countries moved in an opposite direction. The Americans, for example, 
found themselves compelled to introduce an authoritarian stiffening into their industrial structure, whereas we tried to loosen the regimented economic system. The elimination of all criticism of superiors had in the course of years led to a situation in which mistakes and failures, misplanning, or duplication of effort were no longer even noted. I saw to the formation of committees in which discussion was possible, shortages and mistakes could be uncovered, and their elimination considered. We often joked that we were on the point of reintroducing the parliamentary system. 12 Our new system had created one of the prerequisites for balancing out the weaknesses of every authoritarian order. Important matters were not to be regulated solely by the military principle, that is by channels of command from top to bottom. But for such parliamentarism to work, of course, the committees mentioned above had to be headed by persons who allowed arguments and counterarguments to be stated before they made a decision. Grotesquely enough, this system met with considerable reserve on the part of the factory heads. Early in my job I had sent out a circular letter asking them to inform me of their fundamental needs and observations on a larger scale than previously. I expected a flood of letters, but there was no response. At first I suspected my office staff of withholding the mail from me. But actually none had come in. The factory heads, as I learned later, feared reprimands from the Gauletters. There was more than enough criticism from above to below, but the necessary complement of criticism from below to above was hard to come by. I often had the feeling that I was hovering in the air since my decisions produced no critical response. We owed the success of our programs to thousands of technicians with special achievements to their credit to whom we now entrusted the responsibility for whole segments of the armaments industry. This aroused their buried enthusiasm. They also took gladly to my unorthodox style of leadership. Basically, I exploited the phenomenon of the technician's often blind devotion to his task. Because of what seems to be the moral neutrality of technology, these people were without any scruples about their activities. The more technical the world imposed on us by the war, the more dangerous was this indifference of the technician to the direct consequences of his anonymous activities. In my work I preferred uncomfortable associates to compliant tools. 13 The party, on the other hand, had a deep distrust for non-political specialists. Fritz Sorkel, always one of the most radical of the party leaders, once commented that if they had begun by shooting a few factory heads, the others would have reacted with better performances. For two years my position was unassailable. After the General's Putsch of July 20, 1944, Bormann, Goebbels, Lee, and Sorkel prepared to cut me down to size. I quickly appealed to Hitler in a letter stating that I did not feel strong enough to go on with my job if it were going to be subjected to political standards. 14. The non party members of my ministry enjoyed a legal protection highly unusual in Hitler's state. For over the objections of the Minister of Justice, I had established the principle, right at the beginning of my job, that there would be no indictments for sabotage of armaments except on my motion. 15 This proviso protected my associates even after July 20, 1944. Ernst Colton Brunner, the Gestapo chief, wanted to indict three general managers, Butcher of the Egg Electrical Company, Vogler of the United Steel Works, and Riush of the Gutterhofnanschut, the mining combine, for defeatist conversations. He came to me for authorization. I pointed out that the nature of our work compelled us to speak candidly about the situation and thus fended off the Gestapo. On the other hand, I applied severe penalties for abuse of our honor system if, for example, someone furnished false data in order to hoard important raw materials. For actions of this sort would result in the withholding of arms from the front. 16. From the first day on I considered our gigantic organization temporary. Just as I myself wanted to return to architecture after the war and had even asked Hitler for an assurance to that effect, I felt we had to promise the uneasy leaders of business that our system of organization was solely a war measure. In peacetime, industry could not be asked, I told them, 
to give up their best men or to share their knowledge with rival enterprises.17. Along with this, I also made an effort to preserve the style of improvisation. The idea that bureaucratic methods were now taking root inside my own organization depressed me. Again and again I called upon my associates to cut down on record keeping, to make agreements informally in conversation and by means of telephone calls, and to eschew the multiplication of transactions as bureaucratic jargon called filling a file. Moreover, the bombing raids on German cities forced us to constant ingenuities. There were times when I actually regarded these raids as helpful, witness my ironic reaction to the destruction of the ministry in the air raid of November 22, 1943, although we have been fortunate in that large parts of the current files of the ministry have burned and so relieved us for a time of useless ballast, we cannot really expect that such events will continually introduce the necessary fresh air into our work. 18. In spite of this technical and industrial progress, even at the height of the military successes in 1940 and 1941 the level of armaments production of the First World War was not reached. During the first year of the war in Russia, production figures were only a fourth of what they had been in the autumn of 1918. Three years later, in the spring of 1944, when we were nearing our production maximum, ammunition production still lagged behind that of the First World War, considering the total production of Germany at that time together with Austria and Czechoslovakia.10. Among the causes for this backwardness I always reckoned excessive bureaucratization, which I fought in vain.24 example, the size of the staff of the Ordnance Office was ten times what it had been during the First World War. The cry for simplification of administration runs through all my speeches and letters from 1942 to the end of 1944. The longer I fought the typically German bureaucracy, whose tendencies were aggravated by the authoritarian system, the more my criticism assumed a political cast. This matter became something of an obsession with me, for on the morning of July 20, 1944, a few hours before the attempted assassination, I wrote to Hitler that Americans and Russians knew how to act with organizationally simple methods and therefore achieved greater results, whereas we were hampered by superannuated forms of organization and therefore could not match the other's feats. The war, I said, was also a contest between two systems of organization, the struggle of our system of overbred organization against the art of improvisation on the opposing side. If we did not arrive at a different system of organization, I continued, it would be evident to posterity that our outmoded, tradition-bound, and arthritic organizational system had lost the struggle. 16. Sins of Mission. It remains one of the oddities of this war that Hitler demanded far less from his people one than Churchill and Roosevelt did from their respective nations. The discrepancy between the total mobilization of labor forces in democratic England and the casual treatment of this question in authoritarian Germany is proof of the regime's anxiety not to risk any shift in the popular mood. The German leaders were not disposed to make sacrifices themselves or to ask sacrifices of the people. They tried to keep the morale of the people in the best possible state by concessions. Hitler and the majority of his political followers belonged to the generation who as soldiers had witnessed the revolution of November 1918 and had never forgotten it. In private conversations Hitler indicated that after the experience of 1918 one could not be cautious enough. In order to anticipate any discontent, more effort and money was expended on supplies of consumer goods on military pensions or compensation to women for the loss of earnings by their men in the services, than in the countries with democratic governments. Whereas Churchill promised his people only blood, sweat, and tears, all we heard during the various phases and various crises of the war was Hitler's slogan, the final victory is certain. This was a confession of political weakness. It betrayed great concern over a loss of popularity which might develop into an insurrectionary mood. Alarmed by the setbacks on the Russian front, in the spring of 1942 I considered total mobilization of all auxiliary forces. What was more, I urged that the war must be ended in the shortest possible time, if not, 
Germany will lose the war. We must win it by the end of October, before the Russian winter begins, or we have lost it once and for all. Consequently, we can only win with the weapons we have now, not with those we are going to have next year. In some inexplicable way this situation analysis came to the knowledge of the Times, London, which published it on September 7, 1942.2 The Times article actually summed up the points on which Milch, from, and I had agreed at the time. Our feelings tell us that this year we are facing the decisive turning point in our history, I also declared publicly in April 1942,3 without suspecting that the turning point was impending, with the encirclement of the 6th Army in Stalingrad, the annihilation of the Africa Corps, the successful Allied land operations in North Africa, and the first massive air raids on German cities. We had also reached a turning point in our wartime economy, for until the autumn of 1941 the economic leadership had been basing its politics on short wars with long stretches of quiet in between. Now the permanent war was beginning. As I saw it, a mobilization of all reserves should have begun with the heads of the party hierarchy. This seemed all the more proper since Hitler himself had solemnly declared to the Reichstag on September 1, 1939 that there would be no privations which he himself was not prepared to assume at once. In actual fact he at last agreed to suspend all the building projects he was still engaged on, including those at Obersalzburg. I cited this noble gesture of the Führers two weeks after entering office when I addressed the group that gave us the most difficulties, the assembled Gauleiters and Reichsliters, consideration of future peacetime tasks must never be allowed to influence a decision. I have instructions from the Führer to report to him in the future on any such hindrances to our armaments production, which from now on can no longer be tolerated. That was a plain enough threat, even though I softened it somewhat by saying that up to the winter of this year each of us had cherished special wishes. But now, I said, the military situation demanded that all superfluous construction be halted, anywhere in the country. It was our duty to lead the way by presenting a good example, even if the savings in labor forces and materials were not significant. I took it for granted that in spite of the monotonous tone in which I had read these exhortations, anyone there would see their logic and obey. After the speech, however, I was surrounded by party leaders who wanted some special building project of theirs to be exempted from the general rule. Reichslitter Bormann was the arch offender. He easily persuaded a vacillating Hitler that the Obas Altsburg project need not be cancelled. The large crew employed there, who had to be provided for, actually stayed right there on the site until the end of the war, even though three weeks after the meeting I had again wrested a suspension order from Hitler. Few Reprotocol, March 5 6, 1942, point 17, 3, the Führer has ordered that work at Obas Altsburg be halted compose appropriate memorandum to Reichsliter Bormann. But two and a half years later, on September 8, 1944, construction there was still continuing. Bormann wrote to his wife, Herr Speer who, as I see time and again, has not the slightest respect for me, simply went to Hagen and Senk and asked for a report on the Obers Salzburg construction. A crazy way to go about things. Instead of going through the proper channels and addressing himself to me, the god of building, without any more ado he ordered my men to report directly to him. And since we are dependent on him for materials and labor, all I can do is put a good face on the matter. Bormann, Letters, p. 103. Then Gorlitus Orkel pressed forward to plead that his party forum in Wimar would not be affected. He too went on building undeterred until the end of the war. Robert Lee fought for a pigsty on his model farm. This was actually a war priority, he argued, since his experiments in hog raising were of great importance for food production. I turned down this request in writing but took gleeful delight in addressing the letter, to the Reich organization chief of the National Socialist Party and chief of the German Labor Front. Subject, your pigsty. Even after I had made this ringing appeal, 
Hitler went ahead and had the tumble-down castle of Kleshheim near Salzburg rebuilt into a luxurious guest house at an expenditure of many millions of marks. Near Berchtesgaden, Himmler erected a country lodge for his mistress and did it so secretly that I did not hear of it until the last weeks of the war. Even after 1942, Hitler encouraged one of his Gauleiters to renovate a hotel in the Posen Castle, both projects drawing heavily on essential materials. The same Gauleiter had a private residence built for himself in the vicinity of the city. In 1942, 43 new special trains were built for Lee, Kiitel, and others, although this kind of thing tied down valuable raw materials and technicians. For the most part, However, these whims of the party functionaries were concealed from me. Given the enormous powers of the righteous litters and gauleters there was no way to check up on what they were doing. I therefore could rarely interpose a veto, which in any case was disregarded. As late as the summer of 1944 Hitler and Bormann were capable of informing their Minister of Armaments that a Munich manufacturer of picture frames must not be made to shift to war production. A few months before, on their personal order, the rug factories and other producers of artistic materials, which were engaged in manufacturing rugs and tapestries for Hitler's post-war buildings, were given a special status. For, After only nine years of rule the leadership was so corrupt that even in the critical phase of the war it could not cut back on its luxurious style of living. For representational reasons the leaders all needed big houses hunting lodges, estates and palaces, many servants, a rich table, and a select wine cellar. For propaganda reasons, Goebbels tried to change the lifestyle of the prominent men in government and the party, but in vain. See his diary, February 22, 1942, Bormann has issued a directive to the party regarding the need for greater simplicity in the conduct of the leaders, particularly with respect to banquets a reminder to the party that it should provide a good example for the people. This directive is most welcome. I hope it will be taken to heart. In this connection I have become rather skeptical. Bormann's directive had no effect. On May 22, 1943, more than a year later, Goebbels wrote in his diary, because of the tense situation domestically the people naturally have been keeping a sharp eye on the lifestyle of our so-called celebrities. Unfortunately many of the prominent people pay no heed, some of them are living a life which can in no way be called suitable under current conditions. They were also concerned about their lives to an insane degree. Hitler himself, wherever he went, first of all issued orders for building bunkers for his personal protection. The thickness of their roofs increased with the caliber of the bombs until it reached 16 and a half feet. Ultimately there were veritable systems of bunkers in Rosenberg, in Berlin, at Obersalzburg, in Munich, in the guest palace near Salzburg, at the Norheim headquarters, and on the Somme. And in 1944 he had two underground headquarters blasted into mountains in Silesia and Thuringia, the project tying up hundreds of indispensable mining specialists and thousands of workmen.5. Hitler's obvious fear and his exaggeration of the importance of his own person inspired his entourage to go in for equally exaggerated measures of personal protection. Goering had extensive underground installations built not only in Kerin Hall, but even in the isolated castle of Veldenstein near Nuremberg, which he hardly ever visited. Six the road from Kerin Hall to Berlin, 40 miles long and leading mostly through lonely woods had to be provided with concrete shelters at regular intervals. When Lee saw the effect of a heavy bomb on the public shelter, he was interested solely in comparing the thickness of the ceiling with that in his private bunker in the rarely attacked suburb of Grunewald. Moreover, the Gauleiters, on orders from Hitler, who was convinced of their indispensability, had additional shelters built outside the cities for their personal protection. Of all the urgent questions that weighed upon me during my early weeks in office, solution of the labor problem was the most pressing. Late one evening in the middle of March, I inspected one of the leading Berlin armaments plants, Metall Borsig, and found its workshops filled with valuable machinery, but unused. There were not enough workers to man a second shift. 
similar conditions prevailed in other factories. Moreover, during the day we had to reckon with difficulties with the electricity supply, whereas during the evening and night hours the drain on the available supply was considerably smaller. Since new plants worth some 11 billion marks were being built which would be faced with shortages of machine tools, it seemed to me more rational to suspend most of the new building and employ the labor force thus released to establish a second shift. Hitler seemed to accept this logic. He signed a decree ordering reduction of the volume of building to 3 billion marks. But then he balked when, in carrying out this edict, I wanted to suspend long-term building projects by the chemical industry involving about a billion marks. This construction project tied up high-grade steel and many specialists. I opposed Hitler's view, arguing that it is better to get one hydrogenation plant built in a few months than to build several over a period three times as long employing a third of the necessary construction workers. The plant that is built quickly by concentrating all the labor on the one project will provide fuel for many months to come, whereas if the usual practice is followed, the first deliveries of additional fuel will not be ready until a much later date. Speech, April 18, 1942. For he always wanted to have everything at once and reasoned as follows, perhaps the war with Russia will soon be ended. But then I have more far-reaching plans and for them I need more synthetic fuel than before. We must go on with the new factories, even though they may not be finished for years. A year later, on March 2, 1943, I again had to remonstrate that there was no point to building factories which are intended to serve great future programs and will not begin to produce until after January 1, 1945. 7 Hitler's wrong-headed decision of the spring of 1942 was still a drag upon our armaments production in September 1944, in a military situation that had meanwhile become catastrophic. Despite Hitler's countermanding of my plan, it had nevertheless freed several hundred thousand construction workers, who could have been transferred to armaments production. But then a new, unexpected trouble arose. The head of the business department for labor assignment within the four year plan, ministerial director Dr. Mansfeld, told me frankly that he lacked authority to transfer the released construction workers from one district to another over the objections of the Gauleiters. Eight and in fact, the Gauleiters, for all their rivalries and intrigues, closed ranks whenever any of their privileges were threatened. I realized that in spite of my strong position, I could never deal with them alone. I needed someone from their number to act as my ally. I would also need special powers from Hitler. The man I had in mind was my old friend Karl Hank, longtime state secretary under Goebbels, who since January 1941 had been Gauleiter of Lower Silesia. Hitler proved willing to nominate a commissioner from among the Gauleiters who would be assigned to me. But Bormann was quick to parry. For Hank was considered one of my adherents. His appointment would have meant not only a reinforcement of my power but also an infringement of Bormann's realm, the party hierarchy. Two days after my first request, when I again approached Hitler on the matter, he was still acquiescent to the idea, but had objections to my choice. Hank hasn't been a Gauleiter long enough and doesn't command the necessary respect. I've talked with Bormann. We'll take Sorkel. I must share the responsibility for Sorkel's dire labor policies. Despite differences of opinion on other matters, I was always in basic agreement with his mass deportations of foreign labor to Germany. Since Edward L. Holmes, Foreign Labor in Nazi Germany, Princeton, 1967, gives exhaustive details on the little war that soon developed between Sorkel and me, I can restrict myself to the salient points. I agree with Holmes that these internal enmities and clashes were typical. Dr. Alan S. Millwood's recent book, The New Order and the French Economy, London, 1969, also gives an accurate picture. Bormann had not only put in his own candidate but had managed to have him made his, Bormann's, direct subordinate. Goering rightly protested that what was involved was a task hitherto handled within the framework of the four year plan. With his usual indifference in administrative matters, Hitler thereupon appointed Sorkel Commissioner General, 
but placed him in Goering's four-year plan organization. Goering protested once more, since the way the thing was handled seemed to diminish his prestige. The appointment of Sorkel should have come from Goering himself. But Hitler had overlooked that nicety. Once again Bormann had struck a blow at Goering's position. Sorkel and I were summoned to Hitler's headquarters. In giving us the document authorizing the appointment, Hitler pointed out that basically there could not be any such thing as a labor problem. He repeated, in effect, what he had already stated on November 9, 1941, the area working directly for us embraces more than 250 million people. Let no one doubt that we will succeed in involving every one of these millions in the labor process. 9 The necessary labor force, therefore, was to come from the occupied territories. Hitler instructed Sorkel to bring the needed workers in by any means whatsoever. That order marked the beginning of a fateful segment of my work. During the early weeks of our association we cooperated smoothly. Sorkel gave us his pledge to eliminate all labor shortages and to provide replacements for specialists drafted into the services. For my part, I helped Sorkel gain authority and supported him wherever I could. Sorkel had promised a great deal, for in every peacetime year the attrition of the labor force by age or death was balanced by the maturing of some 600,000 young men. Now, however, not only these men but sizable segments of the industrial working class were being drafted. In 1942, consequently, the war economy was short far more than one million workers. To put the matter briefly, Sorkel did not meet his commitments. Hitler's fine rhetoric about drawing labor out of a population of 250 million came to naught, partly because of the ineffectiveness of the German administration in the occupied territories, partly because of the preference of the men involved for taking to the forests and joining the partisans sooner than be dragged off for labor service in Germany. No sooner had the first foreign workers begun arriving in the factories than I began hearing protests from our industry organization. They had a number of objections to make. The first was as follows, the technical specialists now being replaced by foreigners had occupied key posts in vital industries. Any sabotage in these plants would have far-reaching consequences. What was to prevent enemy espionage services from planting agents in Sorkel's contingents? Another problem was that there were not enough interpreters to handle the various linguistic groups. Without adequate communication, these new workers were as good as useless. It seemed far more practicable to all concerned to employ German women rather than assorted foreign labor. Businessmen came to me with statistics showing that the employment of German women during the First World War had been significantly higher than it was now. They showed me photographs of workers streaming out of the same ammunition factory at closing time in 1918 and 1942, in the earlier war they had been predominantly women, now they were almost entirely men. They also had pictures from American and British magazines which indicated to what extent women were pitching in on the industrial front in those countries. 10. At the beginning of April 1942 I went to Sorkel with the proposition that we recruit our labor from the ranks of German women. He replied brusquely that the question of where to obtain which workers and how to distribute them was his business. Moreover, he said, as a Gauliter he was Hitler's subordinate and responsible to the Führer alone. But before the discussion was over, he offered to put the question to Goering, who as commissioner of the four-year plan should have the final say. Our conference with Goering took place in Karin Hall. Goering showed plainly that he was flattered at being consulted. He behaved with excessive amiability toward Sorkel and was markedly cooler toward me. I was scarcely allowed to advance my arguments. Sorkel and Goering continually interrupted me. Sorkel laid great weight on the danger that factory work might inflict moral harm upon German womanhood, not only might their psychic and emotional life be affected but also their ability to bear. Goering totally concurred. But to be absolutely sure, Sorkel went to Hitler immediately after the conference and had him confirm the decision. All my good arguments were thereby blown to the winds. Sorkel informed his fellow Gauliters of his victory in a proclamation in which, among other things, 
he stated, in order to provide the German housewife, above all mothers of many children. With tangible relief from her burdens, the Frau has commissioned me to bring into the Rhine from the Eastern Territories some four to five hundred thousand select, healthy, and strong girls. 11 Whereas by 1943 England had reduced the number of maidservants by two thirds, nothing of the sort took place in Germany until the end of the war. 12 Some 1.4 million women continued to be employed as household help. In addition, half a million Ukrainian girls helped solve the servant problem for party functionaries, a fact that soon caused a good deal of talk among the people. Armaments production is directly dependent on the supply of crude steel. During the First World War the German war economy drew on 46.5% of its crude steel production. One of the first facts I learned when I took office was that the parallel figure was only 37.5%. 13 In order to be able to gain more steel for armaments, I proposed to Mulch that we jointly undertake the allocation of raw materials. On April 2, therefore, we once again set out for Karin Hall. Goering at first beat about the bush, talking on a wide range of subjects, but finally he agreed to our suggestions about establishing a central planning authority within the four-year plan. Impressed by our firmness, he asked almost shyly, could you possibly take in my friend Corner? Otherwise, he'll feel sad at the demotion. Corner was Goering's state secretary and confidant. This central planning soon became the most important institution in our war economy. Actually it was incomprehensible that a top board of this sort to direct the various programs and priorities had not been established long ago. Until about 1939 Goering had personally taken care of this matter, but afterward there was no one with authority who could grasp the increasingly complicated and increasingly urgent problems and who could have leapt into the breach when Goering began shirking. 14 Goering's decree creating the Office of Central Planning did in fact provide that he would have the final say whenever he thought necessary. But as I expected, he never asked about anything and we for our part had no reason ever to bother him. 15. The central planning meetings took place in the large conference hall in my ministry. They dragged on endlessly, with a vast number of participants. Ministers and state secretaries would come in person. Supported by their experts, they would fight for their shares in sometimes highly dramatic tones. The task was particularly tricky, for we had to trim the civilian branch of the economy but not so much as to impair its efficiency in producing what would be needed for the war industries or in providing basic necessities for the population. 16. I myself was trying to push through a sizable cut in consumer goods production, especially since the consumer industries at the beginning of 1942 were producing at a rate only 3% below our peacetime level. But in 1942 the utmost I could manage was a 12% cutback.17 For after only three months of such austerity, Hitler began to regret this policy, and on June 28 to 29, 1942 decreed that the fabrication of products for the general supply of the population must be resumed. I protested arguing that such a slogan today will encourage those who have all along been averse to our concentration on armaments to resume resistance to the present line. 18 by those I meant the party functionaries. But Hitler remained deaf to these reminders. Once again my efforts to organize an effective war economy had been ruined by Hitler's vacillation. In addition to more workers and more crude steel, we needed an expansion of the railroads, this was essential even though the Reich Spain had not yet recovered from the disaster of the Russian winter. Deep into German territory the tracks were still clogged by paralyzed trains. Transports of important war materials were therefore subject to intolerable delays. On March 5, 1942, Dr. Julius Storp Muller, our Minister of Transportation and a spry man in spite of his 73 years went to headquarters with me in order to report to Hitler on transportation problems. I explained the catastrophic predicament that we were in, but since Dorp Muller gave me only lame support, Hitler, as always, chose the brighter view of the situation. 
he postponed the important question, remarking that conditions are probably not so serious as Speer sees them. Two weeks later, on my urging, he consented to designate a young official as successor to the 65-year-old state secretary in the Ministry of Transportation. But Dork Muller would not hear of it. My state secretary too old? He exclaimed when I told him what we had in mind. That young man? When I was president of one of the Reich Spain boards of directors in 1922, he was just starting in railroad work as a Reich Spain inspector. He succeeded in keeping things as they were. Two months later, however, on May 21, 1941, Dorp Muller was forced to confess to me, the Reich Spain has so few cars and locomotives available for the German area that it can no longer assume responsibility for meeting the most urgent transportation needs. This description of the situation, as my official journal noted, was tantamount to a declaration of bankruptcy by the Reich Spain. That same day the Reich Minister of Transportation offered me the post of traffic dictator. Bit I refused. Dot 19. Two days later Hitler let me bring a young Reich Spain inspector named Dr. Gansenmuller to meet him. During the past winter Dr. Gansenmuller had restored railroad traffic in a part of Russia, on the stretch between Minsk and Smolensk, after it had totally broken down. Hitler was impressed, I like the man, I'm going to make him state secretary at once. Shouldn't we speak with Dorp Muller about that first, I suggested. Absolutely not. Hitler exclaimed. Don't let either Dorp Muller or Gans and Muller know anything about it. I'll simply summon you, Herr Speer, to headquarters with your man. Then I'll have the transportation minister come here separately. On Hitler's instructions both men were put up at headquarters in different barracks, and Dr. Gans and Muller entered Hitler's office without knowing what awaited him. There are minutes of Hitler's remarks which were made the same day. The transportation problem is crucial, therefore it must be solved. All my life, but more so than ever in the past winter, I have confronted crucial questions that had to be solved. So called experts and men who by rights should have been leaders repeatedly told me, that isn't possible, that won't do. I cannot resign myself to such talk. There are problems that absolutely have to be solved. Where real leaders are present, these problems always are solved and always will be solved. This cannot be done by pleasant methods. Pleasantness is not what counts for me, in the same way. It is a matter of complete indifference to me what posterity will say about the methods I have been compelled to use. For me there is only a single question that must be solved, we must win the war or Germany faces annihilation. Hitler went on to recount how he had pitted his will against the disaster of the past winter and against the generals who urged retreat. From this, he made a slight jump to the transport problem and mentioned some of the measures which I had earlier recommended to him as necessary if order were to be restored to the railways. Without calling in the Minister of Transportation, who was now waiting outside, also ignorant of what this was all about, he appointed Gans and Muller the new state secretary in the Transportation Ministry because he has proved at the front that he possesses the energy to restore order to the muddled transportation situation. Only at this point were Minister of Transportation Dorp Muller and his assistant, Ministerial Director Brandt, brought into the conference. He had decided, Hitler announced, to intervene in the transportation situation, since victory depended on it. Then he continued with one of his standard arguments, in my day I started with nothing, an obscure soldier in the world war, and began my career only when all others, who seemed more destined to leadership than I, failed. The whole course of my life proves that I never capitulate. The tasks of the war must be mastered. I repeat, for me the word impossible does not exist. And he repeated, almost screaming, it does not exist for me. Thereupon he informed the Minister of Transportation that he had appointed the former Reich Spain inspector the new state secretary in the Ministry of Transportation, an embarrassing situation for the minister, for the state secretary, and for me as well. Hitler had always spoken with great respect of Dorp Muller's expertise. 
in view of that Dorp Muller could have expected that the question of his deputy would first be discussed with him. But apparently Hitler, as was so often the case when he confronted experts, wanted to avoid an awkward argument by presenting the Minister of Transportation with a fetak armed plea. And in fact Dorp Muller took this humiliation in silence. Hitler now turned to Field Marshal Milch and me and instructed us to act temporarily as transportation dictators. We were to see to it that the requirements were met to the largest extent and in the fastest time. With the disarming comment, we cannot allow the war to be lost because of the transportation question, therefore it can be solved. 20 Hitler adjourned the meeting. In fact it was solved. The young state secretary found procedures for handling the backup of trains. He speeded traffic and was able to provide for the increased transportation needs of the war plants. A special committee for rolling stock took charge of the locomotives damaged by the Russian winter, repair techniques were much accelerated. Instead of the previous craft system of manufacturing locomotives, we went over to assembly line methods and increased production manyfold.21 in spite of the steadily rising demands of the war. Traffic continued to flow in the future, or at least until the systematic air raids of the fall of 1944 once again throttled traffic and made transportation, this time for good, the greatest bottleneck in our war economy. When Goering heard that we intended to increase production of locomotives many times over, he summoned me to Karen Hall. He had a suggestion to offer, which was that we build locomotives out of concrete, since we did not have enough steel available. Of course the concrete locomotives would not last as long as steel ones, he said, but to make up for that we would simply have to produce more of them. Quite how that was to be accomplished, he did not know, nevertheless, he clung for months to this weird idea for the sake of which I had squandered a two-hour drive and two hours of waiting time. And I had come home on an empty stomach, for visitors in Karen Hall were seldom offered a meal. That was the only concession the Goring household made to the needs of a total war economy. A week after Ganzen Muller's appointment, at which such heroic words had been spoken on the solution of the transportation crisis, I visited Hitler once more. In keeping with my view that in critical times the leadership must set a good example, I proposed to Hitler that the use of private railroad cars by government and party officials be discontinued for the time being. Naturally, I was not thinking of Hitler himself when I made this suggestion. But Hitler demurred, private cars were a necessity in the East, he said, because of the poor housing conditions. I corrected him, most of the cars were not being used in the East, I said, but inside the Reich. And I presented him with a long list of the prominent users of private cars. But I had no luck.22. I met regularly for lunch with General Friedrich Fromm in a chamber separate at Horch's restaurant. In the course of one of these meetings, at the end of April 1942, he remarked that our only chance of winning the war lay in developing a weapon with totally new effects. He said he had contacts with a group of scientists who were on the track of a weapon which could annihilate whole cities, perhaps throw the island of England out of the fight. Fromm proposed that we pay a joint visit to these men. It seemed to him important, he said, at least to have spoken with them. Dr. Albert Vogeler, head of the largest German steel company and president of the Kaiser Wilhelm Gesellschaft, also called my attention at this time to the neglected field of nuclear research. He complained of the inadequate support fundamental research was receiving from the Ministry of Education and Science which naturally did not have much influence during wartime. On May 6, 1942, I discussed this situation with Hitler and proposed that Goering be placed at the head of the Rye Research Council, thus emphasizing its importance. 23 A month later, on June 9, 1942, Goering was appointed to this post. Around the same time the three military representatives of armaments production, Milch, Fromm, and Witzel, met with me at Hanak House, the Berlin center of the Kaiser Wilhelm Gesellschaft, to be briefed on the subject of German atomic research. Along with scientists whose names I no longer recall, the subsequent Nobel Prize winners Otto Hahn and Werner Heisenberg were present. 
After a few demonstration lectures on the matter as a whole, Heisenberg reported on atom smashing and the development of the uranium machine, SICK, and the cyclotron. 24 Heisenberg had bitter words to say about the Ministry of Education's neglect of nuclear research, about the lack of funds and materials, and the drafting of scientific men into the services. Excerpts from American technical journals suggested that plenty of technical and financial resources were available there for nuclear research. This meant that America probably had a head start in the matter, whereas Germany had been in the forefront of these studies only a few years ago. In view of the revolutionary possibilities of nuclear fission, dominance in this field was fraught with enormous consequences. After the lecture I asked Heisenberg how nuclear physics could be applied to the manufacture of atom bombs. His answer was by no means encouraging. He declared, to be sure, that the scientific solution had already been found and that theoretically nothing stood in the way of building such a bomb. But the technical prerequisites for production would take years to develop, two years at the earliest, even provided that the program was given maximum support. Difficulties were compounded, Heisenberg explained, by the fact that Europe possessed only one cyclotron, and that of minimal capacity. Moreover, it was located in Paris and because of the need for secrecy could not be used to full advantage. I proposed that with the powers at my disposal as Minister of Armaments we build cyclotrons as large as or larger than those in the United States. But Heisenberg said that because we lacked experience we would have to begin by building only a relatively small type. Nevertheless, General Fromm offered to release several hundred scientific assistants from the services, while I urged the scientists to inform me of the measures, the sums of money, and the materials they would need to further nuclear research. A few weeks later they presented their request an appropriation of several hundred thousand marks and some small amounts of steel, nickel, and other priority metals. In addition, they asked for the building of a bunker, the erection of several barracks, and the pledge that their experiments would be given highest priority. Plans for building the first German cyclotron had already been approved. Rather put out by these modest requests in a matter of such crucial importance, I suggested that they take one or two million marks and correspondingly larger quantities of materials. But apparently more could not be utilized for the present comma 25 and in any case I had been given the impression that the atom bomb could no longer have any bearing on the course of the war. I was familiar with Hitler's tendency to push fantastic projects by making senseless demands, so that on June 23, 1942, I reported to him only very briefly on the nuclear fission conference and what we had decided to do. 26 Hitler received more detailed and more glowing reports from his photographer, Heinrich Hoffmann, who was friendly with post office minister on Sorge. Goebbels, too, may have told him something about it. On Sorge was interested in nuclear research and was supporting like the SS an independent research apparatus under the direction of Manfred von Arden, a young physicist. It is significant that Hitler did not choose the direct route of obtaining information on this matter from responsible people but depended instead on unreliable and incompetent informants to give him a Sunday supplement account. Here again was proof of his love for amateurishness and his lack of understanding of fundamental scientific research. Hitler had sometimes spoken to me about the possibility of an atom bomb, but the idea quite obviously strained his intellectual capacity. He was also unable to grasp the revolutionary nature of nuclear physics. In the 2200 recorded points of my conferences with Hitler, nuclear fission comes up only once, and then is mentioned with extreme brevity. Hitler did sometimes comment on its prospects. But what I told him of my conference with the physicists confirmed his view that there was not much profit in the matter. Actually, Professor Heisenberg had not given any final answer to my question whether a successful nuclear fission could be kept under control with absolute certainty or might continue as a chain reaction. Hitler was plainly not delighted with the possibility that the Earth under his rule might be transformed into a glowing star. Occasionally, however, he joked that the scientists in their unworldly urge to lay bare all the secrets under heaven might someday set the globe on fire. 
but undoubtedly a good deal of time would pass before that came about, Hitler said, he would certainly not live to see it. I am sure that Hitler would not have hesitated for a moment to employ atom bombs against England. I remember his reaction to the final scene of a newsreel on the bombing of Warsaw in the autumn of 1939. We were sitting with him and Goebbels in his Berlin salon watching the film. Clouds of smoke darkened the sky, dive bombers tilted and hurtled toward their goal, we could watch the flight of the released bombs, the pull out of the planes and the cloud from the explosions expanding gigantically. The effect was enhanced by running the film in slow motion. Hitler was fascinated. The film ended with a montage showing a plane diving toward the outlines of the British Isles. A burst of flame followed, and the island flew into the air in tatters. Hitler's enthusiasm was unbounded. That is what will happen to them. He cried out, carried away. That is how we will annihilate them. On the suggestion of the nuclear physicists we scuttled the project to develop an atom bomb by the autumn of 1942 after I had again queried them about deadlines and been told that we could not count on anything for three or four years. The war would certainly have been decided long before then. Instead I authorized the development of an energy producing uranium motor for propelling machinery. The Navy was interested in that for its submarines. In the course of a visit to the Krupworks I asked to be shown parts of our first cyclotron and asked the technician in charge whether we could not go on and build a considerably larger apparatus. But he confirmed what Professor Heisenberg had previously said, we lacked the technical experience. At Heidelberg in the summer of 1944, I was shown our first cyclotron splitting an atomic nucleus. To my questions. Professor Wallabov explained that this cyclotron would be useful for medical and biological research. I had to rest content with that. In the summer of 1943, Wolframite imports from Portugal were cut off, which created a critical situation for the production of solid core ammunition. I thereupon ordered the use of uranium cores for this type of ammunition. 27 My release of our uranium stocks of about 1200 metric tons showed that we no longer had any thought of producing atom bombs. Perhaps it would have proved possible to have the atom bomb ready for employment in 1945. But it would have meant mobilizing all our technical and financial resources to that end, as well as our scientific talent. It would have meant giving up all other projects, such as the development of the rocket weapons. From this point of view, too, Pienemund was not only our biggest but our most misguided project. From 1937 to 1940 the army spent 550 million marks on the development of a large rocket. But success was out of the question for Hitler's principle of scattering responsibility meant that even scientific research teams were divided and often at odds with one another. According to the Office Journal, August 17, 1944, not only the three branches of the armed forces but also other organizations, the SS, the postal system, and such, had separate research facilities. In the United States, on the other hand, all the atomic physicists, to take an example, were in one organization. Our failure to pursue the possibilities of atomic warfare can be partly traced to ideological reasons. Hitler had great respect for Philip Lienard, the physicist who had received the Nobel Prize in 1920 and was one of the few early adherents of Nazism among the ranks of the scientists. Lienard had instilled the idea in Hitler that the Jews were exerting a seditious influence in their concern with nuclear physics and the relativity theory. According to L. W. Helwig, Person Lichkitten der Jegene Watt, 1940, Lienard invade against relativity theories produced by alien minds. In his four-volume work, Die Deutsche Fisk, 1935. Helwig considered physics cleansed of the outgrowths which the by now well known findings of race research have shown to be the exclusive products of the Jewish mind and which the German Volk must shun as racially incompatible with itself. To his table companions, Hitler occasionally referred to nuclear physics as Jewish physics, citing Leonard as his authority for this. This view was taken up by Rosenberg. 
it thus becomes clearer why the Minister of Education was not inclined to support nuclear research. But even if Hitler had not had this prejudice against nuclear research and even if the state of our fundamental research in June 1942 could have freed several billion instead of several million marks for the production of atom bombs, it would have been impossible, given the strain on our economic resources, to have provided the materials, priorities, and technical workers corresponding to such an investment. For it was not only superior productive capacity that allowed the United States to undertake this gigantic project. The increasing air aids had long since created an armaments emergency in Germany which ruled out any such ambitious enterprise. At best, with extreme concentration of all our resources, we could have had a German atom bomb by 1947, but certainly we could not beat the Americans, whose bomb was ready by August 1945 and on the other hand the consumption of our latest reserves of chromium ore would have ended the war by January 1, 1946, at the very latest. Thus, from the start of my work as Minister of Armaments I discovered blunder after blunder, in all departments of the economy. Incongruously enough, Hitler himself used to say, during those war years, the loser of this war will be the side that makes the greatest blunders. For Hitler, by a succession of wrong-headed decisions, helped to speed the end of a war already lost because of productive capacities, for example, by his confused planning of the air war against England, by the shortage of U-boats at the beginning of the war, and, in general, by his failure to develop an overall plan for the war. So that when many German memoirs comment on Hitler's decisive mistakes, the writers are completely right. But all that does not mean that the war could have been won. 17. Commander-in-Chief Hitler Amateurishness was one of Hitler's dominant traits, he had never learned a profession and basically had always remained an outsider to all fields of endeavor. Like many self-taught people, he had no idea what real specialized knowledge meant. Without any sense of the complexities of any great task, he boldly assumed one function after another. Unburdened by standard ideas, his quick intelligence sometimes conceived unusual measures which a specialist would not have hit on at all. The victories of the early years of the war can literally be attributed to Hitler's ignorance of the rules of the game and his layman's delight in decision making. Since the opposing side was trained to apply rules which Hitler's self taught, autocratic mind did not know and did not use, he achieved surprises. These audacities, coupled with military superiority, were the basis of his early successes. But as soon as setbacks occurred he suffered shipwreck, like most untrained people. Then his ignorance of the rules of the game was revealed as another kind of incompetence, then his defects were no longer strengths. The greater the failures became, the more obstinately his incurable amateurishness came to the fore. The tendency to wild decisions had long been his forte, now it speeded his downfall. Every two or three weeks I traveled from Berlin to spend a few days in Hitler's East Prussian, and later in his Ukrainian, headquarters in order to have him decide the many technical questions of detail in which he was interested in his capacity as commander-in-chief of the army. Hitler knew all the types of ordnance and ammunition, including the calibers, the lengths of barrels, and the range of fire. He had the stocks of the most important items of armament in his head, as well as the monthly production figures. He was able to compare our quotas with our deliveries and draw conclusions. Hitler naive pleasure at being able to shine in the field of armaments, as previously in automobile manufacturing or in architecture, by reciting abstruse figures, made it plain that in this realm also he was working as an amateur. He seemed to be constantly endeavoring to show himself the equal of or even the superior of the experts. The real expert sensibly does not burden his mind with details that he can look up or leave to an assistant. Hitler, however, felt it necessary for his own self-esteem to parade his knowledge. But he also enjoyed doing it. He obtained his information from a large book in a red binding with broad yellow diagonal stripes. It was a catalogue continually being brought up to date, of from 30 to 50 different types of ammunition and ordnance. 
he kept it on his night table. Sometimes he would order a servant to bring the book down when in the course of military conferences an assistant had mentioned a figure which Hitler instantly corrected. The book was opened and Hitler's data would be confirmed, without fail, every time, while the general would be shown to be in error. Hitler's memory for figures was the terror of his entourage. By tricks of this sort, Hitler could intimidate the majority of the officers who surrounded him. But on the other hand he felt uncertain when he was confronting an out-and-out -out technical expert. He did not insist on his opinion if a specialist objected. My predecessor, Tot, had sometimes gone to conferences with Hitler accompanied by two of his closest associates, Xaver Dorsch and Karl Sohr, occasionally, he would bring one of his experts along. But he thought it important to deliver his reports personally and to involve his associates only on difficult points of detail. From the very first I did not even take the trouble to memorize figures which Hitler in any case kept in his head better than I. But knowing Hitler's respect for specialists, I would come to conferences flanked by all those experts who had the best mastery of the various points under discussion. I was thus saved from the nightmare of all for a conferences, the fear of being driven into a coma by a bombardment of figures and technical data. I consistently appeared at the Fras headquarters accompanied by approximately 20 civilians. Before long everybody in restricted area I, as the specially guarded area around the headquarters was known, was making fun of Spears invasions. Depending on the subjects to be discussed, from two to four of my experts were invited to the conferences which took place in the situation room of the headquarters, adjacent to Hitler's private apartment. It was a modestly furnished room about 900 square feet in area, the walls panelled in light coloured wood. The room was dominated by a heavy oak mat table 13 feet long next to a large window. In one comer was a smaller table surrounded by six armchairs. Here our conference group sat. During these conferences I remained in the background as far as possible. I opened them with a brief reference to the subject and then asked one of the experts present to state his views. Neither the environment, with its innumerable generals, adjutants, guard areas, barriers, and passes, nor the aureole that this whole apparatus conferred upon Hitler, could intimidate these specialists. Their many years of successful practice of their professions gave them a clear sense of their rank and their responsibility. Sometimes the conversation developed into a heated discussion, for they quite often forgot whom they were addressing. Hitler took all this partly with humor, partly with respect. In this circle he seemed modest and treated my people with remarkable courtesy. With them, moreover, he refrained from his habit of killing opposition by long, exhaustive, and numbing speeches. He knew how to distinguish key matters from those of lesser importance, was adaptable, and surprised everyone by the swiftness with which he could choose among several possibilities and justify his choice. Effortlessly, he found his bearings when presented with technical processes, plans, and sketches. His questions showed that during the brief explanation period he could grasp the essentials of complicated subjects. However, there was a disadvantage to this which he was unaware of, he arrived at the core of matters too easily and therefore could not understand them with real thoroughness. I could never predict what the result of our conferences would be. Sometimes he instantly approved a proposal whose prospects seemed exceedingly slight. Sometimes he obstinately refused to permit certain trivial measures which he himself had demanded only a short time before. Nevertheless, my system of circumventing Hitler's knowledge of detail by having experts confront him with even more detailed knowledge netted me more successes than failures. His other associates observed with astonishment and with some degree of envy that Hitler often changed his mind after hearing our counter-proposals and would alter decisions which in the preceding military conferences he had called unalterable.1. Hitler's technical horizon, however, just like his general ideas, his views on art, and his style of life, was limited by the First World War. His technical interests were narrowly restricted to the traditional weapons of the army and navy. 
In these areas he had continued to learn and steadily increased his knowledge, so that he frequently proposed convincing and usable innovations. But he had little feeling for such new developments as, for example, radar, the construction of an atom bomb, jet fighters, and rockets. On his rare flights in the newly developed Condor he showed concern that the mechanism which let down the retracted landing gear might not function. Warily, he declared that he preferred the old Junkers 52 with its rigid landing gear. Very often, directly after one of these conferences Hitler would lecture his military advisors on the technical knowledge he had just acquired. He loved to present such pieces of information with a casual air, as if the knowledge were his own. When the Russian T-34 appeared, Hitler was triumphant, for he could then point out that he had earlier demanded the kind of long-barreled gun it had. Even before my appointment as Minister of Armaments, I heard Hitler in the Chancellery Garden, after a demonstration of the Panzer IV, inveighing against the obstinacy of the Army Ordnance Office which had turned down his idea for increasing the velocity of the missile by lengthening the barrel. The Ordnance Office had at the time presented counterarguments: the long barrel would overload the tank in front, since it was not built with such a gun in view. If so major a change were introduced, the whole design would be thrown out of balance. Hitler would always bring up this incident whenever his ideas encountered opposition. I was right at the time, and no one wanted to believe me. Now I am right again. When the army felt the need for a tank which could outmaneuver the comparatively fast T-34 by greater speed, Hitler insisted that more would be gained by increasing the range of the guns and the weight of the armor. In this field, too, he had mastered the necessary figures and could recite penetration results and missile velocities by heart. He usually defended his theory by the example of warships. In a naval battle the side having the great range can open fire at the greater distance. Even if it is only half a mile. If along with this he has stronger armor. He must necessarily be superior. What are you after? The faster ship has only one advantage, to utilize its greater speed for retreating. Do you mean to say a ship can possibly overcome heavier armor and superior artillery by greater speed? It's exactly the same for tanks. Your faster tank has to avoid meeting the heavier tank. My experts from industry were not direct participants in these discussions. Our business was to build the tanks according to the requirements set by the army, whether these were decided by Hitler, by the general staff, or by the army ordnance office. Questions of battle tactics were not our concern, such discussions were usually conducted by the army officers. In 1942, Hitler still encouraged such discussions. He was still listening quietly to objections and offering his arguments just as quietly. Nevertheless, his arguments carried special weight. Since the Tiger had originally been designed to weigh 50 tons but as a result of Hitler's demands had gone up to 75 tons, we decided to develop a new 30-ton tank whose very name, Panther, was to signify greater agility. Though light in weight, its motor was to be the same as the Tiger S, which meant it could develop superior speed. But in the course of a year Hitler once again insisted on clapping so much armor on it, as well as larger guns, that it ultimately reached 48 tons, the original weight of the Tiger. In order to compensate for this strange transformation of a swift panther into a slow Tiger, we made still another effort to produce a series of small, light, quick moving tanks. Too, by way of pleasing and reassuring Hitler, Porsche also undertook to design a super heavy tank which weighed over a hundred tons and hence could be built only in small numbers, one by one. For security purposes this new monster was assigned the codename Mouse. In any case Porsche had personally taken over Hitler's bias for super heaviness and would occasionally bring the for reports about parallel developments on the part of the enemy. Once, Hitler sent for General Bull and demanded, I have just heard that an enemy tank is coming along with armor far beyond anything we have. Have you any documentation of that? If it is true a new anti-tank gun must be developed instantly. The force of penetration must. The gun must be enlarged, or lengthened, to be brief, 
We must begin reacting immediately. Instantly. 3. Thus, Hitler's decisions led to a multiplicity of parallel projects. They also led to more and more complicated problems of supply. One of his worst failings was that he simply did not understand the necessity for supplying the armies with sufficient spare parts. This disastrous tendency was evident as early as 1942, presented the FRA with a monthly list of tank replacement parts and reported that despite the increase in production the demand is so high that to raise the production of spare parts we must decrease the production of new tanks. Few Protocol, May 6-7, 1942.38. General Guderian, the Inspector General of Tank Ordnance, frequently pointed out to me that if we could repair our tanks quickly, thanks to sufficient spare parts, we could have more available for battle, at a fraction of the cost, than by producing new ones. But Hitler insisted on the priority of new production, which would have had to be reduced by 20% if we made provision for such repairs. General Fromm as chief of the reserve army was deeply concerned about this kind of poor planning. I took him with me to see Hitler several times so that he could present the arguments of the military. Fromm knew how to state a problem clearly, he had presence and had diplomatic tact. Sitting there, his sword pressed between his knees, hand on the hilt, he looked charged with energy, and to this day I believe that his great abilities might have prevented many a blunder at the Fra's headquarters. After several conferences, in fact, his influence increased. But immediately opposition appeared, both on the part of Ki Itel, who saw his position threatened, and on the part of Goebbels, who tried to persuade Hitler that Fromm had a dangerous political record. Finally, Hitler clashed with Fromm over a question of reserve supplies. Curtly, he let me know that I was no longer to bring Fromm with me. Many of my conferences with Hitler were concerned with establishing the armaments programs for the army. Hitler's point of view was, the more I demand, the more I receive. And to my astonishment programs which industrial experts considered impossible to carry out were in the end actually surpassed. Hitler's authority liberated reserves that nobody had taken into his calculations. From 1944 on, however, his programs became totally unrealistic. Our efforts to push these through in the factories were self-defeating. It often seemed to me that Hitler used these prolonged conferences on armaments and war production as an escape from his military responsibilities. He himself admitted to me that he found in them a relaxation similar to our former conferences on architecture. Even in crisis situations he devoted many hours to such discussions, sometimes refusing to interrupt them even when his field marshals or ministers urgently wanted to speak with him. Our technical conferences were usually combined with a demonstration of new weapons which took place in a nearby field. A few moments before we would have been sitting intimately with Hitler, but now everybody had to line up in rank and file, Field Marshal Key Itel, Chief of the OKW, High Command of the Armed Forces, on the right. Obviously, Hitler laid stress on the ceremonial aspect of the occasion, adding a further note of formality by entering his official limousine to cover the few hundred yards to the field. I took my place in the back seat. Hitler would then step out, and Key Eitel would report the presence of the waiting line of generals and technicians. This ritual concluded, the group promptly broke up. Hitler looked into details, clambered over the vehicles on portable steps held in readiness for him, and continued his discussions with the specialists. Often Hitler and I would make appreciative remarks about the weapons, such as, what an elegant barrel, or, what a fine shape this tank has. A ludicrous relapse into the terminology of our joint inspections of architectural models. In the course of one such inspection, Key Eitel mistook a 7.5 cm anti-tank gun for a light field howitzer. Hitler passed over the mistake at the time but had his joke on our eye back, did you hear that? Key Eitel and the anti-tank gun? And he's a general of the artillery. Another time the Air Force had lined up on a nearby airfield the multiple variants and types in its production program for Hitler's inspection. 
Göring had himself reserved the right to explain the planes to Hitler. His staff thereupon provided him with a gram sheet, in the order of the models on display, giving their names, flight characteristics, and other technical data. One type had not been brought up in time, and Göring had not been informed. From that point on he blandly misidentified everything, for he adhered strictly to his list. Hitler instantly perceived the error but gave no sign. At the end of June 1942 I read in the newspapers, just like everyone else, that a great new offensive in the East had begun. There was a mood of exuberance at headquarters. Every evening Hitler's chief adjutant, Schmunt, traced the onrush of the troops on a wall map, for the edification of civilians at headquarters. Hitler was triumphant. Once again he had proved that he was right and the generals wrong, for they had advised against an offensive and called for defensive tactics, occasionally straightening out the front. Even General Fromm had brightened up, although at the beginning of the operation he had commented to me that any such offensive was a luxury in the poor man's situation we were in. The left wing east of Kiev grew longer and longer. The troops were approaching Stalingrad. Feats were performed to maintain emergency railroad traffic in the newly won territories and thus keep supplies moving. Barely three weeks after the beginning of the successful offensive Hitler moved to an advanced headquarters near the Ukrainian city of Vinnytsia. Since Russian air activity was as good as non-existent and the West this time was too far away, even given Hitler's anxieties, he for once did not demand the building of any special air raid shelters. Instead of the usual concrete buildings a pleasant looking cluster of blockhouses scattered about a forest was established. Whenever I had to fly to the new headquarters, I used what free time I had to drive around the country. Once I drove to Kiev. Immediately after the October Revolution avant-gardists like Le Corbusier, May, or L. Lysitsky had influenced modem Russian architecture. But under Stalin at the end of the twenties it had all swung back to a conservative and classicist style. The conference building in Kiev, for example, could have been designed by a good pupil of the École des Beaux-Arts. I toyed with the notion of searching out the architect and employing him in Germany. A classicist stadium in Kiev was adorned with statues of athletes in the fashion of classical antiquity, but touchingly, the figures were clad in bathing suits. I found one of the most famous churches of Kiev a heap of rubble. A Soviet powder magazine had blown up inside it, I was told. Later, I learned from Goebbels that the church had been blown up deliberately on orders of Eric Koch, Reich Commissioner for the Ukraine, the idea had been to destroy this symbol of Ukrainian national pride. Goebbels told the story with displeasure. He was horrified by the brutal course being pursued in occupied sectors of the Soviet Union. In fact the Ukraine at that time was still so peaceable that I could drive through the extensive forests without an escort. Half a year later, thanks to the twisted policy of the Eastern Commissioners, the whole area was infested with partisans. Other drives took me to the industrial center of Dnepropetrovsk. What most impressed me was a university complex under construction. Its facilities went far beyond anything in Germany and left no doubt of the Soviet Union's determination to become a technical power of the first rank. I also visited the power plant of Sabrush, blown up by the Russians. A large construction crew closed the blast hole in the dam, but they also had to install new turbines. Before retreating, the Russians had thrown the oil switch, interrupting the oiling of their turbines while they were running at full speed. The machines ran hot and finally ground themselves into a useless tangle of parts, a feat which could be accomplished by a single man pulling a lever. The vision of that later gave me many a sleepless hour when I learned of Hitler's intention to make Germany a wasteland. Even at the Fra's headquarters, Hitler kept to his habit of taking his meals in the midst of his close associates. But whereas at the Chancellery party uniforms had dominated the scene, he was now surrounded by generals and officers of his staff. In contrast to the luxuriously furnished dining hall in the Chancellery, this dining room looked rather like the railroad station restaurant in a small town. 
pine boarding formed the walls, and the windows were those of a standardized barracks. There was a long table for about twenty persons, flanked by plain chairs. Hitler's seat was on the window side in the middle of the long table, Kiitel sat facing him, while the places of honor on either side of Hitler were reserved for the ever-changing visitors. As in past days in Berlin, Hitler talked long-windedly about his favorite subjects, while his dinner guests were reduced to silent listeners. It was apparent, however, that Hitler made an effort in the presence of these men, with whom he was not especially intimate and who moreover were his superiors by birth and education, to present his thoughts in as impressive manner as possible. Tist's Prack, Table Talk, published by Picker gives a good idea of Hitler's topics of conversation. But we must remember that this collection includes only those passages in Hitler's monologues, they took up one to two hours every day, which struck Picker as significant. Complete transcripts would reinforce the sense of stifling boredom. Thus the level of the table talk in the Führer's headquarters differed from that at the Chancellery. It was considerably higher. During the first weeks of the offensive we had discussed the rapid progress of the troops in the South Russian plains in an exultant mood. By contrast, after two months the faces of the diners grew increasingly doleful, and Hitler too began to lose his self-assurance. Our troops had, it is true, taken the oil fields of Mayakop. The leading tank columns were already fighting along the Tyrak and pushing on over a roadless steppe near Astrakhan toward the southern Volga. But this advance was no longer maintaining the pace of the first weeks. Supplies could no longer keep up, the spare parts the tanks carried with them had long since been consumed, so that the fighting wedge was steadily thinning out. Moreover, our monthly armaments production lagged far behind the demands of an offensive over such enormous spaces. At that time we were manufacturing only a third of the tanks and a fourth of the artillery we were to be producing in 1944. Aside from that, normal wear and tear was extremely high over such distances. The tank testing station at Kummersdorf operated on the assumption that the treads or the motor of a heavy tank would need repairs after four to five hundred miles. Hitler realized none of this. With the enemy supposedly too weak to offer any resistance, he wanted the exhausted German troops to thrust on to the southern side of the Caucasus, toward Georgia. He therefore detached considerable forces from the already weakened wedge and directed them to advance beyond Mayakop toward Soki. These contingents were supposed to reach Sukhumi by way of the narrow coastal road. This was where the main blow was to be delivered, he assumed that the territory north of the Caucasus would fall easily to him in any case. But the units were done in. They could no longer push forward, however imperiously Hitler ordered it. In the situation conferences Hitler was shown aerial photos of the impenetrable walnut forests outside Soki. Chief of Staff Hader warned Hitler that the Russians could easily render the coastal road impassable for a long time by blasting the steep slopes. In any case, he argued, the road was too narrow for the advance of large troop units. But Hitler remained unimpressed. These difficulties can be overcome as all difficulties can be overcome. First we must conquer the road. Then the way is open to the plains south of the Caucasus. The we can deploy our armies freely and set up supply camps. Then, in one or two years, we'll start an offensive into the underbelly of the British Empire. With a minimum of effort we can liberate Persia and Iraq. The Indians will hail our divisions enthusiastically. When in 1944 we were combing through the printing trade for unnecessary assignments, we came upon a plant in Leipzig that was turning out Persian maps and language guides for the OKW in large quantities. The contract had been let and then forgotten. Even a layman like myself could tell that the offensive had run itself into the ground. Then the report arrived that a detachment of German mountain troops had taken Mount Elbrus, nearly 19,000 feet high, the highest mountain in the Caucasus and surrounded by broad fields of glaciers. They had planted the German war flag there. To be sure, this was a superfluous action, certainly on the smallest scale. 
one mountain division tried to push through to Tiflis by way of the Caucasian mountain passes, following the old military road from Grozny. Hitler considered this road a pawn to use for sending reinforcements, since it was blocked for months at a time by snow and avalanches. One group from the mountain division had gone off to take Mount Elbrus, which could be understood only as an adventure by a group of enthusiastic mountain climbers. All of us could sympathize with the impulse behind this act, but otherwise it seemed to us completely unimportant. I often saw Hitler furious but seldom did his anger erupt from him as it did when this report came in. For hours he raged as if his entire plan of campaign had been ruined by this bit of sport. Days later he went on railing to all and sundry about these crazy mountain climbers who belong before a court-martial. Though they were pursuing their idiotic hobbies in the midst of a war, he exclaimed indignantly, occupying an idiotic peak even though he had commanded that all efforts must be concentrated upon Tsukhumi. Here was a clear example of the way his orders were being obeyed. Urgent business called me back to Berlin. A few days later the commander of the army group operating in the Caucasus was relieved, although Jodl vigorously defended him. When I returned to headquarters again about two weeks later, I found that Hitler had quarreled with Ki Itel, Jodl, and Haider. He refused to shake hands with them or to dine with them at the common table. From then on until the end of the war he had his meals served in his bunker room, only occasionally inviting a few select persons to join him. The close relations that Hitler had with his military associates were shattered for good. Was the cause merely the failure of the offensive on which he had placed so many hopes, or did he for the first time have an inkling that this was the turning point? The fact that from then on he stayed away from the officers' table may have been due to the fact that he would no longer be sitting among them as the invincible leader in peace and war, but as a man whose plans had come to grief. Moreover, he must by now have run through the stock of general ideas with which he had regaled this group. Perhaps he also felt that his magic was failing him for the first time. For several weeks Ki Itel skulked about mournfully and displayed great devotion, so that Hitler soon began treating him somewhat more amicably. His relations with Jodl, who had characteristically remained impassive through it all, likewise straightened out. But General Haider, the army chief of staff, had to go. He was a quiet, laconic man who was probably always thrown off by Hitler's vulgar dynamism and thus gave a rather hapless impression. His successor, Kurt Zietzler, was just the opposite a straightforward, insensitive person who made his reports in a loud voice. He was not the type of military man given to independent thinking and no doubt represented the kind of chief of staff that Hitler wanted, a reliable assistant who, as Hitler was fond of saying, doesn't go off and brood on my orders, but energetically sees to carrying them out. With that in mind, too, Hitler probably did not pick him from the ranks of the higher generals. Zietzler had up to that time held a subordinate place in the army hierarchy, he was promoted two grades at once. After the appointment of the new chief of staff, Hitler permitted me, the only civilian for the time being. Several months passed before Bormann and Ribbentrop received permission to attend. To participate in the situation conferences. I could take this as a special proof of his satisfaction with me, for which he had every reason given the constantly rising production figures. But this favor would probably not have been shown me if he had felt threatened by a loss of prestige in my presence because of opposition, vehement debates, and disputes. The storm had calmed down again, Hitler had regained his standing. Every day around noon the Grand Situation Conference took place. It lasted two to three hours. Hitler was the only one who was seated on a plain armchair with a rush seat. The other participants stood around the map table. His adjutants, staff officers of the OKW and the army general staff, and Hitler's liaison officers to the Air Force, the Navy, the Waffen-SS, and Himmler. On the whole they were rather young men with likable faces, most of them holding the rank of colonel or major. Ki Itel, Jodl, and Zietzler stood casually amongst them. Sometimes Goering came too. 
as a gesture of special distinction and perhaps in consideration of his corpulence, Hitler had an upholstered stool brought in for the Rye Marshal, on which he sat beside Hitler. Desk lamps with long, swinging arms illuminated the maps. First the Eastern Theater was discussed. Three or four strategic maps, pasted together, each of them about five by eight feet, were laid out on the long table in front of Hitler. The discussion began with the northern part of the Eastern Theater of War. Every detail of the events of the previous day was entered on the maps, every advance, even patrols, and almost every entry was explained by the Chief of Staff. Bit by bit the maps were pushed farther up the table, so that Hitler always had a comprehensible segment within reading distance. Longer discussion was devoted to the more important events, Hitler noting every change from the status of the previous day. Just the daily preparation for this conference was a tremendous burden on the time of the Chief of Staff and his officers, who no doubt had more important things to do. As a layman I was astonished at the way Hitler in the course of hearing the reports made deployments, pushed divisions back and forth, or dealt with petty details. At least during 1942 he received the news of grave setbacks calmly. Or perhaps this was already the beginning of the apathy he later displayed. Outwardly, at any rate, he showed no sign of despair. He seemed determined to present the image of the superior warlord whose composure nothing could shake. Frequently he stressed that his experiences in the trenches of the First World War had given him more insight into many details of military policy than all his military advisors had acquired in the general staff school. This may well have been true, for certain restricted areas. In the opinion of many army officers, however, his very trench perspective had given him a false picture of the process of leadership. In this regard his knowledge of detail, the detailed knowledge of a corporal, rather hampered him. General Fromm commented in his laconic fashion that a civilian as commander-in-chief might have been better than, of all people, a corporal, moreover one who had never fought in the East and therefore could not conceive the special problems of warfare in this part of the world. Hitler practiced a policy of patchwork of the pettiest sort. Moreover, he labored under the handicap that the nature of any given terrain cannot really be gathered adequately from maps. In the early summer of 1942 he personally ordered the first six of our Tiger tanks to be thrown into battle. As always, when a new weapon was ready, he expected it to turn the tide of battle. He regaled us with vivid descriptions of how the Soviet 7.7cm anti-tank guns, which penetrated our Panzer IV front armor even at sizable distances, would fire shot after shot in vain, and how finally the Tiger would roll over the anti-tank gun nests. His staff remonstrated that the terrain he had chosen made tactical deployment of the tanks impossible because of the marshy subsurface on both sides of the road. Hitler dismissed these objections, not sharply, but with a superior air. And so the first Tiger assault started. Everybody was tensely awaiting the results, and I was rather anxious, wondering whether all would go well technically. There was no opportunity for a technical dress rehearsal. The Russians calmly let the tanks roll past an anti-tank gun position, then fired direct hits at the first and last Tiger. The remaining four thereupon could move neither forward nor backward, nor could they take evasive action to the side because of the swamps, and soon they were also finished off. Hitler silently passed over the debacle, he never referred to it again. The situation in the Western theater of war, at that time still centered in Africa, was taken up next by General Jodl. Here too Hitler tended to intervene in every detail. He was bitterly annoyed with Rommel who would often give extremely unclear bulletins on the day's movements. In other words, he veiled them from headquarters, sometimes for days, only to report an entirely changed situation. Hitler liked Trommel personally but could ill brook this sort of conduct. Properly speaking, Jodler's chief of the Wehrmacht operations staff ought to have coordinated the actions in the various theaters of war. But Hitler had claimed this task for himself, although he did not actually perform it. Basically, Jodl had no clearly defined field of activity. 
but in order to have something to do, his staff assumed independent leadership in certain theatres, so that in the end two rival general staffs existed for the army. Hitler acted as arbitrator between them in keeping with that principle of divisiveness he favoured. The more critical the situation became, the more vehemently the two rival staffs fought over the shifting of divisions from east to west and vice versa. Once the army situation had been discussed, reports of the events of the last 24 hours in the air situation and the naval situation as these areas were designated, were reviewed, usually by the liaison officer or the adjutant for this branch of the services, rarely by the commander himself. Attacks on England, the bombings of German cities, were reported briefly, as were the latest accomplishments in submarine warfare. On questions of air and naval warfare Hitler left his commanders in chief the broadest freedom of choice. At least at that period he rarely intervened, and then only in an advisory capacity. Toward the end of the conference Key Eitel presented Hitler with various documents for signature. Usually these were the partly sneered at, partly dreaded covering orders in other words, orders intended to cover him or someone else against subsequent reprimands from Hitler. At the time I call this procedure an outrageous abuse of Hitler's signature, since it often meant that altogether incompatible ideas and plans were thereby given the form of orders, creating a confusing and impenetrable thicket of contradictions. The presence of so large a company in the relatively small space made the air stale, which quickly tired me as well as most of the others. A ventilation system had been installed, but Hitler thought it produced excessive pressure which resulted in headaches and a feeling of giddiness. Therefore it was switched on only before and after the situation conference. Even in the finest weather the window usually remained closed, and even by day the curtains were drawn. These conditions created an extremely sultry atmosphere. I had expected respectful silence during these situation conferences and was therefore surprised that the officers who did not happen to be participating in a report talked together freely, though in low voices. Frequently, the officers, showing no further consideration for Hitler's presence, would take seats in the group of chairs at the back of the room. The many marginal conversations created a constant murmur that would have made me nervous. But it disturbed Hitler only when the side conversations grew too excited and too loud. When he raised his head disapprovingly, however, the noise immediately subsided. From about the autumn of 1942 on, it became almost impossible to oppose Hitler on important questions, unless one went about it very cautiously. Outsiders had a better chance to present objections, Hitler would not stand for them from the group which constituted his daily entourage. Whenever he himself was trying to convince someone, he went far afield and tried as long as possible to keep the discussion on the plane of generalities. He would hardly allow the other person to say a word. If a controversial point rose in the course of the discussion, Hitler usually evaded it skillfully postponing clarification of it to a subsequent conference. He proceeded on the assumption that military men were shy about giving in on points in front of their staff officers. Probably he also expected his aura and his persuasiveness to operate better in a face-to-face -face discussion with an individual. Both these elements came across poorly over the telephone. Probably that was why Hitler always showed a distinct dislike for conducting important arguments on the telephone. In the late evening hours there was a further situation conference in which a younger general staff officer reported on the developments of the last few hours. Hitler would sit alone with the officer. If I had dined with Hitler, he sometimes took me along to these reports. Undoubtedly he found these occasions far more relaxing than the main situation conference, and the atmosphere and tone would be considerably less formal. Hitler's entourage certainly bore a measure of the blame for his growing belief in his superhuman abilities. Early in the game, Field Marshal Blomberg, Hitler's first and last Minister of War, had been overfond of praising Hitler's surpassing strategic genius. Even a more restrained and modest personality than Hitler ever was would have been in danger of losing all standards of self-criticism under such a constant torrent of applause. In keeping with his character, 
Hitler gladly sought advice from persons who saw the situation even more optimistically and delusively than he himself. Key Eitel was often one of those. When the majority of the officers would greet Hitler's decisions with marked silence, Key Eitel would frequently feel called upon to speak up in favor of the measure. Constantly in Hitler's presence, he had completely succumbed to his influence. From an honorable, solidly respectable general he had developed in the course of years into a servile flatterer with all the wrong instincts. Basically, Key Eitel hated his own weakness, but the hopelessness of any dispute with Hitler had ultimately brought him to the point of not even trying to form his own opinion. If, however, he had offered resistance and stubbornly insisted on a view of his own, he would merely have been replaced by another Key Eitel. In 1943-44 Wenchmunt, Hitler's chief adjutant and army personnel chief, tried, along with many others, to replace Key Eitel by the much more vigorous Field Marshal Kesselring, Hitler said that he could not do without Key Eitel because the man was loyal as a dog to him. Perhaps Key Eitel embodied most precisely the type of person Hitler needed in his entourage. General Jodl, too, rarely contradicted Hitler openly. He proceeded diplomatically. Usually he did not express his thoughts at once, thus skirting difficult situations. Later he would persuade Hitler to yield, or even to reverse decisions already taken. His occasional deprecatory remarks about Hitler showed that he had preserved a relatively unbiased view. Key Eitel's subordinates, such as, for example, his deputy general Wallemont, could not be more courageous than their superior, for Key Eitel would not stand up for them against Hitler's ire. Occasionally they tried to counter the effects of obviously absurd orders by adding little clauses that Hitler did not understand. Under the leadership of a man so submissive and irresolute as Key Eitel, the high command often had to look for all sorts of crooked paths in order to arrive at its goals. The subjugation of the generals might also be laid in part to their state of permanent fatigue. Hitler's work routine intersected the normal daily routine of the high command. As a result, the generals often went without regular sleep. Such purely physical strains probably affect events more than is generally assumed, especially when high performance over a protracted span of time is required. In private associations, too, Key Eitel and Jodl gave the impression of being exhausted, burned out. In order to break through this ring of hollow men, I hoped to place in addition to from, my friend Field Marshal Milch within the Fras headquarters. I had taken him with me to headquarters several times, supposedly in order to report on activities of central planning. A few times all went well and Milch was gaining ground with his plan of concentrating on the fighter plane program instead of the proposed fleet of big bombers. But then Goering forbade him to pay any further visits to headquarters. Goering too gave the impression of a worn out man at the end of 1942, when I sat with him in the pavilion that had been built especially for his brief stays at headquarters. Goering still had comfortable chairs, not the Spartan furnishings of Hitler's bunker office. Depressed, the Rye Marshal said, we will have reason to be glad if Germany can keep the boundaries of 1933 after the war. He quickly tried to cover up this remark by adding a few confident banalities, but I had the impression that in spite of the bluffness he put on, he saw defeat coming closer. After his arrival at the Fras headquarters, Goering usually withdrew to his pavilion for a few minutes while General Bodenschkatz, his liaison officer to Hitler, left the situation conference in order to brief Goering by telephone, so we suspected, on certain disputed questions. Fifteen minutes later, Goering would enter the situation conference. Of his own accord he would emphatically advocate exactly the viewpoint that Hitler wished to put across against the opposition of his generals. Hitler would then look around at his entourage, you see, the Rye Marshal holds exactly the same opinion as I do. On the afternoon of November 7, 1942, I accompanied Hitler to Munich in his special train. These journeys were a favorable occasion to draw Hitler into the necessary but time-consuming consideration of general armaments questions. This special train was equipped with radio, teletype machines, 
and a telephone switchboard. Jodland some members of the general staff had joined Hitler. The atmosphere was dense. We were already many hours late, for at every sizable station a prolonged stop was made in order to connect the telephone cable with the railroad telegraph system, so we could get the latest reports. From early morning on a mighty armada of transports, accompanied by large naval units, had been passing through the Strait of Gibraltar into the Mediterranean. In earlier years Hitler had made a habit of showing himself at the window of his special train whenever it stopped. Now these encounters with the outside world seemed undesirable to him, instead, the shades on the station side of the train would be lowered. Later in the evening we sat with Hitler in his rosewood panelled dining car. The table was elegantly set with silver flatware, cut glass, good china, and flower arrangements. As we began our ample meal, none of us at first saw that a freight train was stopped on the adjacent track. From the cattle car bedraggled, starved, and in some cases wounded German soldiers, just returning from the east, stared at the diners. With a start, Hitler noticed the somber scene two yards from his window. Without as much as a gesture of greeting in their direction, he peremptorily ordered his servant to draw the shades. This, then, in the second half of the war, was how Hitler handled a meeting with ordinary frontline soldiers such as he himself had once been. At every station along the way the number of reported naval units rose. An enterprise of vast proportions was obviously afoot. Finally the units passed through the strait. All the ships reported by our air reconnaissance were now moving eastward in the Mediterranean. This is the largest landing operation that has ever taken place in the history of the world, Hitler declared in a tone of respect, perhaps taking pride that he was the cause of enterprises of such magnitude. Until the following morning the landing fleet remained north of the Moroccan and Algerian coast. In the course of the night Hitler proposed several different explanations for this mysterious behavior. He thought the most probable thing was that the enemy was undertaking a great supply operation to reinforce the offensive against the hard-pressed Africa Corps. The naval units were keeping together in this way, he concluded, in order to advance through the narrow strait between Sicily and Africa under cover of darkness, safe from German air attacks. Or else, and this second version corresponded more to his feeling for perilous military operations. The enemy will land in central Italy tonight. That he would meet with no resistance at all. There are no German troops there, and the Italians will run away. That way they can cut northern Italy off from the south. What will become of Rommel in that case? He would be lost in a short time. He has no reserves and supplies will no longer come through. Hitler intoxicated himself with thoughts of far reaching operations, of a kind he had long been missing. He more and more put himself into the position of the enemy, I would occupy Rome at once and form a new Italian government. Or, and this would be the third possibility, I would use this great fleet to land in southern France. We have always been too gentle. And now this is what we get for it. No fortifications and no German troops at all down there. A great mistake that we have nothing garrisoned there. The Pétain government won't put up a bit of resistance. Of course. From moment to moment he seemed to forget that these forces were gathering against himself. Hitler's guesses were wide of the mark. It would never have occurred to him not to associate such a landing operation with a coup. To put the troops on land in safe positions from which they could methodically spread out, to take no unnecessary risks, that was a strategy alien to his nature. But that night he clearly realized one thing. Now the second front was beginning to be a reality. By the next day the Allied troops were pouring ashore in North Africa. Nevertheless, Hitler went ahead with his speech in commemoration of his failed putsch of 1923.1 Still remember how shocked we all were when, instead of at least referring to the gravity of the situation and calling for a mustering of energies, he adopted his usual victory is certain tone, they've already become idiots. He digressed about our enemy, whose operations had only yesterday called forth his homage, if they think that they can ever shatter Germany. We will not fall, 
consequently, the others will fall. In the late autumn of 1942, Hitler triumphantly stated in the course of a situation conference, now the Russians are sending their cadets into the struggle. For that's the surest proof they have reached the end. A country sacrifices the next generation of officers only when it has nothing left. A few weeks later, on November 19, 1942, the first reports of the Great Russian Winter Offensive reached Hitler, who had withdrawn to Ober Salzburg days before. The offensive, which nine weeks later was to lead to the capitulation of Stalingrad, 5 began near Serafinov. There, after violent artillery preparations, strong Soviet forces had broken through the positions of Romanian divisions. Hitler tried at first to explain and belittle this disaster by making slurring remarks on the fighting qualities of his allies. But shortly afterward the Soviet troops began overwhelming German divisions as well. The front was beginning to crumble. Hitler paced back and forth in the Great Hall of the Berghof. Our generals are making their old mistakes again. They always overestimate the strength of the Russians. According to all the frontline reports, the enemy's human material is no longer sufficient. They are weakened, they have lost far too much blood. But of course nobody wants to accept such reports. Besides, how badly Russian officers are trained. No offensive can be organized with such officers. We know what it takes. In the short or long run the Russians will simply come to a halt. They'll run down. Meanwhile we shall throw in a few fresh divisions, that will put things right. In the peaceful atmosphere of the Berghof he simply did not understand what was brewing. But three days later, when the bad news kept pouring in, he rushed back to East Prussia. A few days afterward at Rasenberg the strategic map showed the area from Voronez to Stalingrad covered with red arrows across a front 125 miles wide. These represented the thrust of the Soviet troops. Among all the arrows were small blue circles, pockets of resistance by the remnants of German and Allied divisions. Stalingrad was already surrounded by red rings. Disturbed, Hitler now commanded units to be detached from all other sectors of the front and from the occupied territories and dispatched in all haste to the southern sector. No operational reserve was available, although General Zietzler had pointed out long before the emergency that each of the divisions in southern Russia had to defend a frontal sector of unusual length and would not be able to cope with a vigorous assault by Soviet troops. Establishing the new line of defense, or El Stalingrad Tirak Rivenme Icop, meant that the troops had to defend a line 2.3 times longer than the Orl Black Sea position taken in the spring. Stalingrad was encircled. Zietzler, his face flushed and haggard from lack of sleep, insisted that the Sixth Army must break out to the west. He deluged Hitler with data on all that the army lacked, both as regards to rations and fuel, so that it had become impossible to provide warm meals for the soldiers exposed to fierce cold in the snow-swept fields or the scanty shelter of ruins. Hitler remained calm, unmoved and deliberate, as if bent on showing that Zietzler's agitation was a psychotic reaction in the face of danger. The counterattack from the south that I have ordered will soon relieve Stalingrad. That will recoup the situation. We have been in such positions often before, you know. In the end we always had the problem in hand again. He gave orders for supply trains to be dispatched right behind the troops deploying for the counter-offensive, so that as soon as Stalingrad was relieved something could at once be done about alleviating the plight of the soldiers. Zietzler disagreed, and Hitler let him talk without interrupting. The forces provided for the counter-attack were too weak, Zietzler said. But if they could unite successfully with a sixth army that had broken out to the west, they would then be able to establish a new positions farther to the south. Hitler offered counter-arguments, but Zietzler held to his view. Finally, after the discussion had gone on for more than half an hour, Hitler's patience snapped, Stalingrad simply must be held. It must be, it is a key position. By breaking traffic on the Volga at that spot, we cause the Russians the greatest difficulties. 
How are they going to transport their grain from southern Russia to the north? That did not sound convincing, I had the feeling, rather, that Stalingrad was a symbol for him. But for the time being the discussion ended after this dispute. Next day the situation had worsened. Zietzler's pleas had grown even more urgent, the atmosphere in the situation conference was somber, and even Hitler looked exhausted and downcast. Once he too spoke of a breakout. Once more he asked for figures on how many tons of supplies were needed daily to maintain the fighting strength of over 200,000 soldiers. Twenty-four hours later the fate of the encircled army was finally sealed. Figuring appeared in the situation room, brisk and beaming like an operetta tenor who is supposed to portray a victorious Rye Marshal. Depressed, with a beseeching note in his voice, Hitler asks him, what about supplying Stalingrad by air? Goering snapped to attention and declared solemnly, my leader. I personally guarantee the supplying of Stalingrad by air. You can rely on that. As I later heard from Milch, the Air Force General Staff had in fact calculated that supplying the pocket was impossible. Zietzler, too, instantly voiced his doubts. But Goering retorted that it was exclusively the business of the Air Force to undertake the necessary calculations. Hitler, who could be so pedantic about erecting edifices of figures, on this day did not even ask for an accounting of how the necessary planes could be made available. He had revived at Goering's mere words, and had recovered his old staunchness. Then Stalingrad can be held. It is foolish to go on talking any more about a breakout of the Sixth Army. It would lose all its heavy weapons and have no fighting strength left. The Sixth Army remains in Stalingrad. Later experience with battles fought in winter by the retreating armies belies Hitler's theory, since adopted by some historians, that the Stalingrad pocket served its purpose because it tied up the Soviet forces for eight weeks. Although Goering knew that the fate of the army encircled in Stalingrad hung on his promise, on December 12, 1942,6 he issued invitations to his subordinates to attend a festive performance of Richard Wagner's Die Meistersinger to celebrate the reopening of the destroyed Berlin State Opera House. In gala uniforms or full dress we took our seats in the Fra's big box. The jovial plot of the opera painfully contrasted with the events at the front, so that I kept chiding myself for having accepted the invitation. A few days later I was back at the Fra's headquarters. Zietzilla was now giving a daily report on the tons of rations and munitions the 6th Army was receiving by air. They came to only a fraction of the promised quantities. Gering, repeatedly called to account by Hitler, had excuses, the weather was bad, fog, freezing rain, or snowstorms had so far prevented commitment of as many planes as planned. But as soon as the weather changed, Goering said, he would be able to deliver the promised tonnage. Thereupon, food rations had to be reduced still further in Stalingrad. Zietzler conspicuously had himself served the same rations in the general staff casino, and visibly lost weight. After a few days of this Hitler informed him that he considered it improper for a chief of staff to wear out his nerves with such demonstrations of solidarity with the troops. He commanded Zietzler to resume at once taking sufficient nourishment. However, for a few weeks Hitler prohibited the serving of champagne and cognac. The mood became blacker and blacker. Faces froze into masks. Often we stood about in silence. No one wanted to talk about the gradual destruction of what had been, only a few months before, a victorious army. But Hitler went on hoping, he was still hoping when I once more was at headquarters from January 2nd to 7. The counterattack he had ordered, which was supposed to break the ring around Stalingrad and bring fresh supplies to the dying army, had failed two weeks before. The sole remaining hope, and that a faint one, lay in a decision to evacuate the pocket. One day, while I waited outside the situation room, I heard Zietzler urging Key Eitel, literally begging him, on this day at least to support him in persuading Hitler to give the order for evacuation. This was the last moment to avert a fearful catastrophe, Zietzler said. 
Kiitel emphatically agreed and solemnly promised Zietzler that he would help as requested. But at the situation conference, when Hitler once again stressed the necessity of holding out in Stalingrad, Kiitel strode emotionally toward him, pointed to the map, where a small remnant of the city was surrounded by thick red rings, and declared, Mein Führer, we will hold that. In this helpless situation, on January 15, 1943, Hitler signed a special decree giving Field Marshal Milch the power to take all measures in the Air Force and the civilian air fleet that he considered necessary for supplying Stalingrad, without asking Goering's permission. Milch directed this operation from the Air Force headquarters south of Stalingrad. He was able to increase the flights to Stalingrad appreciably, so that at least some of the wounded could be evacuated. After performing his mission, Milch was received by Hitler. Their conversation ended in a violent clash over the desperate military situation, whose seriousness Hitler still refused to acknowledge. At the time I telephoned Milch several times, for he had promised me to rescue my brother, who was caught with the rest of the encircled troops in Stalingrad. In the general confusion, however, it proved impossible to locate him. Desperate letters came from him. He had jaundice and swollen limbs, was taken to a field hospital, but could not endure conditions there and dragged himself back to his comrades at an artillery observation post. After that nothing more was heard from him. What my parents and I went through was repeated by hundreds of thousands of families who for a time continued to receive airmail letters from the encircled city, until it was all over. Hitler could not have blocked delivery of these letters without causing wild rumors. But when the Soviet army allowed German prisoners to send home postcards, Hitler ordered the cards destroyed. Because they were a sign of life from the relatives, they might have mitigated the Russophobia that was being so carefully cultivated by Hitler's propaganda apparatus. Fritz told me about this at Nuremberg. In the future Hitler never said another word about the catastrophe for which he and Goering were alone responsible. Instead, he commanded the immediate formation of a new Sixth Army which was supposed to restore the glory of the doomed one. A year and a half later, in the middle of August 1944, it too was encircled by the Russians and annihilated. Our enemies rightly regarded this disaster at Stalingrad as a turning point in the war. But at Hitler's headquarters the only reaction was a temporary numbness followed by a rush of feverish staff work in which the most trivial details were threshed over. Hitler began conceiving plans for new victories in 1943. The top leadership of the Reich, already torn by dissension and filled with envy and jealousy, did not close ranks in the face of the peril that was almost upon us. On the contrary, in that den of intrigue which Hitler had created by splitting all the centers of power, the gamblers began playing for higher stakes than ever before. 18. Intrigues. In the winter of 1942, during the Stalingrad crisis, Bormann, Kiitel, and Lammers decided to close their own ring around Hitler more tightly. Henceforth, all orders to be signed by the chief of state had to be cleared through these three men. This would supposedly prevent the unconsidered signing of decrees and therefore put a stop to the command confusion caused by this practice. Hitler was content so long as he retained the final decision. Henceforth, the divergent views of various branches of government would be sifted by this committee of three. In accepting this arrangement Hitler counted on objective presentation and a non-partisan method of working. The three-man committee divided up its jurisdictions. Kiitel, who was to be in charge of all orders relating to the armed forces, came to grief right from the start, since the commanders-in-chief of the Air Force and the Navy utterly refused to accept his authority. All changes in the powers of the ministries, all constitutional affairs, and all administrative questions were supposed to go through Lammers. As it turned out, however, he had to leave these decisions more and more to Bormann, since he himself had little access to Hitler. Bormann had reserved the field of domestic policy for himself. But he not only lacked the intelligence for these matters, he also had insufficient knowledge of the outside world. For more than eight years he had been little more than Hitler's shadow. 
he had never dared go on any lengthy business trips, or even to allow himself a vacation, for fear that his influence might diminish. From his own days as Hess's deputy, Bormann knew the perils of ambitious deputies. For Hitler was all too ready to treat the second men in an organization, as soon as they were presented to him, as members of his staff and to make assignments directly to them. This quirk accorded with his tendency to divide power wherever he encountered it. Moreover, he loved to see new faces, to try out new persons. In order to avoid raising up such a rival in his own household, many a minister took care not to appoint an intelligent and vigorous deputy. The plan of these three men to surround Hitler, to filter his information and thus control his power, might have led to an abridgment of Hitler's one-man rule, had the committee of three consisted of men possessing initiative, imagination, and a sense of responsibility. But since they had been trained always to act in Hitler's name, they slavishly depended on the expressions of his will. What is more, Hitler soon stopped abiding by this regulation. It became a nuisance to him, and was, moreover, contrary to his temperament. But it is understandable that those who stood outside this ring resented its stranglehold. In fact Bormann was now assuming a role which could be dangerous to the top functionaries. He alone, with Hitler's compliance, drew up the appointments calendar, which meant that he decided which civilian members of the government or party could see, or more important, could not see, the Fra. By now, hardly any of the ministers, Reichsliters, or Gauliters could penetrate to Hitler. They all had to ask Bormann to present their programs to him. Bormann was very efficient. Usually the official in question received an answer in writing within a few days, whereas in the past he would have had to wait for months. I was one of the exceptions to this rule. Since my sphere was military in nature, I had access to Hitler whenever I wished. Hitler's military adjutants were the ones who set up my appointments. After my conferences with Hitler, it sometimes happened that the adjutant would announce Bormann who would then come into the room carrying his files. In a few sentences he would report on the memoranda sent to him. He spoke monotonously and with seeming objectivity and would then advance his own solution. Usually Hitler merely nodded and spoke his terse, agreed. On the basis of this one word, or even a vague comment by Hitler, which was hardly meant as a directive, Bormann would often draft lengthy instructions. In this way ten or more important decisions were sometimes made within half an hour. De facto, Bormann was conducting the internal affairs of the Reich. A few months afterward, on April 12, 1943, Bormann obtained Hitler's signature to a seemingly unimportant piece of paper. He became secretary to the Führer, Whereas previously his powers, strictly speaking, should have been restricted to party affairs. This new position now authorized him to act officially in any field he wished. After my first major achievements in the field of armaments, Goebbels's hostility toward me, apparent ever since his affair with Leda Barova, gave way to goodwill. In the summer of 1942, I had asked him to put his propaganda apparatus to work to speed armaments production. Newsreels, picture magazines and newspapers were required to publish articles on the subject. My prestige rose. Thanks to this directive by the propaganda minister, I became one of the best known personages in the Reich. This improvement in my status in its turn was useful to my associates in their daily bouts with government and party bureaus. All of Goebbels's speeches sounded the note of stereotyped fanaticism but it would be quite wrong to think of him as a hot-blooded man seething with temperament. Goebbels was a hard worker and something of a martinet about the way his ideas were carried out. But he never let the minutiae make him lose sight of the whole situation. He had the gift of abstracting problems from their surrounding circumstances so that, as it seemed to me then, he could arrive at objective judgments. I was impressed by his cynicism but also by the logical arrangement of his ideas, which revealed his university training. Toward Hitler, however, he seemed extremely constrained. During the first, successful phase of the war, 
Goebbels had shown no signs of ambition. On the contrary, as early as 1940 he expressed his intention of devoting himself to his many personal interests once the war was brought to a victorious conclusion. It would then be time for the next generation to assume responsibility, he would say. In December 1942 the disastrous course of affairs prompted him to invite three of his colleagues to call on him more often, Wall the Funk, Robert Lee, and myself. The choice was typical of Goebbels, for we were all men of academic background, university graduates. Stalingrad had shaken us, not only the tragedy of the Sixth Army soldiers, but even more, perhaps, the question of how such a disaster could have taken place under Hitler's orders. For hitherto there had always been a success to offset every setback, hitherto there had been a new triumph to compensate for all losses or at least make everyone forget them. Now for the first time we had suffered a defeat for which there was no compensation. In one of our discussions at the beginning of 1943, Goebbels made the point that we had had great military successes at the beginning of the war while taking only half measures inside the Reich. Consequently, we had thought we could go on being victorious without great efforts. The British, on the other hand, had been lucky or in that Dunkirk had taken place right at the beginning of the war. This defeat had made them aware of the need to tighten up on the civilian economy. Now Stalingrad was our Dunkirk. The war could no longer be won simply by engendering confidence. In speaking this way Goebbels was referring to the information he had from his band of correspondents concerning the uneasiness and dissatisfaction among the populace. The public was actually demanding a ban on all luxuries, which did not help the national struggle. In general, Goebbels said, he could sense a great readiness among the people to exert themselves to the utmost. In fact, Significant restrictions were a real necessity if only to revive popular confidence in the leadership. From the viewpoint of armaments, considerable sacrifices were certainly required. Hitler had demanded a step up in production. What was more, in order to compensate for the tremendous casualties on the Eastern Front, 800,000 of the younger skilled workers were going to be drafted. One every subtraction of the German labor force would add to the difficulties all our factories were encountering. On the other hand, the air raids had shown that life could continue on an orderly basis in the severely affected cities. Tax revenues, for instance, went on being paid even after bombs falling on Treasury offices had destroyed the documents. Taking my cue directly from the principle of self-responsibility in industry, I formulated a program which would substitute trust for distrust toward the populace and allow us to trim our supervisory and administrative agencies, which alone employed nearly three million persons. We considered ways in which the taxpayers could be made responsible for their own declarations, or the feasibility of not reassessing liability at all, or for withholding taxes from the payrolls. Given the billions being spent on the war every month, Goebbels and I argued, what did it matter if a few hundred millions were lost to the government due to the dishonesty of some individuals? A considerably greater stir was created by my demands that the working time of all government officials be extended to match the hours of armaments workers. That alone, in purely arithmetical terms would have freed some 200,000 administrative people for armaments work. Furthermore, I wanted to release several hundreds of thousands of workers by a drastic cut in the living standard of the upper classes. At a meeting of central planning, I made no attempt to gloss over the effect my radical proposals would have on the German scene, this means that for the duration of the war, if it goes on for a long time, we shall be, to put it crudely, proletarianized. To today, I am glad that my plan did not win acceptance. Had it, Germany would have faced the extraordinary burdens of the early post-war months economically even more weakened and administratively more disorganized. But I am also convinced that in England, for example, had she been facing the same situation, such proposals would have been consistently carried out. We had a hard time persuading a hesitant Hitler that certain austerities were essential, that the administrative apparatus had to be enormously simplified, consumption checked, and cultural activities restricted. 
but my proposal that Goebbels handle all this was thwarted by an alert Bormann, who feared an increase in power on the part of this rival. Instead of Goebbels, Dr. Lammers, Bormann's ally in the Committee of Three, was assigned the task. He was a government official without initiative or imagination whose hair stood on end at the thought of such disregard for the sacred bureaucratic procedures. It was also Lammers who from January 1943 on presided over the cabinet meetings, which were then resumed, in Hitler's stead. Not all members of the cabinet were invited, only those who were concerned with the subjects on the agenda. But the meeting place, the cabinet room, showed what power the committee of three had acquired or at any rate intended to acquire. These meetings turned out quite heated. Goebbels and Funk supported my radical views. Minister of the Interior Frick, as well as Lammers himself, raised the anticipated doubts. Sorkel maintained that he could provide any number of workers requested of him, including skilled personnel, from abroad. Three, even when Goebbels demanded that leading party members forego their previous, almost limitless luxuries, he could change nothing. And Eva Braun, ordinarily so unassuming, had no sooner heard of a proposed ban on permanent waves as well as the end of cosmetic production when she rushed to Hitler in high indignation. Hitler at once showed uncertainty. He advised me that instead of an outright ban I quietly stop production of hair dyes and other items necessary for beauty culture, as well as cessation of repairs upon apparatus for producing permanent waves. Even Goebbels wavered on the question of cosmetics, a whole series of individual points are still being debated, by the public, especially the question of feminine beauty care. Perhaps in this case we ought to be somewhat more lenient. Diary entry for March 12, 1943, Hitler's recommendation may be found in the Fuqua Protocol, April 25, 1943, point 14. After a few meetings in the Chancellery it was clear to Goebbels and me that armaments production would receive no spur from Bormann, Lammers, or Keitel. Our efforts had bogged down in meaningless details. On February 18, 1943, Goebbels delivered his speech in the Sportpalast on total war. It was not only directed to the population, it was obliquely addressed to the leadership which had ignored all our proposals for a radical commitment of domestic reserves. Basically, it was an attempt to place slammers and all the other dawdlers under the pressure of the mob. Except for Hitler's most successful public meetings, I had never seen an audience so effectively roused to fanaticism. Back in his home, Goebbels astonished me by analyzing what had seemed to be a purely emotional outburst in terms of its psychological effects, much as an experienced actor might have done. He was also satisfied with his audience that evening. Did you notice? They reacted to the smallest nuance and applauded at just the right moments. It was the politically best trained audience you can find in Germany. This particular crowd had been rounded up out of the party organizations. Among those present were popular intellectuals and actors like Heinrich George whose applause was caught by the newsreel cameras for the benefit of the wider public. But this speech by Goebbels also had a foreign policy aspect. It was one of several attempts to supplement Hitler's purely military approach by introducing politics. Goebbels at any rate thought that he was also pleading with the West to remember the danger which threatened all of Europe from the East. A few days later he expressed great satisfaction that the Western press had commented favorably upon these very sentences. At the time, as a matter of fact, Goebbels seemed interested in becoming foreign minister. With all the eloquence at his command he tried to turn Hitler against Ribbentrop and for a while seemed to be succeeding. At least Hitler listened in silence to his arguments, without shifting the conversation to a less unpleasant subject as was his habit. Goebbels already thought the game was won when Hitler unexpectedly began praising Ribbentrop's excellent work and his talent for negotiations with Germany's allies. He concluded finally with the remarkable statement, you're altogether wrong about Ribbentrop. He is one of the greatest men we have, and history will someday place him above Bismarck. He is greater than Bismarck. Along with this, Hitler forbade Goebbels to extend any more feelers toward the West, 
as he had done in his sport last speech. Nevertheless, Goebbels's speech on total war was followed up by a gesture which was roundly applauded by the public, he had Berlin's luxury restaurants and expensive places of amusement closed. Goering, to be sure, promptly interposed his bulk to protect his favorite restaurant, Horcher's. But when subsequently some demonstrators, set on by Goebbels, appeared at the restaurant and smashed the windows, Goering yielded. The result was a serious rift between him and Goebbels. On the evening after the speech in the sport palast mentioned above, many prominent persons assembled in the palatial residence that Goebbels had built shortly before the beginning of the war near the Brandenburg Gate. Among those present were Field Marshal Melch, Minister of Justice Thyrak, State Secretary Stuckart of the Ministry of the Interior, Goering's right hand man, State Secretary Corner, and Funkendly. For the first time a motion proposed by Milch and myself was discussed, to use Goering's powers as chairman of the Council of Ministers for the defense of the Reich in order to stiffen the home front. Nine days later Goebbels invited me to his home again, together with Funkendly. The huge building with its rich appointments now gave a gloomy appearance. In order to provide a good example of acting in the spirit of total war, Goebbels had had the large public rooms closed and most of the electric bulbs removed in the remaining halls and rooms. We were asked into one of the smaller rooms, perhaps 450 square feet in area. Servants in livery served French cognac and tea, then Goebbels signaled to them to leave us undisturbed. Things cannot go on this way, he began. Here we are sitting in Berlin. Hitler does not hear what we have to say about the situation. I cannot influence him politically, cannot even report the most urgent measures in my area. Everything goes through Bormann. Hitler must be persuaded to come to Berlin more often. Domestic policy, Goebbels continued, had slipped entirely out of Hitler's hands. It was being controlled by Bormann, who managed to give Hitler the feeling that he was still directing things. Bormann, Goebbels said further, was guided only by ambition, with his rigidly doctrinaire approach, he represented a great danger to any sane evolution of policy. First and foremost his influence must be diminished. Altogether contrary to his habit, Goebbels did not even accept Hitler from his critical remarks. We are not having a leadership crisis, but strictly speaking a leader crisis. For to Goebbels, a born politician, it was incomprehensible that Hitler should have abandoned politics, that most important of instruments, in favor of playing a superfluous role as commander-in-chief. The rest of us could only agree, none of us could hold a candle to Goebbels where political instinct was concerned. His criticism showed what Stalingrad really meant. Goebbels had begun to doubt Hitler's star, and hence his victory and we were doubting with him. I repeated the proposal we had made, that Goering be reinstalled in the function that had been intended for him at the beginning of the war. Here was an organizational position equipped with the fullest powers, including the right to issue decrees even without Hitler's collaboration. From this post the power usurped by Bormann and Lammers could be shattered. Bormann and Lammers would have to bow to this existing authority whose potentialities had so far gone untapped because of Goering's indolence. Since Goebbels and Goering were on bad terms because of the Horches restaurant incident, the group asked me to speak with Goering about the matter. The dispute between Goebbels and Goering over the restaurant was resolved as follows, the restaurant remained closed as a public restaurant, but it reopened as a club for the Luftwaffe. The present day reader may well wonder why, when we were making a last effort to rally all our forces, our choice should have fallen on this man who had done nothing but loll about in apathetic luxury for years. Goering had not always been this way, and his reputation of an admittedly violent but also energetic and intelligent person still lingered on from the days when he had built up the Air Force and the Four Year Plan. There seemed a chance that if a task appealed to him he might recover some of his old daring and energy. And if not, we reckoned, then the committee of the Reich Defense Council would in any case constitute an instrument that could make radical decisions. 
Only in retrospect do I realize that stripping Bormann and Lammers of power would hardly have changed the course of events. For the shift in direction we wanted to bring about could not be achieved by overthrowing Hitler's secretaries but solely by turning against Hitler himself. For us, however, that was beyond imagination. Instead, if we had succeeded in restoring our personal positions which were endangered by Bormann, we would presumably have been ready to follow Hitler even more loyally than before, if possible, more so than we actually did under the cowardly Lamas and the scheming Bormann. The fact that we regarded minimal differences as so important merely shows in how closed a world we all moved. This was the first time I emerged from my reserve as a specialist to plunge into political maneuvering. I had always carefully avoided such a step, but the fact that I took it now had a certain logic. I had decided that it was wrong to imagine I could concentrate exclusively upon my specialized work. In an authoritarian system anyone who wants to remain part of the leadership inevitably stumbles into fields of force where political battles are in progress. Goering was staying in his summer house at Obersalzburg. As I learned from Field Marshal Melch, he had deliberately withdrawn there for a rather long vacation because he was offended by Hitler's criticisms of his leadership of the Air Force. I went to see him the day after our meeting, February 28, 1943. He was prepared at once to receive me. The atmosphere of our discussion, which lasted for many hours, was friendly and unconstrained, in keeping with the intimate conditions of the relatively small house. I was astonished, though, by his lacquered fingernails and obviously rouged face, although the oversized ruby brooch on his green velvet dressing gown was already a familiar sight to me. Goering listened quietly to our proposal and to my report of our Berlin conference. As he sat he occasionally scooped a handful of unset gems from his pocket and playfully let them glide through his fingers. It seemed to delight him that we had thought of him. He too saw the danger in the way things were going with Bormann and agreed with our plans. But he was still angry with Goebbels because of the Horcher incident until I finally proposed that he personally invite the propaganda minister here, so that we could thoroughly discuss our plan with him. Goebbels came to Birchtesgaden the very next day. I first informed him of the result of my discussion. Together, we drove to Goering's, where I soon withdrew to let the two men, whose relations had been almost continually strained, have it out. When I was called in again, Goering rubbed his hands with delight at the prospect of the struggle that was about to begin and showed his most engaging side. First of all, he said, the personnel of the Council of Ministers for the Defense of the Rye must be broadened. Goebbels and I ought to become members, the fact that we were not, by the way, indicated that the Council was of little importance. There was also talk about the necessity for replacing Ribbentrop. The foreign minister should be persuading Hitler to adopt a rational policy, but instead he was too much Hitler's mouthpiece to find a political solution for our sorry military predicament. Growing more and more excited, Goebbels continued, the Führer has not seen through Lammers any more than he has seen through Ribbentrop. Goering sprang to his feet. He's always putting in a word edgewise, torpedoing me below the waterline. But that's ending right now. I'm going to see to it, gentlemen. Goebbels was obviously relishing Goering's rage and deliberately trying to spur him on, while at the same time fearing some rash act on the part of the tactically unskilled Rye Marshal. Depend on it, Herr Goering, we are going to open the Führer's eyes about Bormann and Lammers. Only we mustn't risk going too far. We'll have to proceed slowly. You know the Führer. His caution increased as he spoke. At any rate we had better not talk too openly with the other members of the Council of Ministers. There's no need for them to know that we intend to slowly spike the Committee of Three. We're simply acting out of loyalty to the Führer. We have no personal ambitions. But if each one of us supports the others to the Führer we'll soon be on top of the situation and can form a solid fence around the Führer. Goebbels was highly pleased by the time he left. This is going to work he said to me. Goering has really come to life again, don't you think? I too had not seen Goering so dynamic and bold in recent years. 
On a long walk in the peaceful vicinity of Ober Salzburg, Goering and I discussed the course Bormann had taken. Goering maintained that Bormann was aiming at nothing less than the succession to Hitler, and that he would stop at nothing to outmaneuver him, Goering, in fact, all of us, in influencing Hitler. I took occasion to tell Goering how Bormann seized every opportunity to undermine the Reich Marshal's prestige. Goering listened with mounting feeling as I spoke of the tea times with Hitler at Ober Salzburg, from which Goering was excluded. There I had been able to observe Bormann's tactics at close vantage. He never worked by direct attack, I said. Instead, he would weave little incidents into his conversation which were effective only in their sum. Thus, for example, in the course of the tea time chatter Bormann would tell unfavorable anecdotes from Vienna in order to damage Baldur von Skirak, the Hitler youth leader. But Bormann carefully avoided agreeing with Hitler's subsequent negative remarks. On the contrary, he thought it prudent to praise Skirak afterward, the kind of praise, of course, which would leave an unpleasant aftertaste. After about a year of this sort of thing Bormann had brought Hitler to the point of disliking Skirak and often feeling outright hostility toward him. Then, when Hitler was not around, Bormann could venture to go a step further. With an air of casually dismissing the matter but in reality annihilating the man, he would remark contemptuously that of course Skirak belonged in Vienna since everybody there was always intriguing against everybody else. Bormann would be playing the same sort of game against Goering, I added in conclusion. The trouble was that Goering was an easy mark for this sort of thing. In the course of these days at Ober Salzburg, Goebbels himself spoke somewhat apologetically of the Baroque garment Goering favored which did seem rather comical to anyone who did not know the Reich Marshal. And then Goering continued to comport himself with sovereign dignity, forgetful of his failures as commander-in-chief of the Air Force. Much later, in the spring of 1945, when Hitler publicly insulted his Reich Marshal in the most cutting manner before all the participants in the Situation Conference, Goering remarked to below, Hitler's Air Force adjutant, Speer was right when he warned me. Now Bormann has succeeded. Goering was mistaken. Bormann had already done his work by the spring of 1943. A few days later, on March 5, 1943, I flew to headquarters to obtain several decisions on armaments questions from Hitler. My chief purpose, however, was to promote our little plot. I found it easy to persuade Hitler to invite Goebbels to headquarters. Things were especially dreary, and he looked forward to a visit from the sprightly, clever propaganda minister. Three days later Goebbels arrived at headquarters. He first took me aside. What is the Führer's mood? Herr Speer? he asked. I had to tell him that Hitler was not feeling particularly warm toward Goering at this juncture and advised restraint. It would probably be better not to press the matter right now, I thought. Consequently, after briefly feeling my way, I had done nothing further. Goebbels agreed, you're probably right. At the moment we had better not mention Goering to the Führer. That would spoil everything. The mass to lied air aids, which had been going on for weeks and meeting almost no opposition, had further weakened Goering's already imperiled position. If Goering's name was as much as mentioned, Hitler would start fuming at the mistakes and omissions in the planning for air warfare. That very day Hitler had repeatedly exclaimed that if the bombings went on not only would the cities be destroyed, but the morale of the people would crack irreparably. Hitler was succumbing to the same error as the British strategists on the other side who were ordering mass bombing. Hitler invited Goebbels and me to lunch. Oddly enough, on such occasions he refrained from asking Bormann, who was otherwise indispensable, to join him. In this respect he treated Bormann entirely as a secretary. Enlivened by Goebbels, Hitler became considerably more talkative than I was accustomed to seeing him on my visits to headquarters. He used the opportunity to unburden his mind and as usual made disparaging remarks about almost all of his associates except those of us who were present. After the meal I was dismissed, and Hitler spent several hours alone with Goebbels, 
The fact that Hitler courteously and amicably showed me out corresponded with his way of sharply separating individuals and areas. I did not return until it was time for the military situation conference. At supper we met again, this time all three of us. Hitler had a fire made in the fireplace, the orderly brought us a bottle of wine, and for Kanja mineral water for Hitler. We sat up until early morning in a relaxed, almost cozy atmosphere. I did not have a chance to say much, for Goebbels knew how to entertain Hitler, he spoke brilliantly, in polished phrases, with irony at the right place and admiration where Hitler expected it, with sentimentality when the moment and the subject required it, with gossip and love affairs. He mixed everything in a masterly brew, theatre, movies, and old times. But Hitler also listened with eager interest as always, to a detailed account of the children of the Goebbels family. Their childish remarks, their favorite games, their frequently pungent comments, distracted Hitler from his cares that night. By recalling earlier periods of difficulty which one way or another had been overcome, Goebbels contrived to strengthen Hitler's self-assurance and to flatter his vanity, which the sober tone of the military men hardly pampered. Hitler, for his part, reciprocated by magnifying his propaganda minister's achievements and thus giving him cause for pride. In general the leaders of the Third Reich were fond of mutual praise and were continually reassuring one another. In spite of certain qualms, Goebbels and I had agreed beforehand that somewhere in the course of the evening we would bring up our plans for activating the Council of Ministers for the Defense of the Reich, or at least drop some hints about it. The atmosphere certainly seemed favorable, though there was always the danger that Hitler might take such suggestions as a criticism of the way he was running things, when suddenly they said that the fireplace was interrupted by the report of a heavy air raid on Nuremberg. As if he had guessed our intention, perhaps, too, he had been warned by Bormann, Hitler put on a scene such as I had seldom witnessed. He immediately had Brigadier General Bodenschkatz, Göring's chief adjutant, hauled out of bed and brought before him, where the poor man had to take a terrible tongue lashing on behalf of the incompetent tri marshal. Goebbels and I tried to soothe Hitler, and finally he did calm down. But our spade work had obviously been in vain. Goebbels, too, thought it advisable to give the subject wide berth for the present. Nevertheless, after Hitler's many expressions of appreciation he felt that his political stock had risen considerably. Afterward, he no longer spoke of a leader crisis. On the contrary, it even seemed as if he had recovered his old confidence in Hitler. But we still had to go on with the struggle against Bormann, he decided. On March 17, Goebbels, Funk, Lee, and I met with Göring in the latter's Berlin Palace on Leipziger Platz. At first Göring received us in his office, adopting his most official manner, planted behind his enormous desk on his Renaissance throne. We sat facing him on uncomfortable chairs. Initially, there was no sign of the cordiality he had shown at Ober Salzburg. It rather seemed as if Göring had repented of his candor. But while the rest of us sat silent for the most part, Göring and Goebbels aroused each other by outlining the perils presented by that triumvirate around Hitler and by devising schemes for recapturing Hitler for ourselves. Goebbels seemed to have forgotten completely how Hitler had lashed into Göring only a few days earlier. Soon both of them saw their goal within reach. Göring, alternating as always between torpor and euphoria was already beginning to discount the influence of the headquarters clique. We mustn't overestimate it either, Herr Goebbels. Bormann and Kiitel are nothing but the Führer's secretaries, after all. Who do they think they are? As far as their own powers are concerned, they're nobodies. What seemed to disturb Goebbels most was the possibility that Bormann might utilize his direct contacts with the Gauleiters to build up bases against our efforts on the home front also. I recall the way Goebbels tried to enlist Lee against Bormann in his capacity of organization chief of the party. Finally, Goebbels proposed that the Council of Ministers for the Defense of the Rye must be given the right to summon Gauleiters and call them to account. Fully aware that Goering would scarcely attend the sessions so often, 
he proposed weekly meetings. Casually, he added that probably it would be all right, wouldn't it, if he acted as deputy chairman if Goering were sometimes unable to attend. Five Goering did not see through Goebbels's machinations and consented. Behind the fronts of the great struggle for power the old rivalries continued to smolder. For a considerable time the numbers of workers whom Sorkel claimed to have sent into industry, statistics which he reported to Hitler, had ceased to correspond with the actual figures. The difference amounted to several hundred thousand. I propose to our coalition that we join forces in compelling Sorkel, Bormann's outpost in our territory, as it were, to report truthful data. At Hitler's request a large building in the rustic Bavarian style had been erected near Berchtesgaden to house the Berlin Chancellery Secretariat. Whenever Hitler stayed at Obersalzburg for months at a time, Lammers and his immediate staff conducted the business of the Chancellery there. Goering arranged for Lammers as the host to invite our group, as well as Sorkel and Milch, to meet in the conference room of this building on April 12, 1943. Before the meeting Milch and I once more reminded Goering of what we wanted. He rubbed his hands, that will soon be taken care of. We were surprised to find that Himmler, Bormann, and Key Eitel were also in the conference room. And to make matters worse, our ally Goebbels sent his apologies, on the way to Berchtesgaden he had suffered an attack of kidney colic and was lying ill in his special car. To this day I don't know whether this was true or whether he merely had an instinct for what was going to happen. That session marked the end of our alliance. Sorkel simply challenged our demand for an additional 2 million, 100,000 workers for the entire economy, insisted that he had delivered the needed forces, and became furious when I charged that his figures could not be accurate. Later we learned from General Roche our armaments inspector for Upper Bavaria, that Sorkel had directed his employment bureaus to list every worker who was assigned to a factory as placed, even if the worker turned out to be unqualified for the particular job and was sent back to the bureau. The factories, on the other hand, listed only those workers who were actually hired. Milch and I expected that Goering would ask Sorkel for explanations and make him change his labor assignment policy. Instead, to our horror Goering began with a violent attack upon Milch, and thus indirectly upon me. It was outrageous that Milch was making so many difficulties, he said. Our good party comrade Sorkel who was exerting himself to the utmost and had achieved such successes. He at any rate felt a great debt of gratitude toward him. Milch was simply blind to Sorkel's achievements. It was as though Goering had picked out the wrong phonograph record. In the ensuing prolonged discussion on the missing workers, each of the ministers present offered explanations, on entirely theoretical grounds, of the difference between the real and the official figures. Himmler commented with the greatest calm that perhaps the missing hundreds of thousands had died. The conference proved a total failure. No light was thrown on the question of the missing labor force, and in addition our grand assault on Bormann had come to grief. After this meeting Goering took me aside. I know you like to work closely with my state secretary, Milch, he said. In all friendship I'd like to warn you against him. He's unreliable, as soon as his own interests are in question, he'll trample over even his best friends. I immediately passed this remark on to Milch. He laughed. A few days ago Goering told me exactly the same thing about you. This attempt on Goering's part to sow distrust was the very opposite of what we had agreed on, that we would form a bloc. The sad fact was that our circles were so infected by suspicion that friendship was felt to be a threat. A few days after this affair Milch commented that Goering had switched sides because the Gestapo had proof of his drug addiction. Quite some time before Milch had suggested to me that I look closely at Goering's pupils. At the Nuremberg trial my attorney, Dr. Flaxner, told me that Goering had been an addict long before 1933. Flaxner had acted as his lawyer once when he was sued for improperly administering a morphine injection. A lady's dress caught fire in a nightclub. Goering gave her an injection of morphine to relieve the pain. 
but the injection left a scar and the woman sued Goering. Our attempt to mobilize Goering against Bormann was probably doomed to failure from the start for financial reasons as well. For as was later revealed by a Nuremberg document, Bormann had made Goering a gift of 6 million marks from the industrialists Adolf Hitler Fund. After the collapse of our alliance, Goering actually bestirred himself for a while, but, surprisingly, his activity was directed against me. Contrary to his habit, a few weeks later he asked me to invite the leading men in the steel industry to a conference at Obersalzburg. The meeting took place at the drafting tables in my studio and was memorable only because of Goering's behavior. He appeared in an euphoric mood, his pupils visibly narrowed, and delivered to the astonished specialists from the steel industry a long lecture on the manufacture of steel, parading all his knowledge of blast furnaces and metallurgy. There followed a succession of commonplaces, we had to produce more, must not shim innovations, industry was frozen in tradition, must learn to jump over its own shadow, and more of the like. At the end of his two-hour torrent of bombast, Goering's speech slowed and his expression grew more and more absent. Finally, he abruptly put his head on the table and fell peacefully asleep. We thought it politic to pretend to ignore the splendidly uniformed Rye Marshal and proceeded to discuss our problems until he awoke again and curtly declared the meeting over. Finext Dagering had announced a conference on radar problems which likewise ended with nothing accomplished. Once again, in the best of humor, he gave endless explanations in his Imperial Majesty style, telling the specialists what they already knew and he knew nothing about. Finally, there came a spate of directives and injunctions. After he had left the meeting, highly pleased with himself, I had my hands full undoing the damage he had done, while somehow avoiding an outright disavowal of Goering. Nevertheless, the incident was so serious that I was compelled to inform Hitler about it. He seized the next opportunity to summon the industrialists to headquarters on May 13, 1943, in order to restore the government's prestige. In an unpublished diary passage, May 15, 1943, Goebbels wrote, he, Hitler, spent the whole day conferring with the captains of the armaments industry on the measures that must be taken now. This conference with the Freer was intended to salve the wounds left by Goering's latest, rather unfortunate conference. Goering's tactical blunders offended the armaments manufacturers. The Freer has now straightened that out. A few months after this setback to our plans I ran into Himmler at headquarters. Bluntly, in a threatening voice, he said to me, I think it would be very unwise of you to try to activate the Rye Marshal again. But that was no longer possible in any case. Goering had relapsed into his lethargy, and for good. He did not wake up again until he was on trial in Nuremberg. 19. Second Man in the State Around the beginning of May 1943, a few weeks after the demise of our short-lived association, Goebbels was finding in Bormann the qualities he had ascribed to Goering a few weeks before. The two came to an arrangement, Goebbels promising to direct reports to Hitler through Bormann, in return for Bormann's extracting the right sort of decision from Hitler. It was clear that Goebbels had written Goering off, he would support him henceforth only as a prestige figurehead. Thus actual power had shifted still more in Bormann's favor. Nevertheless, he had no way of knowing whether he might not need me someday. Although he must have heard of my ill-fated attempt to dethrone him, he behaved amiably toward me and hinted that I could come over to his camp as Goebbels had done. I did not avail myself of this offer, however. The price seemed to me too high, I would have become dependent upon him. Goebbels, too continued to remain in close contact with me, for both of us were still bent on making utmost use of our domestic reserves. Undoubtedly, I behaved much too trustfully in my relations with him. I was fascinated by his dazzling friendliness and perfect manners, as well as by his cool logic. Outwardly, then, little had changed. The world in which we lived forced upon us dissimulation and hypocrisy. Among rivals an honest word was rarely spoken, for fear it would be carried back to Hitler in a distorted version. 
everyone conspired, took Hitler's capriciousness into his reckonings, and won or lost in the course of this cryptic game. I played on this out of tune keyboard of mutual relations just as unscrupulously as all the others. In the second half of May, Goering sent word to me that he wanted to make a speech on armaments, together with me, in the Sport Palast. I agreed. A few days later, however, Hitler to my surprise appointed Goebbels as the speaker. When we were coordinating our texts, the propaganda minister advised me to shorten my speech, since his would take an hour. If you don't stay considerably under half an hour, the audience will lose interest. As usual, we sent both speeches to Hitler in manuscript, with a note to the effect that mine was going to be condensed by a third. Hitler ordered me to come to Obersalzburg. While I was sitting by, he read the drafts Bormann handed to him. With what seemed to me eagerness, he ruthlessly cut Goebbels's speech by half within a few minutes. Here, Bormann, inform the doctor and tell him that I think Speer's speech excellent. In the presence of the Archintriga Bormann, Hitler had thus helped me to increase my prestige vis a vis Goebbels. It was a way of letting both men know that I still stood high. I could count on Hitler's supporting me, if need be, against his closest associates. My speech on June 5, 1943, in which I could for the first time announce a sizable increase in armaments production, was a failure on two scores. From the party hierarchy I heard such comments as, so it can be done without big sacrifices. Then why should we upset the populace by drastic measures? The general staff and the frontline commanders, on the other hand, doubted the truth of my statistics whenever they had supply difficulties with ammunition or ordnance. The Soviet winter offensive had ground to a halt. Our increased production enabled us to close the gap on the Eastern Front. What is more, the delivery of new weapons encouraged Hitler to make preparations for an offensive in spite of the winter's losses of materiel. The objective was to cut off a bend in the line near Kursk. The beginning of this offensive was prepared under the codename Operation Citadel. It kept being postponed because Hitler counted heavily on the effectiveness of the new tanks. Above all he was expecting wonders from a new type of tank with electric drive constructed by Professor Porsche. At a simple supper in a small back room of the chancellery furnished in peasant style, I by chance heard from Sepp Diedrich, the commander of Hitler's bodyguard, that Hitler intended to issue an order that this time no prisoners were to be taken. In the course of advances by SS units that had been established, Diedrich said, that the Soviet troops had killed their German prisoners. Hitler had then and there announced that a thousandfold retaliation in blood must be taken. I was thunderstruck. But I was also selfishly alarmed at the sheer wastefulness of such a step. Hitler was counting on hundreds of thousands of prisoners. For months we had been trying in vain to close a gap of hundreds of thousands in the supply of labor. I therefore took the first opportunity to reason with Hitler on this score. It was not difficult to persuade him to reconsider, he seemed rather relieved to be able to withdraw his pledge to the SS. That same day, July 8, 1943, he had key ITEL prepare instructions to the effect that all prisoners must be sent into armaments production. One. The disagreement over the fate of prisoners proved to be unnecessary. The offensive began on July 5. But in spite of the formidable array of our most advanced weapons we were not able to encircle the Soviet forces. Hitler's confidence had been mistaken. After two weeks of battle he gave up. This failure was a sign that even in the summer the initiative had passed to the enemy. After the second winter disaster at Stalingrad, the army high command had urged the establishing of a defensive position far to the rear, but Hitler would not hear of it. Now, after the thwarted offensive, even Hitler was ready to prepare defensive positions from 12 to 15 miles behind the main line of battle. Two, the general staff made a counter proposal, establishing the defensive line on the west bank of the Dnieper where the steep slope, over 150 feet high, dominated the plain across the river. There would presumably have been sufficient time for building an extensive defensive line there, 
for the Dnieper was still some 125 miles behind the front. But Hitler flatly rejected this plan. Whereas during his successful campaigns he had always hailed the German soldiers as the best in the world, he now declared, building a position so far to the rear is not possible for psychological reasons. If the troops learn that there are fortified positions perhaps 60 miles behind the front line, no one will be able to persuade them to fight. At the first opportunity they'll fall back without resistance. 3. In spite of this ban, on Manstein's orders and with the tacit consent of Zietzler, the TOT organization began building fortified positions on the Bug in December 1943. Hitler found out about this from my deputy, Dorsch. At this time the Soviet armies were still some 100 to 125 miles east of the Bug River. And once again Hitler commanded, in unusually strong language and on the same grounds as before that the work be stopped at once. Jodl's unpublished diary, entry for December 16, 1943, describes the outcome of this unauthorized action, Dorsch reported the deployment of the TOT organization along the bug, something of which the Führer had known nothing. The Führer spoke agitatedly to Minister Speer and me about the defeatist mood of Manstein's staff, which Gorlita Koch had described to him. This building of rear positions, he stormed, was proof again of the defeatist attitude of Manstein and his army group. Hitler's obstinacy made it easier for the Soviet troops to harass our armies. For in Russia digging became impossible once the ground froze in November. What time we had was squandered. The soldiers were exposed with no defenses to the weather, moreover our winter equipment was of poor quality compared to that of the enemy. Such behavior was not the only indication that Hitler had refused to acknowledge the turn of affairs. In the spring of 1943 he had demanded that a three-mile-long road and railroad bridge be built across the Strait of Kerch, although we had long been building a cable railway there, it went into operation on June 14 with a daily capacity of 1,000 tons. This amount of supplies just sufficed for the defensive needs of the 17th Army. But Hitler had not forsaken his plan to push through the Caucasus to Persia. He justified his order for the bridge explicitly on the necessity to transport material and troops to the Cuban bridgehead for an offensive. Because of the frequency of earth tremors, provision had to be made for extra strength girders which would have required vast quantities of precious steel. In addition, as Zietzler pointed out during the Situation Conference, if we transported building materials for the bridge over the inadequate railroad facilities of the Crimea, we would be forced to curtail the shipments needed to maintain our defensive positions. His generals, however, had long put any such ideas out of their heads. On a visit to the Cuban bridgehead the frontline generals expressed anxiety over whether the positions could be held at all in the face of the enemy's obvious strength. When I reported these fears to Hitler he said contemptuously, nothing but empty evasions. Janik is just like the general staff, he hasn't faith in a new offensive. Shortly afterward, in the summer of 1943, General Janik, commander of the 17th Army, was forced to ask Zietzler to recommend retreat from the exposed Cuban bridgehead. He wanted to take up a more favorable position in the Crimea to be ready for the expected Soviet winter offensive. Hitler, on the other hand, insisted even more obstinately than before that the building of the bridge for his offensive plans must be speeded. Even at that time it was clear that the bridge would never be completed. On September 4, the last German units began evacuating Hitler's bridgehead on the continent of Asia. Just as we had met at Goering's house to discuss overcoming the crisis in political leadership, Guderian, Zietzler, from, and I were now talking about the military leadership crisis. In the summer of 1943, General Guderian, Inspector General of the Tank Forces, asked me to set up a meeting with Army Chief of Staff Zietzler. There had been some disputes between the two men, springing from unresolved jurisdictional questions. Since I had something approaching a friendly relationship with both generals, it was natural to ask me to play the part of go-between. 
but it turned out that Guderian had more in mind than a settlement of minor disputes. He wanted to discuss common tactics in regard to the matter of a new commander-in-chief of the army. We met in my home at Ober Salzburg. The differences between Zietzler and Guderian quickly dwindled to nothing. The conversation centered on the situation that had arisen from Hitler's assuming command of the army but not exercising it. The interests of the army as against the two other branches of the service and the SS must be represented more vigorously, Zietzler thought. Hitler, as commander-in-chief of the armed forces, ought to remain non-partisan. A commander-in-chief of the army, Guderian added, had to maintain close personal contact with the army commanders. He should be looking out for the needs of his troops and deciding fundamental questions of supply. But Hitler, both men agreed, had neither the time nor the inclination to act on this practical level, nor to uphold the special interests of one branch of the service. He appointed and deposed generals whom he hardly knew. Only a commander-in-chief who associated with his higher-ranking officers on a personal basis could decide such questions of personnel. The army knew, Guderian said, that Hitler scarcely interfered in the personnel policies of his commanders-in-chief of the Air Force and the Navy. Only the army was exposed to this sort of treatment. We came to the conclusion that each of us would try to appeal to Hitler to appoint a new commander-in-chief of the army. But the very first hints that Guderian and I separately made to Hitler came to grief, he was obviously offended and rejected the idea in unusually sharp terms. I did not know that shortly before we spoke Field Marshals von Kludge and von Manstein had undertaken a similar probe on the same subject. Hitler must have assumed that we were all in collusion. The time when Hitler readily granted all my personal and organizational requests was long since past. The triumvirate of Bormann, Lammers, and Kiitel was doing its best to block any further extension of my power, even though concern for the armaments program might have dictated the opposite. However, there was little these three could do against the joint proposal by Admiral Dennitz and myself that we also assume control of naval armaments. I had met Dennitz immediately after my appointment in June 1942. The then commander of the U-boat fleet received me in Paris in an apartment which struck me at once by its avant-garde severity. I was all the more taken with the plain surroundings since I had just come from an opulent lunch with many courses and expensive wines given by Field Marshal Spell, commander of the air forces stationed in France. He had set up headquarters in the Palais du Luxembourg the former palace of Marie de Medici's. The field marshal's craving for luxury and public display ran a close second to that of his superior Goering, he was also his match in corpulence. During the next several months problems connected with the building of the large U-boat pens along the Atlantic brought Dennitz and me together several times. Admiral Redder, commander-in-chief of the Navy, seemed to be annoyed. He tartly forbade Dennitz to discuss technical questions directly with me. At the end of December 1942, Captain Schutz, the successful U-boat commander, informed me of serious dissension between the Berlin Navy command and Dennitz. From various signs and portents, Schutz said, the submarine fleet knew that their commander was going to be relieved in the near future. A few days later I heard from State Secretary Norman that the Navy censor in the Propaganda Ministry had stricken the name of Dennitz from the captions of all press photos showing an inspection tour undertaken jointly by Reda and Dennitz. When I was in headquarters at the beginning of January, Hitler was worked up over foreign press reports of a naval battle which the Navy command had not informed him about in detail. This was the naval battle that took place December 31, 1942. Hitler held that the Lutzau and the Hippa had retreated in the face of weaker English forces. He accused the Navy of lacking fighting spirit. As if by chance, in our subsequent conference he raised the question of the feasibility of assembly line building of U-boats, but soon he became more interested in the troubles I was having in my collaboration with Redder. I told him of the stricture against my discussing technical questions with Dennitz, of the U-boat officers' fears that their commander was going to be replaced, and of the censorship of the photo captions. 
By now I had learned, from watching Borman's tactics, that one had to plant suspicions very carefully and gradually for them to be effective with Hitler. Any direct attempt to influence him was hopeless, since he never accepted a decision which he thought had been imposed on him. Therefore I merely hinted that all obstacles standing in the way of our U-boat plans could be eliminated if Dennitz were given his head. Actually, what I wanted to achieve was the replacement of Redder. But knowing the tenacity with which Hitler clung to his old associates I hardly hoped that I would succeed. On January 30, Dennis was named Grand Admiral and simultaneously appointed Commander-in-Chief of the Navy, while Redder was kicked upstairs, he became Admiral Inspector of the Navy, which entitled him solely to the privilege of a state funeral. By resolute expertise and technical arguments, Dennis was able to protect the Navy from Hitler's whims until the end of the war. I met with him frequently to discuss the problems of building submarines, despite the fact that this close cooperation began with a foul up. Without consulting me, after hearing a report from Dennis, Hitler raised all naval armament to the highest priority. This happened in the middle of April, but only three months before, on January 22, 1943. He had already classified the expanded tank program as the task of highest priority. The upshot was that two programs would be competing. It was unnecessary for me to appeal to Hitler again. Before any controversy developed, Dennis had already realized that cooperation with the massive apparatus of army procurement would be more useful than Hitler's favoritism. We soon agreed to transfer naval armaments production to my organization. In taking this on, I pledged myself to carry out the naval program Dennis had envisaged. This meant, instead of the previous monthly production of 20 submarines of the smaller type totaling 16,000 tons displacement, producing 40 U-boats per month with a displacement totaling more than 50,000 tons. In addition I was to double the number of minesweepers and PT boats. Dennis had made it clear that only the production of a new type of U-boat could save our submarine warfare. The Navy wanted to abandon the previous type of surface ship which occasionally moved underwater. It wanted to give its U-boats the best possible streamlining and attain a higher underwater speed and a greater underwater range by doubling the power of the electric motors and simplifying the system of storage batteries. As always in such cases, the chief problem was to find the right director for this assignment. I chose a fellow Swabian, Otto Merker, who had hitherto proved his talents in the building of fire engines. Here was a challenge to all marine engineers. On July 5, 1943, Merker presented his new construction system to the heads of the Navy. As was being done in the production of Liberty ships in the United States, the submarines were to be built in inland factories where the machinery and electrical equipment would also be installed. They were then to be transported in sections to the coast and quickly assembled there. We would thus avoid the problem of the shipyards, whose limited facilities had so far stood in the way of any expansion of our shipbuilding programs. For Dennis sounded almost emotional when he declared, at the end of our conference, this means we are beginning a new life. For the time being, However, we had nothing but a vision of what the new U-boats would look like. In order to design them and to settle on the details, a development commission was established. Its chairman was not a leading engineer, as was customary, but Admiral Top, whom Dennett assigned to this task without our even attempting to clarify the complicated questions that arose as a result. The cooperation between Top and Merker worked out as easily as that between Dennett and myself. Barely four months after the first session of the Development Commission, on November N, 1943, all the drawings were finished. A month later Dennett and I were able to inspect and even walk inside a wooden model of the large new 1600-ton submarine. Even while the blueprints were being prepared, our Directive Committee for Shipbuilding was assigning contracts to industry a procedure we had already used in speeding up the production of the new Panther tank. Thanks to all this, the first seaworthy U-boats of the new type were delivered to the Navy for testing in 1944. 
we would have been able to keep our promise of delivering 40 boats a month by early in 1945, however badly the war was going otherwise, if air aids had not destroyed a third of the submarines at the dockyards. 5. At the time, Dennis and I often asked ourselves why we had not begun building the new type of U boat earlier. For no technical innovations were employed, the engineering principles had been known for years. The new boats, so the experts assured us, would have revolutionized submarine warfare. This fact seemed to be appreciated by the American Navy, which after the war began building the new type for itself. On July 26, 1943, three days after Dennett's and I signed our joint degree on the new naval program, I obtained Hitler's consent to placing all production under my ministry. For tactical reasons I had asked for this on the grounds of the additional burdens which the naval program and other tasks required by Hitler were imposing upon industry. By transforming large consumer goods plants into armaments plants, I explained to Hitler, we would not only free half a million German workers but also enlist the industrial managers and the factory machinery in our urgent programs. Most of the Gauleiters, however, objected to such measures. The Ministry of Economics had proved too weak to enforce such shifts against the opposition of the Gauleiters. And, to jump a bit ahead in the story, I also was too weak, as I was soon forced to realize. After an unusually protracted procedure, in which all the ministers involved and all the various boards of the four-year plan were requested to hand in their objections, Lammers convoked the ministers for a meeting in the cabinet room on August 26. Thanks to the generosity of Funk, who at this meeting delivered his own funeral oration with wit and humor, it was unanimously agreed that from now on all war production would be placed under the control of my ministry. Will and Illy, Lammers had to promise to communicate this result to Hitler via Bormann. A few days later Funk and I went to the Fras headquarters together to receive Hitler's final authorization. Greatly to my surprise, however, Hitler, in Funk's presence, cut short my remarks, saying irritably that he would not listen to any further explanations. Only a few hours ago Bormann had warned him, he said that I was going to lure him into signing something that had been discussed neither with Reich Minister Lammers nor with the Reich Marshal. He was not going to be drawn into our little rivalries. When I tried to explain that Reich Minister Lammers had properly obtained the consent of Goering's State Secretary for the four-year plan, Hitler again cut me off with unaccustomed curtness, I am glad that in Bormann at least I have a faithful soul around me. The implication was clear, he was accusing me of trickery. Funk informed Lammers of the incident. Then we went to meet Goering, who was on the way to Hitler's headquarters in his private car, he had just come from his personal hunting preserve, the Romington Heath. Goering, too, was very huffy, undoubtedly he had been told only one side of the story and had been warned against us. Funk, amiable and persuasive, finally succeeded in breaking the ice and going over our decree point by point. And now Goering indicated full agreement, though not before we had inserted a sentence, the powers of the Reich Marshal of the Greater German Reich has commissioned a general for the four-year plan remain unaffected. In practice that was a very minor reservation, all the more so since most of the important functions of the four-year plan were directed by me anyhow through the Central Planning Board. As a sign of his approval, Goering signed our draft, and Lammers could report by teletype that there were no longer any objections. Thereupon Hitler, too, was ready to sign the draft when it was presented to him for signature a few days later, on September 2. From a Reich Minister of Armaments and Munitions I had now become Reich Minister of Armaments and War Production. Bormann's intrigue had fallen through this time. I did not make remonstrances to Hitler, instead, I left it to him to consider whether Bormann had actually served him loyally in this case. After my recent experiences I knew it was wiser not to expose Bormann's machinations and to spare Hitler embarrassment. But Bormann was surely the source of all the overt or covert opposition to an expansion of my ministry. To Bormann it was all too clear that I was moving outside the reach of his power and accumulating more and more power myself. Moreover, 
my work had brought me into comradely contacts with the leadership of the army and navy, with Guderian, Zietzler, Fromm, and Milch, and now lately with Dennitz. Even in Hitler's immediate entourage I was particularly close to the anti-Bormann forces, Hitler's army adjutant, General Engel, his air force adjutant, General von Below, and Hitler's armed forces adjutant, General Schmundt. In addition Hitler's physician, Dr. Karl Brandt, whom Bormann likewise considered a personal opponent of his, was quite close to me. One evening when I had had a few glasses of Steinhiger with Schmundt, he came out with the declaration that I was the army's great hope. Wherever he went, he said, the generals had the greatest confidence in me, whereas they had nothing but derogatory opinions of Goering. With rather high-flown emotion he concluded, you can always rely on the army, Herr Speer. It is behind you. I have never quite fathomed what Schmunt had in mind, though I suspect that he was confusing the army with the generals. But it seems probable that Schmunt must have said something of the sort to others. Given the narrow confines of the headquarters, such remarks must surely have reached Bormann's ears. Around this time, perhaps in the autumn of 1943, Hitler put me in some embarrassment when, just before the beginning of a situation conference, he greeted Himmler and me in the presence of several associates with the phrase, you two peers. Whatever Hitler meant by it, the chief of the SS could scarcely have been pleased by this remark, given his special niche in the power structure. In those same weeks Zietzler, too, told me with pleasure, the Führer is so pleased with you. He recently said that he placed the greatest hopes in you, that now a new sun has arisen after Goering. It might be thought that after years of experience Hitler would know how such remarks were received and what reactions they inevitably evoked. I could not decide whether Hitler did think this far ahead or was even capable of doing so. Sometimes he struck me as a total innocent, or as a misanthrope who did not care what the effects were. Perhaps, too, he believed that he could set things right himself whenever he chose. I asked Zietzler not to quote this. But since the same words were reported to me by other persons within the headquarters area, there could be no doubt that Bormann also heard the tribute. Hitler's powerful secretary was forced to realize that he had not been able to turn Hitler against me that summer. Bather, the opposite had happened. Since Hitler did not say such things often, Bormann must have taken the threat to heart. To him, it spelled danger. From now on he kept telling his closest associates that I was not only an enemy of the party but was actually bent on succeeding Hitler. Dr. G. Klopfer, Bormann's state secretary, testified in an affidavit dated July 7, 1947, Bormann repeatedly stated that Speer was a confirmed opponent of the party and was in fact ambitious to become Hitler's successor. He was not entirely wrong in this assumption. I recall having had several conversations with Milch about the matter. At the time Hitler must have been wondering whom he should select for his successor. Goering's reputation was undermined, Hess had ruled himself out, Skirak had been ruined by Bormann's intrigues, and Bormann, Himmler, and Goebbels did not correspond to the artistic type Hitler envisaged. Hitler probably thought he recognized kindred features in me. He considered me a gifted artist who within a short time had won an impressive position within the political hierarchy and finally, by achievements in the field of armaments, had also demonstrated special abilities in the military field. Only in foreign policy, Hitler's fourth domain, I had not come to the fore. Possibly he regarded me as an artistic genius who had successfully switched to politics, so that I thus indirectly served as a confirmation of his own career. Among friends I always called Bormann the man with the hedge clippers. For he was forever using all his energy, cunning, and brutality to prevent anyone from rising above a certain level. From then on, Bormann devoted his full capacities to reducing my power. After October 1943 the Gauleiters formed a front against me. Before another year had passed, things became so difficult that I often wanted to give up and resign my post. Until the end of the war this struggle between Bormann and me remained undecided. Hitler did not want to lose me, 
even occasionally singled me out for a display of favor, but then again would turn on me rudely. Borman could not wrest from me my successful industrial apparatus. This was so much my own creation that my fall would have meant the end of it and thus have endangered the war effort. 20. Bombs. The exuberance I had felt during the building of the new organization and the success and recognition of the early months soon gave way to more somber feelings. The labor problem, unsolved raw materials questions, and court intrigues created constant worries. The British air aids began to have their first serious effects on production and for a while made me forget about Borman, Sorkel, and the Central Planning Board. However they also served to raise my prestige. For in spite of the losses of factories we were producing more, not less. These air raids carried the war into our midst. In the burning and devastated cities we daily experienced the direct impact of the war. And it spurred us to do our utmost. Neither did the bombings and the hardships that resulted from them weaken the morale of the populace. On the contrary, from my visits to armaments plants and my contacts with the man in the street I carried away the impression of growing toughness. It may well be that the estimated loss of 9% of our production capacity one was amply balanced out by increased effort. Our heaviest expense was in fact the elaborate defensive measures. In the Rye and in the western theatres of war the barrels of 10,000 anti-aircraft guns were pointed toward the sky. Two the same guns could have well been employed in Russia against tanks and other ground targets. Had it not been for this new front, the air front over Germany, our defensive strength against tanks would have been about doubled, as far as equipment was concerned. Moreover, the anti-aircraft force tied down hundreds of thousands of young soldiers. A third of the optical industry was busy producing gun sights for the flak batteries. About half of the electronics industry was engaged in producing radar and communications networks for defense against bombing. Simply because of this, in spite of the high level of the German electronics and optical industries, the supply of our frontline troops with modem equipment remained far behind that of the Western armies. Thus a serious shortage of army communications equipment developed, for instance, walkie-talkies for the infantry and sound-ranging apparatus for the artillery. In addition, further development of such devices had to be neglected in favor of anti-aircraft weaponry. We were given a foretaste of our coming woes as early as the night of May 30, 1942, when the British gathered all their forces for an attack on Cologne with 1046 bombers. By chance Milch and I were summoned to see Goering on the morning after the raid. This time he was not residing in Karen Hall, but at Veldenstein Castle in Frankenia. We found him in a bad humor, still not believing the reports of the Cologne bombing. Impossible that many bombs cannot be dropped in a single night, he snarled at his adjutant. Connect me with the Gauliter of Cologne. There followed, in our presence, a preposterous telephone conversation. The report from your police commissioner is a stinking lie. Apparently the Gauliter begged to differ. I tell you as the Rye Marshal that the figures cited are simply too high. How can you dare report such fantasies to the Fra? The Gauliter at the other end of the line was evidently insisting on his figures. How are you going to count the fire bombs? Those are nothing but estimates. I tell you once more they're many times too high. All wrong. Send another report to the FUR at once revising your figures. Or are you trying to imply that I am lying? I have already delivered my report to the FUR with the correct figures. That stands. As though nothing had happened, Goring showed us through his house, his parents' former home. As if this were most serene peacetime, he had blueprints brought in and explained to us what a magnificent citadel he would be building to replace the simple Bedermia house of his parents in the courtyard of the old ruin. But first of all he wanted to have a reliable air raid shelter built. The plans for that were already drawn up. Three days later I was at headquarters. The excitement over the air raid on Cologne had not yet died down. I mentioned to Hitler the curious telephone conversation between Goering and Gorlitter Grower, 
naturally assuming that Goering's information must be more authentic than the Gauleiter's. But Hitler had already formed his own opinion. He presented Goering with the reports in the enemy newspapers on the enormous number of planes committed to the raid and the quantity of bombs they had dropped. These figures were even higher than those of the Cologne police commissioner. Three Hitler was furious with Goering's attempt to cover up, but he also considered the staff of the Air Force Command partly responsible. Next day Goering was received as usual. The affair was never mentioned again. As early as September 20, 1942, I had warned Hitler that the tank production of Friedrichshafen and the ball bearing facilities in Schufert were crucial to our whole effort. Hitler thereupon ordered increased anti aircraft protection for these two cities. Actually, as I had early recognized, the war could largely have been decided in 1943 if instead of vast but pointless area bombing, the planes had concentrated on the centers of armaments production. On April 11, 1943, I proposed to Hitler that a committee of industrial specialists be set to determining the crucial targets in Soviet power production. Four weeks later, however, the first attempt was made, not by us but by the British Air Force, to influence the course of the war by destroying a single nerve center of the war economy. The principle followed was to paralyze a cross-section, as it were, just as a motor can be made useless by the removal of the ignition. On May 17, 1943, a Mi-19 bombers of the RAF tried to strike at our whole armaments industry by destroying the hydroelectric plants of the Ruhr. The report that reached me in the early hours of the morning was most alarming. The largest of the dams, the Mont Dam, had been shattered and the reservoir emptied. As yet there were no reports on the three other dams. At dawn we landed at Whirl Airfield, having first surveyed the scene of devastation from above. The power plant at the foot of the shattered dam looked as if it had been erased, along with its heavy turbines. A torrent of water had flooded the Ruhr Valley. That had the seemingly insignificant but grave consequence that the electrical installations at the pumping stations were soaked and mudded, so that industry was brought to a standstill and the water supply of the population imperiled. My report on the situation, which I soon afterward delivered at the FRA's headquarters, made a deep impression on the FRA. He kept the documents with him. Few Reprotocol, May 30, 1943.16. We immediately summoned experts from all over Germany who had the electrical insulation dried out and also confiscated other motors of this type from other factories, regardless of the consequences. Thus the raw industries would be supplied with water within a few weeks. The British had not succeeded, however, in destroying the three other reservoirs. Had they done so, the Ruhr Valley would have been almost completely deprived of water in the coming summer months. At the largest of the reservoirs, the Sorp Valley Reservoir, they did achieve a direct hit on the center of the dam. I inspected it that same day. Fortunately the bomb hole was slightly higher than the water level. Just a few inches lower, and a small brook would have been transformed into a raging river which would have swept away the stone and earthen dam. For that night, employing just a few bombers, the British came close to a success which would have been greater than anything they had achieved hitherto with the commitment of thousands of bombers. But they made a single mistake which puzzles me to this day. They divided their forces and that same night destroyed the Adder Valley Dam, although it had nothing whatsoever to do with the supply of water to the Ruhr. According to Charles Webster and Noble Franklin, the Strategic Air Offensive Against Germany, London, 1961, Volume 2, the fifth plane succeeded in destroying the Mon Valley Dam. Subsequent attacks were directed against the Adder Valley Dam which served mainly to equalize the water level of the Weser and the Midland Canal during the summer months, thus maintaining navigation. Not until this dam had been destroyed did two planes attack the Sorp Valley Dam. In the meantime Air Marshal Bottomley had suggested on April 5, 1943, that the Mon and Sorp dams be attacked before the Adder Dam. But the bombs that had been developed specifically for this purpose were considered unsuitable for the earth and dam of the Sorp Reservoir. A few days after this attack 7,000 men, whom I had ordered shifted from the Atlantic Wall to the Monandida areas, 
were hard at work repairing the dams. On September 23, 1943, in the nick of time before the beginning of the rains, the breach in the Mon Dam was closed. Five, we were thus able to collect the precipitation of the late autumn and winter of 1943 for the needs of the following summer. While we were engaged in rebuilding, the British Air Force missed its second chance. A few bombs would have produced cave ins at the exposed building sites, and a few fire bombs could have set the wooden scaffolding blazing. After these experiences, I wondered once again why our Luftwaffe, with its by now reduced forces, did not launch similar pinpoint attacks whose effects could be devastating. At the end of May 1943, two weeks after the British raid, I reminded Hitler of my idea of April 11th that a group of experts might pinpoint the key industrial targets in the enemy camp. But as so often, Hitler proved irresolute. I'm afraid that the general staff of the Air Force will not want to take advice from your industrial associates. I too have broached such a plan to General Jess Connick several times. But, he concluded in rather a resigned tone, you speak to him about it sometime. Evidently Hitler was not going to do anything about this, he lacked any sense of the decisive importance of such operations. There is no question that once before he had thrown away his chance, between 1939 and 1941 when he directed our air raids against England's cities instead of coordinating them with the U-boat campaigns and, for example, attacking the English ports which were in any case sometimes strained beyond their capacity by the convoy system. Now he once again failed to see his opportunity. And the British, for their part, thoughtlessly copied this irrational conduct, aside from their single attack on the dams. In spite of Hitler's skepticism and my own lack of influence upon Air Force strategy, I did not feel discouraged. On June 23rd, I formed a committee consisting of several industry experts to analyze prime bombing targets. Six. Our first proposal concerned the British coal industry, for British technical publications provided a complete picture of its centers, locations, capacities, and so on. But this proposal came two years too late, our air power no longer sufficed. Given our reduced forces, one prime target virtually forced itself on our attention, the Russian electric power plants. To judge by our experiences, no systematically organized air defenses needed to be anticipated in Russia. Moreover, the electric power system in the Soviet Union differed structurally from that of the Western countries in one crucial point. Whereas the gradual industrial growth of the West had resulted in many middle-sized power plants connected in a grid, in the Soviet Union large power plants of gigantic dimensions had been built, usually in the heart of extensive industrial areas. Seven, For example, a single huge power plant on the upper Volga supplied most of the energy consumption of Moscow. We had information, in fact, that 60% of the manufacturing of essential optical parts and electrical equipment was concentrated in the Soviet capital. Moreover, the destruction of a few gigantic power plants in the Urals would have put a halt to much of Soviet steel production as well as to tank and munitions manufacture. A direct hit on the turbines or their conduits would have released masses of water of a destructiveness greater than that of many bombs. Since many of the major Soviet power plants had been built with the assistance of German companies, we were able to obtain very good data on them. On November 26, Goering gave the order to strengthen the 6th Air Corps under Major General Rudolf Meister with long-range bombers. In December the units were assembled near Beowistok.8 We had wooden models of the power plant made for use in training the pilots. Early in December I had informed Hitler.9 Milch had relayed our plans to Gunter Corton, the new chief of staff of the Air Force. On February 4, I wrote Corton that even today the prospects are good. For an operative air campaign against the Soviet Union. I definitely hope that significant effects on the fighting power of the Soviet Union will result from it. I was referring specifically to the attacks upon the power plants in the vicinity of Moscow and the Upper Volga. Success depended, as always in such operations, upon chance factors. I did not think that our action would decisively affect the war. 
but I hoped, as I wrote to Corton, that we would wreak enough damage on Soviet production so that it would take several months for American supplies to balance out their losses. Once again we were two years too late. The Russian winter offensive forced our troops to retreat. The situation had grown critical. In emergencies Hitler was, as so often, amazingly short-sighted. At the end of February he told me that the Meister Corps had been ordered to destroy railroad lines in order to slow down Russian supplies. I objected that the soil in Russia was frozen hard and our bombs would have only a superficial effect. Moreover, according to our own experience and despite the fact that the German railroads were much more complex and hence more sensitive to destruction, damage to railroad sections could often be repaired in a matter of hours. But these objections were in vain. The Meister Corps came to grief in a senseless operation, and the Russians were in no way impeded. Whatever interest Hitler might still have had in the idea of pinpoint bombing strategy was forgotten in his stubborn determination to retaliate against England. Even after the annihilation of the Meister Corps, we would still have had enough bombers for limited targets. But Hitler succumbed to the unrealistic hope that a few massive airstrikes on London might persuade the British to give up their pounding of Germany. That was the only reason he continued to demand, as late as 1943, the development and production of new heavy bombers. It made no impression upon him that such bombers could have been used with far greater effect in the East, although occasionally, even as late as the summer of 1944, he would seem to be swayed by my arguments. Ten he as well as our Air Force staff could not grasp the principle of aerial warfare in technological terms. Instead they proceeded along outmoded military lines. So did the other side at first. While I was trying to convert Hitler and the general staff of the Air Force to this policy, our Western enemies launched five major attacks on a single big city, Hamburg, within a week from July 25th to August 2nd.11 rash as this operation was, it had catastrophic consequences for us. The first attacks put the water supply pipes out of action, so that in the subsequent bombings the fire department had no way of fighting the fires. Huge conflagrations created cyclone-like fire storms, the asphalt of the streets began to blaze, people were suffocated in their cellars or burned to death in the streets. The devastation of this series of air raids could be compared only with the effects of a major earthquake. Gawler to Kaufman teletyped Hitler repeatedly, begging him to visit the stricken city. When these pleas proved fruitless, he asked Hitler at least to receive a delegation of some of the more heroic rescue crews. But Hitler refused even that. Hamburg had suffered the fate Gehring and Hitler had conceived for London in 1940. At a supper in the Chancellery in that year Hitler had, in the course of a monologue, worked himself up to a frenzy of destructiveness. Have you ever looked at a map of London? It is so closely built up that one source of fire alone would suffice to destroy the whole city, as happened once before, two hundred years ago. Goering wants to use innumerable incendiary bombs of an altogether new type to create sources of fire in all parts of London fires everywhere. Thousands of them. Then they'll unite in one gigantic area conflagration. Goering has the right idea. Explosive bombs don't work, but it can be done with incendiary bombs, total destruction of London. What use will their fire department be once that really starts? Hamburg had put the fear of God in me. At the meeting of Central Planning on July 29th I pointed out, if the air raids continue on the present scale, within three months we shall be relieved of a number of questions we are at present discussing. We shall simply be coasting downhill, smoothly and relatively swiftly. We might just as well hold the final meeting of central planning, in that case. Three days later I informed Hitler that armaments production was collapsing and threw in the further warning that a series of attacks of this sort, extended to six more major cities, would bring Germany's armaments production to a total halt. The next day I informed Milch's colleagues of similar fears, conference with Chief of Air Force Procurement, August 3, 1943, we are approaching the point of total collapse. In our supply industry, Soon we will have airplanes, 
tanks, or trucks lacking certain key parts. Ten months later I said to a group of Hamburg dock workers, a while back we were saying to ourselves, if this goes on another few months we'll be washed up. Then armaments production will come to a standstill. Office journal. You'll straighten all that out again, he merely said. In fact Hitler was right. We straightened it out again, not because of our central planning organization which with the best will in the world could issue only general instructions, but by the determined efforts of those directly concerned, first and foremost the workers themselves. Fortunately for us, a series of Hamburg type raids was not repeated on such a scale against other cities. Thus the enemy once again allowed us to adjust ourselves to his strategy. We barely escaped a further catastrophic blow on August 17, 1943, only two weeks after the Hamburg bombings. The American Air Force launched its first strategic raid. It was directed against Schoenfurt where large factories of the ball bearing industry were concentrated. Ball bearings had in any case already become a bottleneck in our efforts to increase armaments production. But in this very first attack the other side committed a crucial mistake. Instead of concentrating on the ball bearing plants, the sizable force of 376 flying fortresses divided up. 146 of the planes successfully attacked an airplane assembly plant in Regensburg, but with only minor consequences. Meanwhile, the British Air Force continued its indiscriminate attacks upon our cities. After this attack the production of ball bearings dropped by 38% 12 despite the peril to Schoenfurt we had to patch up our facilities there for to attempt to relocate our ball bearing industry would have held up production entirely for three or four months. In the light of our desperate needs we could also do nothing about the ball bearing factories in Berlin Erkner, Kanstadt, or Steyr, although the enemy must have been aware of their location. In June 1946 the General Staff of the Royal Air Force asked me what would have been the results of concerted attacks on the ball bearing industry. I replied. Armaments production would have been crucially weakened after two months and after four months would have been brought completely to a standstill. This, to be sure, would have meant 1. All our ball bearing factories, in Schoenfurt, Steyr, Erkner, Kanstadt, and in France and Italy, had been attacked simultaneously. 2. These attacks had been repeated three or four times, every two weeks no matter what the pictures of the target area showed. 3. Any attempt at rebuilding these factories had been thwarted by further attacks, spaced at two-month intervals. 13. After this first blow we were forced back on the ball-bearing stocks stored by the armed forces for use as repair parts. We soon consumed these, as well as whatever had been accumulated in the factories for current production. After these reserves were used up, they lasted for six to eight weeks, the sparse production was carried daily from the factories to the assembly plants, often in knapsacks. In those days we anxiously asked ourselves how soon the enemy would realize that he could paralyze the production of thousands of armaments plants merely by destroying five or six relatively small targets. The second serious blow, however, did not come until two months later. On October 14, 1943, I was at the East Prussian headquarters discussing armaments questions with Hitler when Adjutant Schaub interrupted us, the Rye Marshal urgently wishes to speak to you, he said to Hitler. This time he has pleasant news. Hitler came back from the telephone in good spirits. A new daylight raid on Schufert had ended with a great victory for our defenses. He said. 14 The countryside was strewn with downed American bombers. Uneasy, I asked for a short recess in our conference, since I wanted to telephone Schoenfurt myself. But all communications were shattered, I could not reach any of the factories. Finally, by enlisting the police, I managed to talk to the foreman of a ball bearing factory. All the factories had been hard hit, he informed me. The oil baths for the bearings had caused serious fires in the machinery workshops, the damage was far worse than after the first attack. 
this time we had lost 67% of our ball bearing production. My first measure after this second air raid was to appoint my most vigorous associate, General Manager Kessler, as Special Commissioner for Ball Bearing Production. Our reserves had been consumed, efforts to import ball bearings from Sweden and Switzerland had met with only slight success. Nevertheless, we were able to avoid total disaster by substituting slide bearings for ball bearings wherever possible. 15 But what really saved us was the fact that from this time on the enemy to our astonishment once again ceased his attacks on the ball bearing industry. 16. On December 23rd, the Erkner plant was heavily hit, but we were not sure whether this was a deliberate attack, since Berlin was being bombed in widely scattered areas. The picture did not change again until February 1944. Then, within four days, Schmfert, Steyr, and Kanstadt were each subjected to two successive heavy attacks. Then followed raids on Erkner, Schmfert, and again Steyr. After only six weeks our production of bearings, above 6.3 cm in diameter, had been reduced to 29% of what it had been before the air raids. At the beginning of April 1944, however, the attacks on the ball bearing industry ceased abruptly. Thus, the Allies threw away success when it was already in their hands. Had they continued the attacks of March and April with the same energy, we would quickly have been at our last gasp. Perhaps the enemy air staffs overrated the effects. Our Air Force General Staff also concluded from aerial photographs that an attack on a Soviet synthetic rubber factory in the fall of 1943 had completely wiped out production for many months to come. I showed these photos to our leading synthetic rubber specialist, Hoffman, the manager of our plant in Hulls, which had undergone much more severe attacks. After pointing out various key sections of the plant which had not been hit, he explained that the plant would be in full production again within a week or two. As it was, not a tank, plane, or other piece of weaponry failed to be produced because of lack of ball bearings, even though such production had been increased by 19% from July 1943 to April 1944.18 as far as armaments were concerned. Hitler's credo that the impossible could be made possible and that all forecasts and fears were too pessimistic, seemed to have proved itself true. Not until after the war did I learn the reason for the enemy's error. The air staffs assumed that in Hitler's authoritarian state the important factories would be quickly shifted from the imperiled cities. On December 20, 1943, Sir Arthur Harris declared his conviction that at this stage of the war the Germans have long since made every possible effort to decentralize the manufacture of so vital a product, as ball bearings. He considerably overestimated the strengths of the authoritarian system, which to the outside observer appeared so tightly knit. As early as December 19, 1942, eight months before the first air raid on Schmfurt, I had sent a directive to the entire armaments industry stating, the mounting intensity of the enemy air attacks compels accelerated preparations for shifting manufactures important for armaments production. But there was resistance on all sides. The Gauleiters did not want new factories in their districts for fear that the almost peacetime quiet of their small towns would be disturbed. My band of directors, for their part did not want to expose themselves to political infighting. The result was that hardly anything was done. After the second heavy raid on Schmfurt on October 14, 1943, we again decided to decentralize. Some of the facilities were to be distributed among the surrounding villages, others placed in small and as yet unendangered towns in eastern Germany. In the two months following the first attack on Schmfurt nothing had been done. The minister forcefully expressed his dissatisfaction with the measures previously taken, asserting that the urgency of the matter required all other considerations to be put aside. Deeply impressed by the damage and by the minister's account of the potential consequences for the armaments industry, everyone readily offered all assistance, even the neighboring Gauleiters who would have to accept the unwelcome intrusions into their domains that would accompany the transfer of operations from Schmfurt to their territories. 
Office Journal, October 18, 1943. This policy of dispersal was meant to provide for the future, but the plan encountered a great deal of opposition. As late as January 1944 shifting of ball bearing production to cave factories was still being discussed, 19 and in August 1944 my representative to the ball bearing industry complained that he was having difficulties pushing through the construction work for the shift of ball bearing production. 20. Instead of paralyzing vital segments of industry, the Royal Air Force began an air offensive against Berlin. I was having a conference in my private office on November 22, 1943, when the air aid alarm sounded. It was about 7.30 pm a large fleet of bombers was reported heading toward Berlin. When the bombers reached Potsdam, I called off the meeting to drive to a nearby flak tower, intending to watch the attack from its platform, as was my wont. But I scarcely reached the top of the tower when I had to take shelter inside it. In spite of the tower's stout concrete walls, heavy hits nearby were shaking it. Injured anti-aircraft gunners crowded down the stairs behind me, the air pressure from the exploding bombs had hurled them into the walls. For twenty minutes explosion followed explosion. From above I looked down into the well of the tower, where a closely packed crowd stood in the thickening haze formed by cement dust falling from the walls. When the rain of bombs ceased, I ventured out on the platform again. My nearby ministry was one gigantic conflagration. I drove over there at once. A few secretaries, looking like Amazons in their steel helmets, were trying to save files even while isolated time bombs went off in the vicinity. In place of my private office I found nothing but a huge bomb crater. The fire spread so quickly that nothing more could be rescued. But nearby was the eight-story building of the Army Ordnance Office, and since the fire was spreading to it and we were all nerved up from the raid and feeling the urge to do something, we thronged into the imperiled building in order at least to save the valuable special telephones. We ripped them from their wires and piled them up in a safe place in the basement shelter of the building. Next morning General Lieb, the chief of the Army Ordnance Office, visited me. The fires in my building were extinguished early in the morning hours, he informed me, grinning. But unfortunately we can't do any work now. Last night somebody ripped all the telephones from the walls. When Goering, at his country estate care in Hall, heard about that nocturnal visit to the flak tower, he gave the staff their orders not to allow me to step out on the platform again. But by this time the officers had already formed a friendly relationship with me that was stronger than Goering's command. My visits to the tower were not hampered by his order. From the flak tower the air aids on Berlin were an unforgettable sight, and I had constantly to remind myself of the cruel reality in order not to be completely entranced by the scene. The illumination of the parachute flares, which the Berliners called Christmas trees, followed by flashes of explosions which were caught by the clouds of smoke, the innumerable probing searchlights, the excitement when a plane was caught and tried to escape the cone of light, the brief flaming torch when it was hit. No doubt about it, this apocalypse provided a magnificent spectacle. As soon as the planes turned back, I drove to those districts of the city where important factories were situated. We drove over streets strewn with rubble, lined by burning houses. Bombed out families sat or stood in front of the ruins. A few pieces of rescued furniture and other possessions lay about on the sidewalks. There was a sinister atmosphere full of biting smoke, soot, and flames. Sometimes the people displayed that curious hysterical merriment that is often observed in the midst of disasters. Above the city hung a cloud of smoke that probably reached 20,000 feet in height. Even by day it made the macabre scene as dark as night. I kept trying to describe my impressions to Hitler. But he would interrupt me every time, almost as soon as I began, incidentally, Speer, how many tanks can you deliver next month? On November 26, 1943, four days after the destruction of my ministry, Another major air raid on Berlin started huge fires in our most important tank factory, Alkit. 
the Berlin Central Telephone Exchange had been destroyed? My colleague saw hit on the idea of reaching the Berlin Fire Department by way of our still intact direct line to the Fras headquarters. In this way Hitler, too, learned of the blaze, and without making any further inquiries ordered all the fire departments in the vicinity of Berlin to report to the burning tank plant. Meanwhile I had arrived at Halkit. The greater part of the main workshop had burned down, but the Berlin Fire Department had already succeeded in extinguishing the fire. As the result of Hitler's order, however, a steady stream of fire equipment from cities as far away as Brandenburg, Oranienburg, and Potsdam kept arriving. Since a direct order from the Führer had been issued, I could not persuade the chiefs to go on to other urgent fires. Early that morning the streets in a wide area around the tank factory were jammed with fire engines standing around doing nothing, while the fires spread unchecked in other parts of the city. In order to awaken my associates to the problems and anxieties about air armaments, Milch and I held a conference in September 1943 at the Air Force Experimental Center in Reichlin am Müritz Among other things, Milch and his technical experts spoke on the future production of enemy aircraft. Graphs were presented for type after type of aircraft, with emphasis especially on American production curves as compared with our own. What alarmed us most were the figures on the future increase in four motor daylight bombers. If these figures were accurate, what we were undergoing at the moment could be regarded only as a prelude. Naturally, the question arose as to how aware Hitler and Goering were of these figures. Bitterly, Milch told me that he had been trying for months to have his experts on enemy armaments deliver a report to Goering. But Goering refused to hear anything about it. The Führer had told him it was all propaganda, Milch said, and Goering was simply holding to this line. I too had no luck when I tried to force these production figures on Hitler's attention. Don't let them fool you. Those are all planted stories. Naturally those defeatists in the air ministry fall for them. With similar remarks he had thrust aside all warnings in the winter of 1942. Now, when our cities were one after the next being blasted into rubble, he would not change his tune. About this same time I witnessed a dramatic scene between Goering and General Gelland, who commanded his fighter planes. Gelland had reported to Hitler that day that several American fighter planes accompanying the bomber squadrons had been shot down over Aachen. He had added the warning that we were in grave peril if American fighters, thanks to improved fuel capacity, should soon be able to provide escort protection to the fleets of bombers on flights even deeper into Germany. Hitler had just relayed these points to Goering. Goering was embarking for Omington Heath on his special train when Gland came along to bid him goodbye. What's the idea of telling the Freyr that American fighters have penetrated into the territory of the Reich? Goering snapped at him. Herr Reichsmarschall, Gland replied with imperturbable calm, they will soon be flying even deeper. Goering spoke even more vehemently, that's nonsense, Gland. What gives you such fantasies? That's pure bluff. Glenn shook his head. Those are the facts, Herr Reichsmarschall. As he spoke he deliberately remained in a casual posture, his cap somewhat askew, a long cigar clamped between his teeth. American fighters have been shot down over Aachen. There is no doubt about it. Goring obstinately held his ground, that is simply not true, Glenn. It's impossible. Gland reacted with a touch of mockery, you might go and check it yourself, sir, the downed planes are there at Aachen. Goering tried to smooth matters over, come now, Gland, let me tell you something. I'm an experienced fighter pilot myself. I know what is possible. But I know what isn't, too. Admit you made a mistake. Gland only shook his head, until Goering finally declared. What must have happened is that they were shot down much farther to the west. I mean, if they were very high when they were shot down they could have glided quite a distance farther before they crashed. Not a muscle moved in Glenn's face. Glided to the east, sir? If my plane were shot up. Now then, Herr Gilland, Goering fulminated, 
Trying to put an end to the debate, I officially assert that the American fighter planes did not reach Arkin. The general ventured a last statement, but, sir, they were there. At this point Goering's self-control gave way. I here with give you an official order that they weren't there. Do you understand? The American fighters were not there. Get that. I intend to report that to the FRA. Goering simply let General Gallant stand there. But as he stalked off he turned once more and called out threateningly, You have my official order. With an unforgettable smile the general replied, Orders are orders, sir. Goering was not actually blind to reality. I would occasionally hear him make perceptive comments on the situation. Rather, he acted like a bankrupt who up to the last moment wants to deceive himself along with his creditors. Capricious treatment and blatant refusal to accept reality had already driven the first chief of Air Force procurement, the famous fighter pilot Ernst Hutt, to his death in 1941. On August 18, 1943, another of Goering's closest associates and the man who had been Air Force Chief of Staff for over four years, General Jess Konek, was found dead in his office. He too had committed suicide. On his table, so Milch told me, a note was found stating that he did not wish Goering to attend his funeral. Nevertheless Goering showed up at the ceremony and deposited a wreath from Hitler.21. I have always thought it was a most valuable trait to recognize reality and not to pursue delusions. But when I now think over my life up to and including the years of imprisonment, there was no period in which I was free of delusory notions. The departure from reality, which was visibly spreading like a contagion, was no peculiarity of the National Socialist regime. But in normal circumstances people who turn their backs on reality are soon set straight by the mockery and criticism of those around them, which makes them aware they have lost credibility. In the Third Reich there were no such correctives, especially for those who belonged to the upper stratum. On the contrary, every self-deception was multiplied as in a hall of distorting mirrors, becoming a repeatedly confirmed picture of a fantastical dream world which no longer bore any relationship to the grim outside world. In those mirrors I could see nothing but my own face reproduced many times over. No external factors disturbed the uniformity of hundreds of unchanging faces, all mine. There were differences of degree in the flight from reality. Thus Goebbels was surely many times closer to recognizing actualities than, say, during Orly. But these differences shrink to nothing when we consider how remote all of us, the illusionists as well as the so-called realists, were from what was really going on. 21. Hitler in the autumn of 1943. Both his old associates and his adjutants agreed that Hitler had undergone a change in the past year. This could scarcely be surprising, for during this period he had experienced Stalingrad, had looked on powerlessly as a quarter of a million soldiers surrendered in Tunisia, and had seen German cities leveled. Along with all this he had to approve the Navy's decision to withdraw the U-boats from the Atlantic, thus relinquishing one of his greatest hopes for victory. Undoubtedly, Hitler could see the meaning of this turn of affairs. And undoubtedly he reacted to it as human beings do, with disappointment, dejection, and increasingly forced optimism. In the years since then, Hitler may have become the object of sober studies for the historian. But for me he possesses to this day a substantiality and physical presence, as if he still existed in the flesh. Between the spring of 1942 and the summer of 1943 he sometimes spoke despondently. But, then, a curious transformation seemed to take place in him. Even in desperate situations he displayed confidence in ultimate victory. From this later period I can scarcely recall any remarks on the disastrous course of affairs, although I was expecting them. Had he gone on for so long persuading himself that he now firmly believed in victory? At any rate, the more inexorably events moved toward catastrophe, the more inflexible he became, the more rigidly convinced that everything he decided on was right. His closest associates noted his growing inaccessibility. He deliberately made his decisions in isolation. 
At the same time he had grown intellectually more sluggish and showed little inclination to develop new ideas. It was as if he were running along an unalterable track and could no longer find the strength to break out of it. Underlying all this was the impasse into which he had been driven by the superior power of his enemies. In January 1943 they had jointly issued a demand for Germany's unconditional surrender. Hitler was probably the only German leader who entertained no illusions about the seriousness of this statement. Goebbels, Goering, and the others would talk about exploiting the political antagonisms among the Allies. Still others imagined that Hitler would find some political device by which he could save the situation, even now. After all, had he not earlier, starting with the occupation of Austria up to the pact with the Soviet Union, contrived with apparent ease a succession of new tricks, new shifts, new finesses? But now, during the situation conferences, he more and more often declared, don't fool yourself. There is no turning back. We can only move forward. We have burned our bridges. In speaking this way Hitler was cutting his government off from any negotiation. The meaning of these words was first fully revealed at the Nuremberg trial. One of the causes for the changes in Hitler's personality, so I thought at the time, was the constant stress under which he labored. He was working in an unaccustomed way. Since the beginning of the Russian campaign he had abandoned his former staccato method of administering the affairs of government in flurries of activity, with spells of indolence in between. Instead, he regularly attended to an enormous daily mass of work. Whereas in the past he had known how to let others work for him, he now assumed more and more responsibility for details. As anxieties mounted, he made himself into a strictly disciplined worker. But such discipline ran counter to his nature, and this was inevitably reflected in the quality of his decisions. It is true that even before the war Hitler had shown signs of overwork. At times he would be distinctly averse to making decisions, would appear absent-minded, and would relapse into painful spells of monologuing. Or else he would fall into a sort of muteness or would say nothing more than an occasional yes or no. At such times it was not clear whether he still had his mind on the subject or was brooding on other thoughts. Earlier, however, these states of exhaustion did not usually last long. After staying at Ober Salzburg for a few weeks he would appear more relaxed. His eyes would be brighter, his capacity for reaction would have increased, and he would recover his pleasure in state business. In 1943, too, his entourage frequently urged him to take a vacation. At such times he would change the location of his headquarters and would go for weeks and sometimes even for months to Ober Salzburg. During the 20 months from July 28, 1941, to March 20, 1943, Hitler interrupted his stay in Rasenburg four times, for a total of 57 days. Beginning on March 20, 1943, on his doctor's urging, he went to Ober Salzburg for a three-month vacation and then worked for the next nine months in Rassenburg. After this, completely exhausted, he spent the four months after March 16, 1944, at Ober Salzburg and in Berlin. Damaris, Hitler's Redden, Volume 4, Munich, 1965. But these vacations did not involve any change in his daily routine. Bormann was always hovering nearby, with endless small questions which the Führer had to settle. There was a stream of callers, gauletters or ministers who could not obtain admission to headquarters and who now insisted on seeing him. Along with all this the lengthy daily situation conferences went on, for the entire military staff came along to wherever Hitler happened to be staying. Hitler frequently said, when we expressed concern for his health, it's easy to advise me to take a vacation. But it's impossible. I cannot leave current military decisions to others even for 24 hours. The people in Hitler's military entourage had been used to concentrated daily work from their youth. They could not have realized how overstrained Hitler was. Bormann, likewise, seemed unable to understand that he was asking too much of Hitler. But even apart from this, Hitler neglected to do what every factory executive must do, appoint good deputies for each important phase of his work. 
He had neither a competent executive chief nor a vigorous head of the armed forces nor even a capable commander in chief of the army. He continually flouted the old rule that the higher his position the more free time a man should have available. Formerly, he had abided by this rule. Overwork and isolation led to a peculiar state of petrifaction and rigor. He suffered from spells of mental torpor and was permanently caustic and irritable. Earlier, he had made decisions with almost sportive ease, now, he had to force them out of his exhausted brain. One as a former racing shell crewman I knew about the phenomenon of overtraining. I remembered how, when we reached such a state, our performance dropped, we became dull and irritable and lost all flexibility. We would become automatons to such an extent that a rest period seemed actually unwelcome and all we wanted was to go on training. Excessive intellectual strain can produce similar symptoms. During the difficult days of the war, I could observe in myself how my mind went on working mechanically, while at the same time my ability to absorb fresh impressions diminished and I made decisions in an apathetic way. The fact that Hitler left the darkened chancellery in silence and secrecy on the night of September 3, 1939, in order to go to the front, proved to be a step of high significance for the subsequent years. His relationship to the people had changed. Even when he did come into contact with the populace, at intervals of many months, their enthusiasm and capacity to respond to him had faded and his magnetic power over them seemed likewise to have fled. In the early thirties, during the final phases of the struggle for power, Hitler had driven himself as hard as during the second half of the war. But he probably drew more impetus and courage from those mass meetings than he himself had poured out upon the multitude. Even during the period between 1933 and 1939, when his position made life easier for him, he was visibly refreshed by the daily procession of admirers who came to pay homage to him at Ober Salzburg. The rallies in the pre-war period had also been a stimulant to Hitler. They were part of his life, and each one left him more incisive and self-assured than he had been before. The private circle, his secretaries, doctors, and adjutants, in which he moved at headquarters was, if possible, even less stimulating than the pre-war circle at Ober Salzburg had been, or the circle in the chancellery. Here there were no people so carried away by his aura that they could hardly speak. Daily association with Hitler, as I had already observed in the days when he and I dreamed together over building projects, reduced him from the demigod Goebbels had made of him to a human being with all ordinary human needs and weaknesses, although his authority remained intact. Hitler's military entourage, too, must have been tiring to him. For in the matter of fact atmosphere of headquarters any touch of idolatry would have made a bad impression. On the contrary, the military officers remained distinctly dispassionate. Even had they not been so by nature, restrained etiquette was part of their training. For that reason the Byzantine flatteries of Key Eitel and Goering seemed all the more obtrusive. Moreover, they did not sound genuine. Hitler himself encouraged his military entourage not to be servile. In that atmosphere objectivity remained the dominant note. Hitler would not listen to criticism about his own life pattern. Consequently, members of his entourage had to conceal their worries and accept his habits for what they were. More and more he avoided conversations of a personal nature, aside from the rare sentimental talks he had with a few of his comrades from the early days such as Goebbels, Lee, or Usser. To me and others he spoke in an impersonal, rather aloof manner. Occasionally, Hitler still made decisions alertly and spontaneously, as he had in the past, and once in a long while he would even listen attentively to opposing arguments. But these times had become so unusual that we afterward made special note of them. Schmunt and I hit on the idea of bringing young frontline officers to Hitler, in order to introduce a little of the mood of the outside world into the stale, hermetic atmosphere of the headquarters. But our efforts came to naught. For one thing Hitler seemed unwilling to spare the time for such things, and then we also realized that these interviews did more harm than good. 
For example, a young tank officer reported that during the advance along that Iraq his unit had encountered hardly any resistance and had had to check the advance only because it ran out of ammunition. In his overwrought state of mind, Hitler kept brooding on the matter for days afterward. The you have it. Too little ammunition for the 7.5 cm guns. What's the matter with production? It must be increased at once by every possible means. Actually, given our limited facilities there was enough of this ammunition available, but the supply lines were so overextended that the supplies had not caught up with the tempestuous advance of the tank troops. Hitler, however, refused to take this factor into account. On such occasions the young frontline officers would disclose other details into which Hitler immediately read major errors of omission on the part of the general staff. In reality most of the difficulties arose from the tempo of the advances, which Hitler insisted on. It was impossible for the army staff to discuss this matter with him, since he had no knowledge of the complicated logistics involved in such advances. At long intervals Hitler still continued to receive officers and enlisted men on whom he was to confer high military decorations. Given his distrust in the competence of his staff, there were often dramatic scenes and peremptory orders after such visits. In order to avert such complications, Key Eitel and Schmund did their best to neutralize the visitors beforehand, insofar as they could. Hitler's evening tea to which he invited guests even at headquarters, had in the course of time been shifted to two o'clock in the morning and did not end before three or four o'clock. The time when he went to bed had also been shifted more and more into the early morning, so that I once commented, if the war goes on much longer we'll at least come around to the normal working hours of an early riser and take Hitler's evening tea as our breakfast. Hitler unquestionably suffered from insomnia. He spoke of the agony of lying awake if he went to bed earlier. During the tea he would often complain that the day before he had only been able to snatch a few hours of rest in the morning, after many hours of sleeplessness. Only the intimates were admitted to these teas, his doctors, his secretaries, his military and civilian adjutants, the press chief's deputy, the foreign ministry's representative, Ambassador Huell, sometimes his Viennese diet cook such visitors as were close to Hitler, and the inevitable Bormann. I too was welcome as a guest any time. We sat stiffly in Hitler's dining room in uncomfortable armchairs. On these occasions Hitler still loved a gemutlich atmosphere, with, if possible, a fire in the fireplace. He passed cake to the secretaries with emphatic gallantry and tried to achieve a tone of friendliness with his guests like an easygoing host. I felt pity for him. There was always something misbegotten about his attempts to radiate warmth in order to receive it. Since music was banned at headquarters, there remained only conversation, with Hitler himself doing most of the talking. His familiar jokes were appreciated as if they had been heard for the first time, his stories of his harsh youth or the days of struggle were listened to as raptly as if they were being told for the first time but this circle could not whip up much liveliness or contribute to the conversation. It was an unwritten law that events at the front, politics, or criticism of leaders must be avoided. Naturally, Hitler, too, had no need to talk about such matters. Only Bormann had the privilege of making provocative remarks. Sometimes, too, our letter from Eva Braun would send Hitler into a fit, for she was apt to cite cases of blatant stupidity on the part of officials. When, for example, regulations were issued forbidding the people of Munich from going to the mountains for skiing, Hitler became extremely excited and launched into tirades about his everlasting struggle against the idiocy of the bureaucracy. In the end, Bormann would be ordered to look into such cases. The banality of the subjects indicated that Hitler's threshold of irritability had become extremely low. On the other hand, such trivialities really had a kind of relaxing effect on him, since they led him back to a world in which he could still issue effective orders. For the moment at least he could forget the impotence that had plagued him since his enemies had begun to shape the course of events. Even though he still played at being master of the situation and his circle did its best to abet him in his illusions, 
elements of the truth forced themselves upon his consciousness. At such moments, he would go back to his old litany that he had become a politician against his will, that basically he was an architect but that he had been out of luck, the kind of projects that would have suited his talents were not being built. Only when he himself was head of government was the right land of building possible. He had only one remaining wish, he would say in one of those bursts of self-pity which became more and more frequent these days. As soon as possible I want to hang the field grey jacket on its nail again. Since the beginning of the war he had worn military dress rather than his old party uniform, and he had promised the Reichstag that he would not put it aside until the war was over, just as Isabella of Castile had once sworn not to take off her chemise until the country was liberated from the Moors. When I have ended the war victoriously, my life's task will be fulfilled and I'll withdraw to the home of my old age, in Linz, across the Danube. Then my successor can worry about these problems. He had, it is true, sometimes spoken in this vein before the beginning of the war, during those more relaxed tea times at Ober Salzburg. But in those days, I suspect, all that was mere coquettishness. Now, he formulated such thoughts unsentimentally, in a normal conversational tone and with a credible note of bitterness. His abiding interest in the plans for the city of his retirement years also gradually assumed an escapist character. Toward the end of the war, Hermann Gessler, the chief architect of Linz, was summoned to headquarters more and more frequently to present his designs, whereas Hitler scarcely ever asked for the Hamburg, Berlin, Nuremberg, or Munich plans which had previously meant so much to him. When he considered the torments he now had to endure, he would say gloomily, death could only mean a release for him. In keeping with this mood, when he studied the Linz plans he would repeatedly turn to the sketches for his tomb, which was to be located in one of the towers of the Linz complex of party buildings. Even after a victorious war, he emphasized, he did not want to be no buried beside his field marshals in the soldiers' hall in Berlin. During these nocturnal conversations in the Ukrainian or East Prussian headquarters, Hitler often gave the impression of being slightly unbalanced. The leaden heaviness of the early morning hours weighed on those few of us who participated. Only politeness and a sense of duty could induce us to attend the teas. For after the day of strenuous conferences, we could scarcely keep our eyes open during the monotonous conversations. Before Hitler appeared, someone might ask, say, where is moral this evening? Someone else would reply crossly, he hasn't been here the past three evenings. One of the secretaries, he could stand staying up late once in a while. It's always the same dot dot I'd love to sleep too. Another, we really should arrange to take turns. It isn't fair for some to shirk and the same people have to be here all the time. Of course Hitler was still revered by this circle, but his nimbus was distinctly wearing thin. After Hitler had eaten breakfast late in the morning, the daily newspapers and press information sheets were presented to him. The press reports were crucially important in forming his opinions. They also had a great deal to do with his mood. Where specific foreign news items were concerned, he instantly formulated the official German position, usually highly aggressive, which he would then dictate word for word to his press chief, Dr. Dietrich, or to Dietrich's deputy, Lawrence. Hitler would boldly intrude on all areas of government, usually without consulting the ministers in question, such as Goebbels or Ribbentrop or even bothering to inform them beforehand. After that, Kewell reported on foreign events, which Hitler took more calmly than he did the press notices. In hindsight it seems to me that he considered the reverberations more important than the realities, that the newspaper accounts interested him more than the events themselves. Schaub then brought in the reports of last night's air raids, which had been passed on from the Gauleiters to Bormann. Since I often went to look at the production facilities in the damaged cities a day or two later, I can judge that Hitler was correctly informed on the degree of destruction. It would in fact have been unwise of a Gauleiter to minimize the damage, since his prestige could only increase if, 
in spite of the devastation, he succeeded in restoring normal life and production. Hitler was obviously shaken by these reports, although less by the casualties among the populace or the bombing of residential areas than by the destruction of valuable buildings, especially theaters. As in his plans for the reshaping of German cities before the war, he was primarily interested in public architecture and seemed to give little thought to social distress and human misery. Consequently, he was likely to demand that burnt out theaters be rebuilt immediately. Several times I tried to remind him of other strains upon the construction industry. Apparently the local political authorities were also less than eager to carry out these unpopular orders, and Hitler, in any case sufficiently taken up by the military situation, seldom inquired about the way the work was going. Only in Munich, his second home, and in Berlin did he insist that the opera houses be rebuilt at great expenditure of labor and money. Too. Incidentally, Hitler betrayed a remarkable ignorance of the true situation and the mood of the populace when he answered all objections with, theatrical performances are needed precisely because the morale of the people must be maintained. The urban population certainly had other things to worry about. Once more, such remarks showed to what extent Hitler was rooted in a bourgeois milieu. While reading these reports, Hitler was in the habit of raging against the British government and the Jews, who were to blame for these air aids. We could force the enemy to stop by building a large fleet of bombers ourselves, he declared. Whenever I objected that we had neither the planes nor explosives for heavy bombing, 3 he always returned the same answer, you've made so many things possible, Sbeer. You'll manage that too. It seems to me, in retrospect, that our ability to produce more and more in spite of the air aids must have been one of the reasons that Hitler did not really take the air battle over Germany seriously. Consequently, Milch's and my proposals that the manufacture of bombers be radically reduced in favor of increased fighter plane production was rejected until it was too late. I tried a few times to persuade Hitler to travel to the bombed cities and let himself be seen the dot for Goebbels, too had tried to put over the same idea, but in vain. He lamented Hitler's obstinacy and referred enviously to the conduct of Churchill, when I think of the propaganda value A I could make of such a visit. But Hitler regularly brushed away any such suggestion. During his drives from Stettin Station to the Chancellery, or to his apartment in Prince Regentenstrasse in Munich, he now ordered his chauffeur to take the shortest route, whereas he formerly loved long detours. Since I accompanied him several times on such drives, I saw with what absence of emotion he noted the new areas of rubble through which his car would pass. Morel had advised Hitler to take long walks, and it would indeed have been very easy to lay out a few paths in the adjacent East Prussian woods. But Hitler vetoed any such project. The result was that his daily airing consisted of a small circuit barely a hundred yards long within restricted area I. On these walks Hitler's interest was usually focused not on his companions but on his Alsatian dog Blondie. He used these intervals for training purposes. After a few exercises in fetching, the dog had to balance on a board about a foot wide and twenty-five feet long, mounted at a height of more than six feet. Hitler knew. Of course, that a dog regards the man who feeds him as his master. Before the attendant opened the dog cage, Hitler usually let the excited dog leap up against the wire partitions for a few minutes, barking and whimpering with joy and hunger. Since I stood in special favor, I was sometimes allowed to accompany Hitler to this feeding, whereas all the others had to watch the process at a distance. The dog probably occupied the most important role in Hitler's private life, he meant more to his master than the Fra's closest associates. Hitler frequently took his meals alone when no guest he liked was at headquarters. In that case only the dog kept him company. As a matter of course, during my two or three day stays at headquarters I was asked to dine with the Fra once or twice. People no doubt thought we were discussing important general matters or personal subjects during these meals. But even I found there was no talking with Hitler about broader aspects of the military situation, or even the economic situation. 
we stuck to trivial subjects or dreary production figures. Initially, he remained interested in the matters that had absorbed both of us in the past, such as the future shaping of German cities. He also wanted to plan a transcontinental railroad network which would link his future empire together economically. After he decided on the size of the wide gauge track he wanted for the railroad, he began considering various car types and plunging into detailed calculations on freight tonnages. Such matters occupied him during his sleepless nights. The idea behind this transcontinental service was that a single train would transport as much as a freighter. Hitler felt that sea travel was never sufficiently safe and was certainly unreliable in wartime. Even where plans for new railroad facilities had already been completed, as in Berlin and Munich, an extra pair of tracks had to be added for Hitler's new railroad system. The transportation ministry thought that the drawbacks of two railroad systems more than outweighed the possible advantages, but Hitler had become obsessed with this idea, he decided that it was even more important as a binding force in his empire than the Autobahn system. From month to month Hitler became more taciturn. It may also be that he let himself go with me and made less of an effort at conversation than he did with other guests. In any case, from the autumn of 1943 on, a lunch with him became an ordeal. In silence, we spooned up our soup. While we waited for the next course we might make a few remarks about the weather, whereupon Hitler would usually say something acid about the incompetence of the weather bureau. Finally the conversation would revert to the quality of the food. He was highly pleased with his diet cook and praised her skill at vegetarian cuisine. If a dish seemed to him especially good, he asked me to have a taste of it. He was forever worried about gaining weight. Out of the question. Imagine me going around with a pot belly. It would mean political ruin after making such remarks he would frequently call his orderly, to put an end to temptation, take this away, please, I like it too much. Incidentally, even here at headquarters he would often make fun of meat eaters but he did not attempt to sway me. He even had no objection to a Steinhage after fatty food, although he commented pityingly that he did not need it, with his fare. If there were a meat broth I could depend on his speaking of corpse tea, in connection with crayfish he brought out his story of a deceased grandmother whose relations had thrown her body into the brook to lure crustaceans, for eels, that they were best fattened and caught by using dead cats. Earlier, during those evenings in the Chancellery, Hitler had never been shy about repeating stories as often as he pleased. But now, in these times of retreats and impending doom, such repetitions had to be regarded as signs that he was in an especially good humor. For most of the time a deadly silence prevailed. I had the impression of a man whose life was slowly ebbing away. During conferences that often lasted for hours, or during meals, Hitler ordered his dog to lie down in a certain comer. Though the animal settled with a protesting growl. If he felt that he was not being watched, he crawled closer to his master's seat and after elaborate maneuvers finally landed with his snout against Hitler's knee, whereupon a sharp command banished him to his comer again. I avoided, as did any reasonably prudent visitor to Hitler, arousing any feelings of friendship in the dog. That was often not so easy especially when at meals the dog laid his head on my knee and in this position attentively studied the pieces of meat, which he evidently preferred to his master's vegetarian dishes. When Hitler noticed such disloyalty, he irritably called the dog back. But still the dog remained the only living creature at headquarters who aroused any flicker of human feeling in Hitler. Only, the dog was mute. Hitler's deep estrangement from people proceeded slowly almost imperceptibly. From about the autumn of 1943 on, he used to make one remark which was all too revealing of his unhappy isolation, Speer, one of these days I'll have only two friends left, Fräulein Braun and my dog. His tone was so misanthropic, and the remark seemed to be wrung from such depths that it would not have done for me to assure him of my own loyalty. That was the one and only prediction of Hitler's that proved to be absolutely right. But that those two remained true to him was certainly no credit to Hitler, 
but rather to the staunchness of his mistress and the dependency of his dog. Later, in my many years of imprisonment, I discovered what it meant to live under great psychological pressure. Only then did I realize that Hitler's life had borne a great resemblance to that of a prisoner. His bunker, although it did not yet have the tomb-like proportions it was to assume in July 1944, had the thick walls and ceilings of a prison. Iron doors and iron shutters guarded the few openings, and even his meager walks within the barbed wire brought him no more fresh air and contact with nature than a prisoner's endless tramp around the prison yard. Hitler's hour came when the main situation conference began after lunch, around two o'clock. Outwardly, the scene had not changed since the spring of 1942. Almost the same generals and adjutants gathered around the big map table. Only now all the participants seemed to have been aged and worn by the events of the past year and a half. Indifferent and rather resigned, they received his watchwords and commands. Positive aspects were played up. From the testimony of prisoners and special reports from the Russian front, it might appear that the enemy would soon be exhausted. The Russian casualties seemed to be much higher than ours because of their offensives, higher even in proportion to the relative sizes of our populations. Reports of insignificant successes loomed larger and larger in the course of these discussions, until they had become for Hitler and controvertible evidence that Germany would after all be able to delay the Soviet onslaught until the Russians had been bled white. Moreover, many of us believed that Hitler would end the war at the right time. To forecast what we might expect in the next few months, Jodl prepared a report to Hitler. At the same time he tried to revive his real job as Chief of the Armed Forces Operations Staff, which Hitler had more and more taken over. Jodl knew well Hitler's distrust for arguments based on calculations. Toward the end of 1943, Hitler was still speaking scornfully of a projection by General Georg Thomas which had rated the Soviet war potential as extremely high. Hitler was irate over this memorandum, and soon after its presentation he had forbidden Thomas and the OKW to undertake any further studies of this type. When around the autumn of 1944 my planning board, in an earnest effort to help the military operations staff make its decisions worked out a memorandum on the enemy's armaments capacities, we received a reprimand from Key Eitel and were told not to transmit such documents to the OKW. Thus, Jodl knew that there were serious barriers that prevented him from delivering his report. He therefore appointed a young Air Force colonel named Christian to give a quick sketch of the matter at one of the situation conferences. The colonel had the rather significant advantage of being married to one of Hitler's secretaries, one of those who belonged to the nightly tea time circle. The idea was to discern the enemy's possible long run tactical plans and what the consequences would be for us. But aside from the scene of Colonel Christians showing a completely silent Hitler various places on several large maps of Europe, I no longer recall what happened with this attempt. In any case, it failed miserably. Without much fuss, and without any rebellion on the part of those concerned, Hitler continued to make all decisions himself, in total disregard of any technical basis. He dispensed with analyses of the situation and logistical calculations. He did not rely on any study group which would examine all aspects of offensive plans in terms of their effectiveness and possible countermeasures by the enemy. The headquarters staffs were more than competent to carry out these functions of modem warfare, it would only have been necessary to activate them. To be sure, Hitler would accept information about partial aspects of situations, but the grand synthesis was supposed to be born solely in his head. His field marshals as well as his closest associates had, therefore, merely advisory functions for his decision had usually been forged beforehand and only minor aspects of it were subject to change. Moreover, whatever he had learned from the Eastern Campaign in the years 1942-43 was rigorously repressed. Decisions were made in a total vacuum. At headquarters, where everyone lived under the tremendous pressure of responsibility, probably nothing was more welcome than a dictate from above. 
that meant being freed of a decision and simultaneously being provided with an excuse for failure. Only rarely did I hear of a member of the headquarters staff applying for frontline service in order to escape the permanent conflicts of conscience to which all at headquarters were exposed. To this day the whole thing remains an enigma for me. For in spite of a great deal of criticism hardly any one of us ever managed to put across our reservations. Actually, we were hardly conscious of them. In the stupefying world of the headquarters we remained unmoved by what Hitler's decisions must mean at the front, where men were fighting and dying. Yet time and again our men found themselves in emergencies that could have been avoided had Hitler not staved off a retreat proposed by the general staff. No one could expect the chief of state to go to the front regularly. But as commander in chief of the army, who moreover decided on so many details himself, he was obliged to do so. If he were too ill, then he should have appointed someone else, if he were fearful for his life, he had no right to be commander in chief of the army. A few trips to the front could easily have shown him and his staff the fundamental errors that were costing so much blood. But Hitler and his military advisors thought they could lead the army from their maps. They knew nothing of the Russian winter and its road conditions, nor of the hardships of soldiers who had to live in holes in the ground, without quarters, inadequately equipped, exhausted and half frozen. Their resistance had long since been shattered. At the situation conferences Hitler took these units as up to full strength, and under the delusion they were committed. He pushed about on the map divisions that had worn themselves out in previous fighting and now lacked arms and ammunition. Moreover, Hitler frequently set schedules that were completely unrealistic. Since he invariably ordered immediate action, the advance detachments came under fire before the task force could bring its full firepower to bear. The result was that the men were led piecemeal up to the enemy and slowly annihilated. The communications apparatus at headquarters was remarkable for that period. It was possible to communicate directly with all the important theaters of war. But Hitler overestimated the merits of the telephone, radio, and teletype. For thanks to this apparatus the responsible army commanders were robbed of every chance for independent action, in contrast to earlier wars. Hitler was constantly intervening on their sectors of the front. Because of this communications apparatus individual divisions in all the theaters of war could be directed from Hitler's table in the situation room. The more fearful the situation, the greater was the gulf modem technology created between reality and the fantasies with which the man at this table operated. Military leadership is primarily a matter of intelligence, tenacity, and iron nerves. Hitler thought he had all these qualities in far greater measure than his generals. Again and again he predicted, although only after the disaster of the winter of 1941-42, that even the worst situations could be overcome and, indeed, that only in such situations would he prove how firmly he stood and how sound his nerves were. On July 26, 1944, Hitler boasted to the heads of industry, all I know is that unprecedentedly strong nerves and unprecedented resolution are necessary if a leader is to survive in times such as these and make decisions which concern our very existence. Any other man in my place would have been unable to do what I have done, his nerves would not have been strong enough. Such remarks were scarcely complimentary toward the officers present but Hitler was often capable of turning to the general staff officers of his entourage and insulting them directly. He would tell them that they were not steadfast, that they were always wanting to retreat, that they were prepared to give up ground without any reason. These cowards on the general staff would never have dared to start a war, he would say, they had always advised against it, always maintained that our forces were far too weak. But who had been proved right, if not himself? He would run down the usual list of earlier military successes and review the negative attitudes of the general staff before these operations began, which produced a ghostly impression, given the situation that had meanwhile arisen. In going over the past that way he might lose his temper, flush deeply, and in a rapid, loud voice breaking with excitement burst out, they aren't only notorious cowards, they're dishonest as well. 
they're notorious liars. The training of the general staff is a school of lying and deception. Zietzler, these figures are false. You yourself are being lied to. Believe me, the situation is deliberately being represented as unfavorable. That's how they want to force me to authorize retreats. Invariably, Hitler ordered the bends in the front to be held at all costs, and just as invariably the Soviet forces would overrun the position after a few days or weeks. Then there followed new rages, mingled with fresh denunciations of the officers and, frequently, complaints against the German soldiers. The soldier of the First World War was much tougher. Think of all they had to go through, in Verdun, on the Somme. Today, they would run away from that land of thing. A good many of the officers who came in for these tongue lashings later joined the July 20, 1944, conspiracy against Hitler. That plot cast its shadow before. In the past Hitler had had a fine sense of discrimination and was able to adapt his language to the people around him. Now he was unrestrained and reckless. His speech became an overflowing torrent like that of a prisoner who betrays dangerous secrets even to his prosecutor. In his talk Hitler seemed to me to be obeying an obsession. In order to supply evidence for posterity that he had always issued the right orders, as early as the late autumn of 1942, Hitler sent for certified stenographers from the Reichstag who from then on sat at the table during the situation conference and took down every word. Sometimes, when Hitler thought he had found the way out of a dilemma, he would add, have you got that? Yes, someday people will see that I was right. But these idiotic general staff officers refused to believe me. Even when the troops were retreating, he would declare triumphantly, didn't I order so and so three days ago? Again my order hasn't been carried out. They don't carry out my orders and afterward they lie and blame the Russians. They lie when they say the Russians prevented them from carrying out the order. Hitler refused to admit that his failures were due to the weak position into which he had cast us by insisting on a war on many fronts. Only a few months before, the stenographers who unexpectedly found themselves in this madhouse had probably envisioned Hitler as a superior genius, just as Goebbels had taught them. Here they were forced to catch a glimpse of the reality. I can still see them distinctly as they sat writing, sallow-faced, or in their free time pacing back and forth at headquarters with a downcast air. They seemed to me like envoys from the populace who were condemned to witness the tragedy from front row. At the beginning of the war in the East, Hitler, captive to his theory that the Slavs were subhuman, had called the war against them child's play. But the longer the war lasted, the more the Russians gained his respect. He was impressed by the stoicism with which they had accepted their early defeats. He spoke admiringly of Stalin, particularly stressing the parallels to his own endurance. The danger that hung over Moscow in the winter of 1941 struck him as similar to his present predicament. In a brief access of confidence, 5 he might remark with a jesting tone of voice that it would be best, after victory over Russia, to entrust the administration of the country to Stalin under German hegemony, of course, since he was the best imaginable man to handle the Russians. In general he regarded Stalin as a kind of colleague. When Stalin's son was taken prisoner it was out of this respect, perhaps, that Hitler ordered him to be given especially good treatment. Much had changed since that day after the armistice with France when Hitler predicted that a war with the Soviet Union would be child's play. In contrast to his ultimate realization that he was dealing with a formidable enemy in the East, Hitler clung to the end to his preconceived opinion that the troops of the Western countries were poor fighting material. Even the Allied successes in Africa and Italy could not shake his belief that these soldiers would run away from the first serious onslaught. He was convinced that democracy enfeebled a nation. As late as the summer of 1944 he held to his theory that all the ground that had been lost in the West would be quickly reconquered. His opinions on the Western statesmen had a similar bias. He considered Churchill, as he often stated during the situation conferences, an incompetent, alcoholic demagogue. 
and he asserted in all seriousness that Roosevelt was not a victim of infantile paralysis but of syphilitic paralysis and was therefore mentally unsound. These opinions, too, were indications of his flight from reality in the last years of his life. Within restricted area I in Rasenberg a tea house had been built. Its furnishings were a pleasant change from the general drabness. Here we occasionally met for a glass of vermouth, here field marshals waited before conferring with Hitler. He himself avoided this tea house and thus escaped encounters with the generals and staff officers of the high command and of the armed forces. But for a few days, after fascism had ingloriously come to an end in Italy on July 25, 1943, and Badoglio had taken over the government, Hitler sat there over tea several afternoons with perhaps ten of his military and political associates, among them Key Eitel, Jodl, and Bormann. Suddenly, Jodl blurted out, come to think of it, fascism simply burst like a soap bubble. A horrified silence followed, until someone launched another subject, whereupon Jodl, visibly alarmed, flushed beet red. A few weeks afterward Prince Philip of Hesse was invited to the headquarters. He was one of the few followers whom Hitler always treated with deference and respect. Philip had often been useful to him, and especially in the early years of the Third Reich had arranged contacts with the heads of Italian fascism. In addition he had helped Hitler purchase valuable artworks. The prince had been able to arrange their export from Italy through his connections with the Italian royal house, to which he was related. When the prince wanted to leave again after a few days, Hitler bluntly told him that he would not be allowed to leave headquarters. He continued to treat him with the greatest outward courtesy and invited him to his meals. But the members of Hitler's entourage, who until then had been so fond of talking with a real prince, avoided him as if he had a contagious disease. On September 9th, Prince Philip and Princess Mafalda, the Italian king's daughter, were taken to a concentration camp on Hitler's direct orders. For weeks afterward Hitler boasted that he had begun suspecting early in the game that Prince Philip was sending information to the Italian royal house. He himself had kept an eye on him, Hitler said, and ordered his telephone conversations tapped. By methods such as these it had been discovered that the prince was passing number codes to his wife. Nevertheless, Hitler had continued to treat the prince with marked friendliness. That had been part of his tactics, he declared, obviously delighted with his gifts as a detective. The arrest of the prince and his wife reminded all those who were similarly close to Hitler that they had put themselves utterly into his hands. The feeling spread, unconsciously, that Hitler might be covertly and meanly keeping watch on anyone among his intimates and might deliver him up to a similar fate without giving him the slightest opportunity to justify himself. Mussolini's relationship to Hitler had been for all of us, ever since the Duce's support during the Austrian crisis, the very symbol of amity. After the Italian chief of state was overthrown and vanished without a trace, Hitler seemed to be inspired with a kind of Nibelungian loyalty. Again and again in the situation conferences he insisted that everything must be done to locate the missing Duce. He declared that Mussolini's fate was a nightmare that weighed on him day and night. On September 12, 1943, a conference was held in headquarters to which the Gauleiters of Tyrol and Carinthia were invited, along with me. It was settled that not only South Tyrol but also the Italian territory as far as Verona would be placed under the administration of Gaulita Hofor of Tyrol. Large parts of Venetia, including Trieste, were assigned to the territory of Gaulita Rena of Carinthia. I was given jurisdiction in all questions of armaments and production for the remaining Italian territory and powers over and above those of the Italian authorities. Then came a great surprise. A few hours after the signing of these decrees Mussolini's liberation was announced. The two Gauleiters thought their newly acquired domains were lost again. So did I. The Fro won't expect the Duce to swallow that. I said. Shortly afterward I met Hitler again and proposed that he cancel the new arrangement. I assumed that this was what he meant to do. To my surprise he fended off the suggestion. The decree would continue to be valid, he said. 
I pointed out to him that with a new Italian government formed under Mussolini, he could hardly infringe on Italy's sovereignty. Hitler reflected briefly, then said, present my decree to me for signature again, dated tomorrow. Then there will be no doubt that my order is not affected by the Duce's liberation. 6. Undoubtedly Hitler had already been informed, a few days before this amputation of northern Italy, that the place where Mussolini was being held prisoner had been located. It seems a fair guess that we were called to headquarters so quickly precisely because of the impending liberation of the Duce. The next day Mussolini arrived in Rosenberg. Hitler embraced him, sincerely moved. On the anniversary of the Three Power Pact, Hitler sent to the Duce, with whom he declared himself linked in friendship, his warmest wishes for the future of an Italy once more led to honorable freedom by fascism. Two weeks before, Hitler had mutilated Italy. 22. Downhill. The mounting figures for armaments production strengthened my position until the autumn of 1943. After we had virtually exhausted the industrial reserves of Germany, I tried to exploit the industrial potential of the other European countries we controlled. One Hitler was at first reluctant to make full use of the capacity of the West. And in years to come, he had decided, the occupied Eastern territories were actually to be deindustrialized. For industry, he held, promoted communism and bred an unwanted class of intellectuals. But conditions quickly proved stronger than all such theories. Hitler was hard headed enough to recognize how useful intact industries could be towards solving the problems of troop supply. France was the most important of the occupied industrial countries. Until the spring of 1943, however, its industrial production scarcely helped us. Sorkel's forcible recruiting of labor had done more damage there than its results warranted. For in order to escape forced labor, the French workers fled their factories, quite a few of which were producing for our armaments needs. In May 1943, I remonstrated to Sorkel about this. That July at a conference in Paris I proposed that at least the factories in France that were working for us be immune from Sorkel's levies. Office Journal, July 23, 1943 the minister proposed to improve the situation by designating protected factories. These would be guaranteed against levying of workers and would thus be made more attractive to French labor. My associates and I intended to have the factories in France particularly, but also in Belgium and Holland, produce large quantities of goods for the German civilian population, such as clothing, shoes, textiles, and furniture in order to free similar factories in Germany for armaments. As soon as I was charged with all of German production at the beginning of September, I invited the French Minister of Production to Berlin. Minister Bichelon, a professor at the Sorbonne, was reputed to be a capable and energetic man. After some bickering with the Foreign Office, I ensured that Bichelon would be treated as a state visitor. To win that point I had to appeal to Hitler explaining to him that Bichelon was not going to come up the back stairs to see me. As a result, the French production minister was quartered in the Berlin government guest house. Five days before Bichelon arrived I cleared the idea with Hitler that we would set up a production planning council on a pan-European basis, with France as an equal partner along with the other nations. The assumption was, of course, that Germany would retain the decisive voice in this planning. Two. On September 17, 1943, I received Bichelon, and before very long a distinctly personal relationship sprang up between us. We were both young, we believed the future was on our side, and both of us therefore promised ourselves that someday we would avoid the mistakes of the First World War generation that was presently governing. I was even prepared to prevent what Hitler had in mind in the way of carving up France, all the more so since in a Europe integrated economically it did not matter where the frontiers ran. Such were the utopian thoughts in which Bichelon and I lost ourselves for a while at that time, a token of the world of illusions and dreams in which we were moving. On the last day of the negotiations Bichelon asked to have a private talk with me. At the instigation of Sorkel, he began, 
Premier Lovell had forbidden him to discuss the question of the transportation of workers from France to Germany. Aid would I nevertheless be willing to deal with the question? I said I would. Beechelon explained his concern, and I finally asked him whether a measure protecting French industrial plants from deportations would help him. If that is possible, then all my problems are solved, including those relating to the program we have just agreed on, Beechelon said with relief. But then the transfer of labor from France to Germany will virtually cease. I must tell you that in all honesty. I was fully aware of that, but this seemed the only way I could harness French industrial production to our purposes. Both of us had done something unusual. Beechelon had disobeyed an instruction from Laval, and I had disavowed Sorkel. Both of us, basically without the backing of our superiors, had come to a far-reaching agreement. Sorkel pointed this out at the central planning meeting, March 1, 1944, it is certainly difficult for me as a German to be confronted with a situation which all too plainly tells the French industries in France they have been placed under protection simply to keep them out of the grasp of Sorkel. Our production plan would offer benefits to both countries. I would gain armaments capacity while the French appreciated the chance to resume peacetime production in the midst of war. In collaboration with the military commander in France, restricted factories would be established throughout the country. Placards posted in these factories would promise immunity from Sorkel's levies to all the workers employed in them. I personally would stand behind this pledge, since the placards would bear my signature in facsimile. But French basic industry also had to be strengthened, transportation guaranteed, food production assured, so that ultimately almost every important productive unit, in the end a total of 10,000, would be shielded from Sorkel. Beechelon and I spent the weekend at the country house of my friend Armo Brecker. On Monday, I informed Sorkel's associates of the new arrangements. I called upon them to direct their efforts from then on to inducing workers to go back to French factories. Their numbers, I pledged, would be reckoned in on the quota of assignments to German armaments production. 4. Ten days later I was at the Fras headquarters to beat Sorkel to the punch in reporting to Hitler. And in fact Hitler proved content, he approved my arrangements and was even ready to take into account possible production losses because of riots or strikes. 5. In this way Sorkel's operations in France virtually came to an end. Instead of the previous monthly quota of 50,000, before long only 5,000 workers a month were being taken to Germany. See Nuremberg document RF 22. On June 27, 1943, Sorkel wrote to Hitler, Therefore I ask you, mein Führer, to accept my proposal that another half a million French men and women be imported into the Reich until the end of the war. According to a notation by his assistant, Dr. Strothfang, dated July 28, 1943, Hitler had already agreed to this measure. A few months later, on March 1, 1944, Sorkel reported angrily, I hear from my offices in France that everything is finished there. We might as well close down, they tell me. It's the same story in every prefecture, Minister Beechelon has made an agreement with Minister Speer. Laval has the nerve to say, I won't give you any more men for Germany. A short while later I proceeded to apply the same principle to Holland, Belgium, and Italy. On August 20, 1943, Heinrich Himmler had been appointed Minister of the Interior of the Reich. Until then, to be sure, he had been Reichsführer of the all-embracing SS, which was spoken of as a state within the state. But in his capacity as Chief of the Police he had been, strangely, a subordinate of Minister of the Interior for Rick. The power of the Gauleiters, constantly furthered by Bormann, had led to a splintering of sovereignty in the Reich. There were two categories of Gauleiters. The old ones, those who had held their positions before 1933, were simply incompetent to run an administrative apparatus. Alongside these men the rose, in the course of the years, a new class of Gauleiters of Bormann's school. They were young administrative officials, usually with legal training, 
whose one thought was to strengthen the influence of the party within the state. It was characteristic of Hitler's double-track way of running things that the Gauleiters in their capacity of party functionaries were under Bormann, while in their capacity as Reich commissioners for defense they were under the Minister of the Interior. Under the feeble Frick this double allegiance involved no danger to Bormann. Analysts of the political scene suspected, however, that with Himmler as Minister of the Interior, Bormann had acquired a serious counterpoise. I too saw it this way and was looking forward hopefully to Himmler's reign. Above all I counted on his checking the progressive fragmentation of the government executive power. And, in fact, Himmler promptly gave me his promise that on administrative matters of the Reich government he would call the willful Gauleiters to account. Six. On October 6, 1943, I addressed the Reichsliters and the Gauleiters of the party. The reaction to my speech signaled a turning point. My purpose was to open the eyes of the political leadership to the true state of affairs, to dispel their illusion that a great rocket would soon be ready for use, and to make it clear that the enemy was calling all the turns. For us to regain the initiative, the economic structure of Germany, in part still on a peacetime basis, must be shaken up, I declared. Of the six million persons employed in our consumer goods industries, one and a half million must be transferred to armaments production. From now on consumer goods would be manufactured in France. I admitted that this would place France in a favorable starting position for the post-war era. But my view is, I declared to my audience of top party executives who sat there as if petrified that if we want to win the war we are the ones who will primarily have to make the sacrifices. I challenged the Gauleiters even more bluntly when I continued. You will please take note of this, the manner in which the various districts, gay, have hitherto obstructed the shutdown of consumer goods production can and will no longer be tolerated. Henceforth, if the districts do not respond to my requests within two weeks I shall myself order the shutdowns and I can assure you that I am prepared to apply the authority of the Reich government at any cost. I have spoken with Reichsführer SS Himmler, and from now on I shall deal firmly with the districts that do not carry out these measures. The Gauleiters were less disturbed by the comprehensiveness of my program than by these two last sentences. I had barely finished my speech when several of them came rushing up to me. Led by one of the oldest among them, Joseph Berkel, in loud voices and with waving arms they charged that I had threatened them with concentration camp. In order to correct that misapprehension, I asked Bormann if I could once more take the floor. But Bormann waved me aside. With hypocritical friendliness he said this was not necessary at all, for there were really no misunderstandings. The evening after this meeting many of the Gauleiters drank so heavily that they needed help to get to the special train taking them to the Fris headquarters that night. Next morning I asked Hitler to say a few words about temperance to his political associates, but as always he spared the feelings of his comrades in arms of the early days. On the other hand, Bormann informed Hitler about my quarrel with the Gauleiters. I did not learn the particulars from Gawler to Kaufmann until May 1944. Then, immediately requested a meeting with Hitler. For further details, see Chapter 23. Hitler gave me to understand that all the Gawleters were furious, without telling me any of the specific reasons. Bormann, it soon became plain, had at last found a way to undermine my standing with Hitler. He went on chipping away incessantly and for the first time with some success. I myself had given him the means. From now on I could no longer count on Hitler's support as a matter of course. I also soon found out what Himmler's promise to enforce my directives was worth. I had documents on serious disputes with Gauleiters sent to him, but I did not hear anything about them for weeks. Finally, Himmler's state secretary, Wilhelm Stuckart informed me with some embarrassment that the Minister of the Interior had sent the documents directly to Bormann, whose reply had only now arrived. All the cases had been checked over by the Gauleiters, Stuckart said. As might have been expected, it had turned out that my orders were invalid and the Gauleiters were entirely justified in refusing to follow them. 
Timmler, Stuckart said, had accepted this report. So much for my hope of strengthening the government says against the party's authority. Nothing came of the Spear Himmler coalition either. A few months passed before I found out why all these plans were doomed to failure. As I heard from Gorlitzer Hank of Lower Silesia, Himmler had actually tried to strike a blow against the sovereignty of some Gorlitzers. He sent them orders through his SS commanders in their districts, a clear affront to their power. But he quickly learned that the Gorlitzers had all the backing they needed in Bormann's party headquarters. Within a few days Bormann had Hitler prohibit any such steps by Himmler. Hitler might have contempt for his Gorlitzers, but at crucial moments he always remained loyal to these comrades of his early days of struggle. Even Himmler and the SS could do nothing against this sentimental cronyism. Worsted in this one inept maneuver, the SS leader completely acknowledged the independence of the Gorlitzers. The projected meeting of Reich Defense Commissioners was never called and Himmler contented himself with making his power felt among the politically less influential mayors and governors. Bormann and Himmler, who were on a first-name basis anyhow, soon became good friends again. My speech had brought to light the strata of interest groups, but in revealing these power relationships I had endangered myself. Within a few months I could chalk up a third failure in my efforts to activate the power and potentialities of the regime. Faced with a dilemma, I tried to escape it by taking the offensive. Only five days after my speech I had Hitler appoint me chief of future planning for all the cities damaged by bombing. Thus I was invested with full powers in a field which was much closer to the hearts of my opponents, including Bormann himself, than many of the problems concerned with the war. Some of them were already thinking of this reconstruction of the cities as their foremost future task. Hitler's decree reminded them that I would be standing over them in this. I wanted this assignment not only as a counter in the power struggle. There was another threat, one springing from the quality of the Gorlitters, which I felt had to be headed off. For they saw the devastation of the cities as an opportunity to tear down historic buildings which to them had little meaning. Instances of this tendency of theirs were all too common. One day, for example, I was sitting on a roof terrace with the Gorlitter of Essen looking out over the ruins after a heavy air raid. He commented casually that now the Cathedral of Essen could be tommed down entirely, since the bombing had damaged it anyhow and it was only a hindrance to modernization of the city. The mayor of Mannheim appealed to me for help to prevent the demolition of the burned out Mannheim Castle and the National Theatre. From Stuttgart, I heard that the burned palace there was also to be Tom down at the orders of the local Gorlitter. Hitler found out about such plans too late. Besides, the Gorlitters were able to make it appear that the buildings had been on the point of collapse. Eight months later, on June 26, 1944, I protested to Bormann, in various cities efforts are underway to tear down buildings of historical and artistic merit that have been damaged in the raids. The argument offered to justify these measures is that the buildings are either about to collapse or cannot be restored. It is also contended that demolition will provide a welcome opportunity for urban renewal.